Speaker, I have the honour to lay on the table paper number three in my name, the annual report of the Industrial Court of Trinidad and Tobago for the period September 22, 2014 to September 14, 2015. The Honourable Minister of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to lay on the table the following paper. The Administrative Report for the National Commission for Self-Help Limited for the period October 2013 to September 2014. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wish to lay on the table the annual report and audited and unaudited financial statements of the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority for the financial year ended September 30th, 2015 in the name of the Minister of Works and Transport. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your leave, I would, on behalf of the Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, beg to lay on the table the administrative report of the Occupational Safety and Health Authority and Agency for the period October 2013 to September 2014, and the administrative report of the Board of Directors of the National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited for the period October 2013 to September 2014. And again, in the name of the Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, the administrative report of the Board of Governors of the Cipriani Labor College, sorry, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies for the period October 2013 to September 2014. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister of National Security. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have the honor to lay on the table the following paper. The Administrative Report of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, Ministry of National Security for the year 2012-2013. Reports from committees, Prime Minister's questions. Honorable Member for Separia. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Question one to the Honorable Prime Minister. Do I read the question, Honorable Speaker? Yes. Has the government or Prime Minister received any recommendations to date from the Economic Development Advisory Board chaired by Dr. Terence Farrell? Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honourable Members, the Economic Advise Development Advisory Board has actually been meeting and they have made one or two recommendations to the government and those recommendations have to do with um, some tweaking of the terms of reference and also some recommendations with respect to for consideration with respect to the composition of the board, the board itself. And uh, those are the only recommendations we've had so far on which we've had to make any decision. Thank you. Member for Siparia. Prime Minister, uh, just for clarity, are we to understand that no recommendations have yet been made apart from tweaking of the composition? Speaking of terms of reference on the composition of the board, no other recommendations? Is, am I, is that what I am to understand? Well, I thought I was very clear in saying that those are the only ones, so only means that there are no other. Can I remember for Sicario again? Thank you, sir. Can the Prime Minister indicate what remuneration is being paid to the Chairman and members of the board, the Economic uh, development Advisory Board. The persons, chairman and others, who have agreed to do this exercise have done so against the background of no uh, consideration, uh, no financial consideration as a condition for service. However, it is the intention of the government 
to provide them with some kind of honorarium, which has not yet been decided upon at this stage. All right. Honorable, Honorable Member for Tabakit. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Honorable Prime Minister indicate what are the government's plans for financing the continuation of the Point Fortin Highway? Honourable Prime Minister. The government's plan is to first determine how much public monies have been spent and how much overpayment has been made before we determine any future payments. Member for Tabakit. Does the Honourable Prime Minister at this point in time have an idea that he can let the public know through the Parliament as to how much money has been reported spent by NITCO who have been overseeing the project? Honourable Prime Minister. Well, considering the volume of work that we have to do to determine what overpayments or what underpayments have been made, that, that, uh, that, and uh, we also have to determine how the designs have been changed in the context of the financial arrangements. I'm not in a position today to answer the question I suppose, but however in the not too distant future, an appropriate statement will be made in the Parliament. Honourable Member for Tabaki. The Prime Minister might be aware that uh, NIDCO produced a monthly report on the, con on the progress of the highway, which included the amounts of money spent. Would the Prime Minister um, be willing to bring to the Parliament and lay in the Parliament the last report of NIDCO, which would have put in perspective exactly what was spent and how much of the highway was in fact completed? The Prime Minister. I do not know that the bringing of that report would in any way change the picture because we do not have much confidence in such reports where overpayments and redesigns have been hidden from the public. Honourable Member for Separia. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Could the Prime Minister state whether the law faculty at the South Campus of the UWI will be registering students for the 2016-2017 academic year? Prime Minister. UWI is a regional institution, and the campus in Pinal Debe is a matter under the control of the University of the West Indies. And I don't want to give the impression to this government, to this opposition, or to anybody, that the government of Trinidad and Tobago is somehow involved in the management of the university. As I speak to you now, I have no information from the university as to whether the campus is in a position to receive students or whether the university has taken the relevant steps to ensure that the physical facilities become operational. Honourable Member for Point de Pierre. Uh, to the Honourable Prime Minister, given the foreign news car industry is a source of economic activity and employment, would the Prime Minister, the Honourable Prime Minister, reconsider revising the government's policy on the importation of the foreign news vehicles? Honourable Prime Minister. The government's policy, as outlined, is about a week old and arose as a result of a revision of the existing arrangements. And we do not, at this time, propose to revise a policy that was revised a week ago. Honourable Member for Separi again. Could the Honourable Prime Minister advise whether cutting back <coughs> on the number of scholarships awarded to Trinidad and Tobago nationals in pursuit of tertiary level studies is proposed by his government as a cost-cutting initiative. Honorable Prime Minister. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has taken no decision at this stage to specifically cut scholarships. What we have done, we have indicated that there's a requirement to cut back operational expenses and uh, to the extent that we are being advised by the relevant ministry as to how those cuts can be made, we'll be so advised. But separate and apart from that, we uh, anticipate that given our straightened circumstances, that the level of generosity that existed before may not be prevailing. However, we have taken no position at this stage. Honorable Member for Sipari again. Uh, would the Honorable Prime Minister indicate when payment of the second tranche due to Cade Farmers in December 2015 made possible by, by the EU grant will be made. The member for Sipari could assist me in answering this question by telling the House 
why only half of the money was paid before the election and the other half promised after the election. Honorable Member for Separia. Through you, Honorable Speaker, would the Honorable Prime Minister be kind enough to indicate when the second tranche will be paid to the cane farmers? We, the government, is aware that the payment of a tranche, any tranche, to the cane farmers, that the legal advice available to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, as led by the Member for Separia, the legal advice was that it was not in order to make that payment. And the government went ahead and made that payment against the advice of the wow. Attorney General. And for election purposes, offered to make a payment, paid half, and is now asking me when I'll pay the other half. <laughs> if what the member is asking me to do is to disregard the legal advice of her Attorney General, then maybe on this occasion, I will not. Request urgent questions. To the Minister of Education, I now call on the member for Naparima. To the Minister of Education, question one. Could the Minister tell us when will students of the Barakpur Ashja Primary School be properly accommodated? Honorable Minister, Education. Madam Speaker, the Barakpur Ashja Primary School is 30 years old. Mr. Deputy Speaker, my apologies. The Astra, the Barpa Astra Primary School is 30 years old and repair was promised by the last minister in 2012. Nothing was done. The students are in the mosque and a prefab building at a prefab building. The building is condemned, but as a result of the land slippage, EFCL advised of the issue that there are lands at Petrotrin, and that is being sought so that the new school will be completed within 10 months' time. <coughs> Honorable Member for Bataria San Juan, to the Minister Mr. of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister indicate whether the Housing Development Corporation, EHDC, has taken urgent measures to address the recently reported incidents of theft and vandalism at the housing units in Oasis Greens community in Endeavour. Honorable Minister of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The agency has indeed taken the following measures to address the recent vandalism at the Oasis Housing Development. The agency has reinstated the mobile security on site, and this will be for 24 hours every day, 24 hours all day, there will be surveillance. The agency has also replaced all broken locks on 49 units and has replaced all 29 broken doors. To the Minister of Public Utilities, I call on the mem... You, 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 you delayed on me, man. Okay. No, no, no. When the speaker says to rise, rise. Member for Batara Sanwa. Thank you. Um, could the minister indicate whether these measures and implemented measures will be done throughout the HEC complexes? Certainly, my and I have been advised that this will be done throughout. To the Minister of Public Utilities, I now call on the Honourable Member for Shigonas West. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister state what urgent steps are being put in place by the Water and Sewage Authority to ensure that the authority is functioning effectively after the recent fire at its head office? Honourable Member, Public Utilities. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. WASA has implemented the following steps to ensure that the authority is functioning effectively after the recent fire's head office. Approximately 600 employees have been relocated to non-affected areas on the property. And the property was recently rented in QEP as well. A mobile center was established on the premises and today a payment center was located at the head office as well. 
the telephone systems are up and running in the head office. A call center was established at 800-4420. IT connectivity was re-established at the head office as well. Air quality was tested by Kariri and the fire service and declared to be good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Shigonis West. Mr. Indicate whether the authorities have determined the, co the cause and the seat of the fire. <laughs> Honorable <laughs> Member. <laughs> Honorable. The, this matter has been investigated both by the fire service and the police service, and I'm still awaiting their report. Thank you. <laughs> to the members, members, to the Minister of Health, and I call upon the Honourable Member for Bataria San Juan. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Minister of Health, is the Minister aware that there's a high likelihood of patients that are being diagnosed with viral pneumonia, where in fact they are afflicted with H1N1 swine flu virus? And what is the Minister doing to address this? Thank you, Deputy Thank you, Speaker. Minister. In response to the question, not only is the Minister aware, but the World Health Organization is aware that viral pneumonia is the most common finding in severe cases of H1N1 and is also the most frequent cause of death. WHO is aware. Not only is WHO aware and I aware, PubMed, a peer review site, cites that most countries reported severe viral pneumonitis requiring ICU admission, especially for the at-risk groups. What we are doing at the ministry is that we are sending all samples to CAFA for testing, and as the minister would know, testing for H1N1 takes usually between one to two weeks, especially if the first test is inconclusive, we have to repeat the test. What we are doing as part of protocol now, once our patient uh, is suspected of being afflicted with H1N1, we immediately vaccinate all his relatives, his friends, everyone who is in contact with him, and we start that patient immediately on Tamiflu. And I want to urge all at-risk uh, persons to please make yourself available at the health centers for the free vaccinations. And we are assuring the, com uh, the country that we have three times more vaccines in Trinidad and Tobago now than last year. We have brought in an extra 37,500 vaccines. So the country from 2009 to 2015, where we only had roughly 10,000 doses, we now have approximately 40,000 doses of vaccines. Well done. Thank you very much. Honorable Member for Bataria Sanwan. Thank you very much, Minister. Could you indicate how many deaths from viral pneumonia have taken place over the last let's say two months, that are really due to H1N1 that were not diagnosed? Thank you. I cannot, uh, this, that question was not asked. So I cannot give you a number of deaths of viral pneumonia. What I could confirm, which I confirmed via a press release today, we have now confirmed six deaths due to H1N1. The latest tragic case was a 61-year-old male at the San Grande Hospital who was in ICU for 26 days. He was hypertensive and overweight. Therefore, he had the comorbidities, which we have been speaking about. So we want to assure the country that we are not hiding behind a blanket number of suspected cases, as was the practice in the past. But we are coming to the population with honesty and saying exactly that we have six cases of confirmed deaths due to H1N1. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Bartier Assembly. Yes. You forget to say value for money. So, uh, what I'm saying, no, what I'd like to find out is that all, are, are you stereotyping all cases of viral pneumonia or just those suspected of H1N1? That was not part of the original question. It requires a very detailed clinical response. And if you filed it, I could get a clinical response for you. Hold on, Honourable Member for Shogonis East, for Karen East, sir. Could the Honourable uh, Minister indicate what, if the Ministry is using any methodology or scientific uh, process to differentiate from the viral pneumonia from, from bacterial pneumonia, which is also a cause of death in the H1N1? 
Honourable member would know very often, according to both WHO and PubMed, secondary bacterial uh, pneumonia all also occurs with primary valve, and you will know that. That question, again, requires a very detailed clinical response, and I will be happy to provide such if you ask the appropriate question, and I will do the research for you. Questions on notice? Honorable Member of Government Business. Leader Thank of Government Business. Thank you very business. much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to request a deferral of two weeks for the answer to question number 25. The other questions will be answered today. Honorable, honorable member for no, the question, question number 13, the Minister of Public Utilities. Honorable member for Mayaro. Deputy Speaker, question number 13 to the Minister of Public Utilities. This project comprises the installation of 1,300 meters of 150 meters PVC pipeline. The feasibility study is completed and the project is scheduled for implementation this year once funding arrangements for this project is finalized. Please. Deputy Speaker, question number 14 to the Minister of Public Utilities. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the projects at Guppy Hill and Moonan Avenue in Rio Claro have already been completed. It is the intention of WASA to implement the projects at Oilfield Road and Timul Trace in Rio Claro this year. With respect to Part B, the four streets identified in Bish, which are Rodney Street, Wells Street, Batiste Street, La Salle Road, these projects are intended for implementation this year, 2016. It's important to emphasize, however, that funding for these projects is to be identified as the cost of implementing three of the four projects is estimated at $7.9 million. The La Salle Road project is still being assessed for its feasibility and cost. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number 15 to the Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Thank you very much, Member Fumiaro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Agriculture, uh, the Guayagari facility was constructed by the National Energy Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago as part of its social responsibility program to the Guayagari community. As such, the facility is currently owned by the National Energy Corporation and at the request of the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, the NEC has committed to hand over the facility. Before the facility is handed over, NEC has advised the Ministry that it will install a fence around the facility. It is my understanding that the design of the Guayagari fish landing facility does not fully complement the current operations undertaking, undertaken sorry, by fisher folk in the Guayagari area. However, the Fisheries Division, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, through consultation with the NEC and representatives of the fishing associations in Guayaguayari, that is Southeast Fishing Association, Guayaguayari, Ottawa, Mayaro Fisher Folk Association, and Women in Fishing Association have agreed that the following works were deemed critical to allow the facility to become partially operational. One, expansion of the net repair shed as the area provided is inadequate for the large volume of nets that are repaired on an ongoing basis. <coughs> Two, installation of engine racks in individual locker rooms, which would facilitate the storage of engines, thereby increasing the usage of the lockers. Three, extension and smoothing of the timber skids on the existing slipway 
as well as installation of the machinery to accommodate a winch to assist in the convenient hauling up of vessels, especially during extreme weather events. Four, installation of security wire wall fencing to deter larceny. And five, installation of additional electrical poles and associated electrical works to enhance lighting at the facility to act as a deterrent to larceny and as a general health and safety measure. The Ministry has advised NEC that notwithstanding the handover, it will expect NEC to continue to review the problems associated with the use of the facilities jetty and on the basis of consultations with the fisher folk, advise the Ministry of the options to resolve the problems and make the Guaya Guayari facility fully operational. In answer to part B, the time frame from, for the completion of the works and opening of this facility, with the exception of the issues related to the jetty, the other works identified in response to A are expected to be completed in the second quarter of 2016. The timing for the full use of the facility will depend on the resolution of the jetty issues. In answer to part C, the facility will be managed by the Seafood Industry Development Company Limited in partnership with the stakeholder groups in the community. In relation to the security of the facility, and as highlighted previously, a security fence would be constructed and the Seafood Industry Development Company Limited will make appropriate arrangements for security. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sorry. Honourable Member for Princess Town. Mr. Deputy Speaker, through you to the Honourable Minister of Education, question number 25. Could the min Sorry. Uh, if I may, Member, that is the question that we ask to be deferred. Thank you very much. Two weeks. She did mention that, Honourable Minister for Honourable Member for Princess Town. So I'll now on. Honourable Member for Princess Town again. Mr. Deputy Speaker, through you to the Honourable Minister of Health. Could the minister indicate whether the government plans to build a health facility in Tableland? And if yes, what is the expected commencement date? Thank you, Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to address the question. As part of government's new thrust in rural development, the Ministry of Health will be working very closely with all health sector stakeholders and the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. In particular, to determine the need for health centers in all, in all rural areas, inclusive of Tableland. It is expected that this review process will be completed within the next three months, at which time I can give you a more definite answer. However, honorable members can rest assured that no area in this blessed land of Trinidad and Tobago will be left out of this process. Good answer. Member for Princess Town. Would the Honourable Minister indicate whether or not sites have been identified for such projects? As part of this government's policy of healthcare reform, we are going beyond mere site identification. In order to put down health centres, let me alert the population. This country has nine hospitals, seven district health facilities, 97 health centres, of which three are outreach centres and two are enhanced health centres. Your question is not properly phrased because the question is not speaking to the type of health centre you need in Tableland. And we are moving on an evidence-based process to determine where health centres are needed. So for example, what are the social determinants of health in Tableland? What are your demographics? What is the age of the population? That will determine whether we put a health centre, an outreach centre, or an enhanced health centre. And this is all part of this government's trust into primary health care and no area in this blessed land of Trinidad and Tobago inclusive of Tableland will be left out. Yeah. Member for Princess Town. Madam Speaker, through you to the Honourable Minister of Sport, question number 38. Could the Honourable Minister 
provide the reasons for please the question it's on the other people thank you madam speaker the government of Trinidad and Tobago in its national policy document has presented a suite of development initiatives one of which articulates that modern and strategic plan infrastructure is essential for the future development of Trinidad and Tobago. Significant focus has been placed on creating an enabling environment for our athletes to achieve excellence in sports through access to facilities that are of international standards. To this end, the long overdue completion of the Brian Lara Stadium has been identified as a priority or the ministry agenda of capital projects. Madam Speaker, this project was initiated in 2003 when the cabinet by minute number 2942, dated November 20th, 2003, agreed to construct a multi-purpose sporting complex at Union Park Marabella. The location for the proposed facility was subsequently relocated to Toruba, Cabinet Minute number 3306, dated November 25, 2004. The development of this complex was envisioned to serve as an elite sport training facility and to provide a meridian of benefits to the citizenry, of, which included generation of revenue through the hosting of competitions at national and international levels, assist in the preparation of potential young competitors in the development of sports skills for national and international competitions, generation of foreign exchange by facilitating programs for university students and international athletes during the winter months, to encourage and promote healthy lifestyles by engaging in sports and leisure activities. Madam Speaker, to date, 12 years post the inception of this project, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have been unable to benefit from this addition to the state's complement of sporting facilities. The development of this complex is of greater significance when juxtaposed against the pressing need for economic transformation and the international growth of sports tourism sector. Madam Speaker, our government is cognizant that mega and small scale sports tourism have the potential to contribute to the social and economic development of our country. And as such, the benefits to be achieved from the establishment of the Brian Lara Stadium supersedes that of the completion costs. Madam Speaker, the equal consideration is the fact that the facility's name was derived from the recognition of the achievement of Mr. Brian Lara in his international sporting fraternity. As such, the completion of this high performance complex is imperative for not abdicating government's responsibility to the, to the upholding of Mr. Lara's signature standard of excellence, which we recognize the world over. At present, the Urban Development Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago, UDACOT, is presently engaged in determining the scope of works to be conducted at the stadium. In addition, the technical staff of the Ministry Project Management and Monitoring and Evaluation Unit will be involved in the implementation of the project to ensure completion consists with the proposed budget, budget estimated and timelines. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Remember for Princess Town. Speaker, through you to the Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister will recall that this Brian Lara Stadium started at the cost of over $200 million went up under the, form, the present administration to over one billion. Can the Honorable Minister indicate this additional $90 million, whether or not this additional $90 million that has been identified for works at the Brian Lara Stadium, how did they arrive at that figure? Madam Speaker, to you, as I said in my contribution, we are still uh, working with you the court to come up with the final figure and of course the timeline so I cannot answer that with you guys.
Honorable Member for Prince Sister. Madam Speaker, could the Honorable Minister indicate whether or not contractor or contractors have been identified for this project and whether or not the government believes that this <coughs> is a project that should be pursued at this time? To allow that question as a supplementary question. Honorable Member for Baratari Sanwan. Mr. could you, um, <coughs> is, do you think that the opening of the Brian Lara Stadium is much more important than opening of the Cuba Children Hospital? Honorable Member, I would not allow that as a supplemental question. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. Statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills, motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a minister. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 826, I beg to move that this House now resolve into Standing Finance Committee to consider proposals for the variation of the 2015 appropriation. Honorable members, the question is that this House now resolve into Standing Finance Committee to consider proposals for the variation of the 2015 appropriation. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Honorable members, in accordance with standing order 82, 6, and 87, this meeting of the Standing Finance Committee was convened to consider proposals for the variation of appropriation for the fiscal year 2015. Honorable members, I am to advise that in accordance with Standing Order 45-1, the speaking time in Standing Finance Committee shall not exceed five minutes on each intervention. The procedure shall be as follows. The proposals for decrease will be considered prior to the proposals for increase. The head and the amount to be decreased or increased will be announced. The chairman shall then propose the question that the head be increased or decreased. The Minister of Finance will then be invited to explain the purpose for the decrease or increase, and members may seek clarification from the Minister. Once this is concluded, the Chairman will then put the question that the sum to be decreased or increased be approved. The procedure will be repeated for each head. A similar procedure will be followed for the approval of the write-off of losses. The committee is being asked to note that the Minister of Finance has approved the transfer of funds in the sum of $1,396,805,793 between subheads under the same head of expenditure for fiscal year 2015. These transfers do not require the approval of the committee. Honorable members, we now consider the items. Okay, the decrease. Honorable members, we shall now consider the proposals for decrease for fiscal year 2015. Head 40. Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs. Head 40, Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs. Yes. 
Honorable Speaker, may I seek your guidance? Would you be kind enough to point us to which page in our document that you are referring if, to? Honorable uh, Member for Superior, if we look at item zero, number zero 01, pages 2 and 3 of the agenda for the second meeting of the Standard Finance Committee. Yes, if you can turn, kindly turn the page, please. Yes, item zero 01, page 2 and three. Thank you. Yes? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Head 40. Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs, $200 million. Honorable members, the question is that the 2015 appropriation for Head 40, Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs, be varied by a decrease in the sum of $200 million. <laughs> Honorable members, the question is that the 2015 appropriation for Head 40, Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs, be decreased by the sum $200 million. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Head 40, Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs, has been varied by a decrease in the sum of $200 million. We move on to increase. Honorable members, we shall now consider the proposals for increases. Head 69, Ministry of Works and Infrastructure. Head 69, Ministry of Works and Infrastructure, $200 million. Honorable members, the question is that the 2015 appropriation for Head 69, Ministry of Works and Infrastructure, be varied by an increase in the sum of $200 million. Honorable members, the question is that the 2015 appropriation for Head 69, Ministry of Works and Infrastructure, be varied by an increase in the sum of $200 million. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Head 69, Ministry of Works and Infrastructure, has been varied by an increase in the sum of $200 million. We now move to write-off of losses. This would be at page nine of the agenda. Page four of the agenda. Honorable members, we shall now proceed to the consideration on the proposals for write-off of losses. Head 18. Ministry of Finance and the Economy. Head 18, Ministry of Finance and the Economy, $32,976.40. Honorable members, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $32,976.40 for Head 18, the Ministry of Finance and the Economy be approved. I now invite the Minister of Finance to give an explanation for this loss. Madam Speaker, well, the notes are quite clear. <coughs> because of an administrative error, this particular individual was overpaid because it was believed that she had attained certain qualifications, which she, in fact, had not attained and um, the overpayment was first discovered in 2011. I think if you look at the explanation on page four and five, it, it's self-explanatory. Question to the Minister of Finance. 
honorable member for Paris. East Central. Would you confirm, as it is written here, that this was a matter which began in 2004? Yes. Okay. Honorable members, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $32,976.40 for Head 18, Ministry of Finance, and the Economy be approved. Those in favor say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The write-off of losses in the sum of $32,976.40 for Head 18, Ministry of Finance and the Economy is approved. Head 56, Ministry of the People and Social Development. Head 56, Ministry of the People and Social Development, $45,368.21. Honorable members, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $45,368.21 for Head 56, Ministry of the People and Social Development, be approved. I will now invite the Minister of Social Development and Family Services to give an explanation. Madam Speaker, in 2013, when the Human Resource Officer 3 in the Ministry of People and Social Development retired, it was discovered that she would have been overpaid. This overpayment arose as a result of an administrative error in that when she, Ms. Is Joseph Bishop was on secondment, and when she returned to the Ministry of Legal Affairs, she would have been placed at the incorrect incremental point. This resulted in her being overpaid over the period 2003 to 2011. The Minister of the People and Social Development felt that in light of the fact that the overpayment would have been due to an administrative error, and given the lapse of eight years over which she would have been overpaid, felt that it would have been unfair for her to have to effect the repayment. Accordingly, a minute was taken to cabinet and cabinet agreed that the sum be written off. The parliament is now being asked, the standing finance committee is therefore now being asked to approve the write-off of the sum of $45,368.21. Central. Could the minister indicate at from what period of time the overpayment began? The overpayment began in 2003. Thank you. Honorable members, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $45,368.21 for Head 56, Ministry of the People and Social Development be approved. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those aye. against say no. I think the ayes have it. The write-off of losses in the sum of $45,368.21 for Head 56, Ministry of the People and Social Development is approved. Head 61, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. Head 61, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, $383,229.13. Honorable members, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $383,229.13 for Head 61, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development be approved. I now invite the Minister of Housing and Urban Development to give an explanation for this loss. Madam Speaker, the sum of $383,229.13 was owed to the Sugar Industry Labor Welfare Committee Silwick by eight former sugar workers. The then Minister of Housing was of the view that six of the defaulters 
were unable to meet their financial obligations because of debilitating health challenges, and two of those workers are now deceased. The members of the Lands and Arrears Subcommittee undertook side visits to the homes of the eight persons, and based on their assessment of the subject, the families were unable to meet such payments. The total debt, as I indicated, is in a sum of $383,229.13. As a consequence, the then minister succeeded in getting cabinet to agree to the write-off of the mortgage debt. Honorable Member for Superior. Thank you. Just for the record, there is a name which carries my married name, Bisessa. Just for the record, to indicate that person is not of any relationship that known to me. <laughs> for an abundance of caution. <laughs> Honorable Members, the, the question is that the write-off of losses in the sum of $383,000 $229.13 for Head 61, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development be approved. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The write-off of losses in the sum of $383,229.13 for Head 61, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development is approved. Honorable members, this meeting of the Standing Finance Committee is now adjourned. I would wish members to note that the committee's report will be circulated tomorrow to all members. I now call upon the leader of the House. Thank you, <laughs> Madam. <coughs> sorry. Madam huh? Chairman. Sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, Member Fakarani. Yeah, I just want to ask if we are not going to examine the ministerial. Um, I'm uh, just this asking. Is item number th zero three. I'm just asking. No, I, no, I mean, um, I have honourable no member. To do it. No, no, honourable member. Um, um, I indicated in uh, when we are about to start that these transfers are done by the authority, delegated of authority the minister of, of the minister, and therefore it is ready for the noting. Right, okay, noted. <coughs> Honorable Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I beg to move that the House be resumed. Honorable Member. The question is that the House <coughs> be resumed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the proposals for the variation of appropriation for the fiscal year 2015 were considered in Standing Finance Committee and approved. I wish to advise that the debate for the adoption of the committee's report will take place on Friday, January 22, 2016, at 1 May. I Friday, January 22nd is the fourth, fourth Friday of the month, and in accordance with the standing orders, it is private members' day.
Steakhouse. Thank you very much, Madam. Madam Chairman, Madam Speaker, thank you. We are well aware that that is the fourth Friday. Um, luckily, the month of January has five Fridays, and we are very willing, given the fact that we have a deadline to meet, and I'm sure those opposite us are well aware of the deadline, given that for the last five years they were on this side of the house. We have a deadline to meet, and consequently, we are saying that we would give the fifth Friday of January. We are n have no intention of not giving the, the opposition their day. Madam Chair, it is not within the remit of the leader of government business to give us private numbers. The standing orders is very clear, and I want to point to standing order 33-5. The fourth Friday of each month shall be private members day. Government business shall have precedence on every day except private members day. Madam Speaker, as you are well aware, the Parliament regulates its own business and Madam Speaker, with your leave, I would like to put this to the House in an effort to allow the House to regulate its business, given the fact that there is a time limit for this <coughs> closing of the accounts. By law, and, it's their accounts. And, it's your account. and it is the accounts of those opposite us during their tenure, and we do not intend to go against the spirit or the letter of the law which indicates that January 31st is the last day. So, Madam Speaker, we would like to take this opportunity to put a motion to the House that we will comply with the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. And we are saying that Friday, the 22nd of January 2016, at 1.30 p.m., this House will resume to do to um, debate the report of the Standing Finance Committee. And I beg to move. Honorable members, uh, Leader of the House, Member for Shagonas West, this is, not an, this is just putting the House on notice. And before we adopt any formal procedure, might I ask that the notice be deferred to later in the proceedings and that both the Leader of the House and the Member for Shagonas West Hold some discussions on this issue, please. Madam, Madam Speaker, since this is the direction that we are going, and I'm very glad for your intervention and your guidance, but permit me to offer some guidance to the members on the other side who are bent on being as obstructive as possible, that the same standing orders that have been quoted now, where it says that we shall do the on the fourth Friday, it also says that Parliament should not meet in August. And it was those on the other side who met here in August to change the voting system in this country. Yes. Yes. This House met in August in the middle of the night My to attempt to change the voting system in Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. And, madam, and le lest, let, lest it be seen, based on the mischievous intervention, that we are acting improperly Parliament regulates its own business, and on this occasion, we regulate it to comply with the law. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And may I indicate that the member for Shaquanas West and I did have discussions on this issue, Madam. So if, if you want us to have further discussions, we will do so, but, but, Madam Speaker, again, we are intent on complying with the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, and we are intent on meeting the time. Members, I will therefore advise that on the motion for the adjournment, that this notice be given, and if there is to be a debate, the debate will then take place. 
As you please, madam. Public business, private business, motion. Member for Shogunas West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by Section 123.2 of the Constitution that the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of Police be selected by criteria and procedure prescribed by the order of the President subject to negative resolution in Parliament. And whereas the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police selection process, Order 215, was published on December 16, 2015, by legal notice number 218. Be it resolved that the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police section selection process order be annulled. Madam Speaker, it is. I beg to move. Madam Speaker, if I, if I may. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask the member for Shogunas West if they will be doing both motions together, please, because they are interrelated and it would be um, useful to do both at the same time. I indic Ma Madam Speaker, I indicated to the Honourable Member that we, in fact, the opposition will be dealing with each motion separately. Honourable Member for Shogunas West. Yes, selection. Madam Speaker, it is generally accepted that the primary duty of a state is to secure its citizenry. Madam Speaker, in a text entitled State Failure and State Weakness in a Time of Terror, edited by Robert I. Rothberg, Brookings Institutions Press, at page three, it states, and I quote, there's a hierarchy of political goods. None is as critical as the supply of security, especially human security. Individuals alone, almost exclusively in special or particular circumstances, can attempt to secure themselves or groups of individuals can band together to organize and purchase goods or services that maximize their sense of security. The quotation continues. Traditionally and usually, however, individuals and groups cannot easily or effectively substitute private security for the full spectrum of public security. The state's prime function is to provide the political good of security to prevent cross-border invasions and infiltrations and any loss of territory, to eliminate domestic threats to, or, to or attacks upon the national board order and social structure to prevent crime and any related dangers to domestic human security and to enable citizens to resolve their disputes with the state and with their fellow inhabitants with re without recourse to arms and other forms of physical coercion. The delivery of a range of other desirable political goods becomes possible when a reasonable measure of security has been sustained." End of quote. So, Madam Speaker, so it is the first political good of a government <coughs> to provide security of its citizenry. And when you read the newspapers today, when you look at what is happening today in our country, you realize our nation has become a virtual killing field. Every citizen is in danger from cook to captain. You look at The Guardian. The Guardian headline today, Madam Speaker. Murders, 
So, mentally ill student shot, ex-prisoner ambush, woman shot, man killed outside Edinburgh home, body found under burning tires. That's today's guardian. The news day, four murders in 12 hours. Gone crazy, Shagonis man gone down, Princess Town man gone down, Midnight Lima gone down. Headline, Daily Express, former ex-prisoner shot dead while trying to murder ex-girlfriend. Love kills. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, this is why every citizen in this country has an interest for their personal safety and that of their family. They have an interest in getting this process for the selection of a commissioner of police and deputy commissioner of police right. My constituents of Shagonas, Madam Speaker, want an open, transparent, and accountable process which will provide the offices of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police with the legitimacy for the task which they will face. My constituents, Madam Speaker, and, and I want to indicate they voted overwhelmingly for the UNC. In fact, I might add, Madam Speaker, amongst all 41 representatives gathered here in this Honorable House, I received the highest number of votes in Japan. My, my, my constituents do not want a process for the selection of a commissioner and DCP to be tainted and com contaminated by unilateral political intervention. My constituents and indeed the national community want the process to be open, transparent, widely communicated. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, the, the, this government, led by the Honorable Dr. Keith Rowley, Honorable Member for Diego Martin West, is already <coughs> taking an approach where the trust of the people in this, of, of the betrayal of the trust of the people in this selection exercise of a commissioner and deputy commissioner of police. There has been no consultation, no consultation with the Independent Services Commission. The, the chairman of the Police Service Commission in the news day of Monday, January 18th, Madam Speaker, says, and it, the headline reads, PSA's head says no consultation on top cop post. Disrespect. Disrespect. The chairman of the Police Service Commission, and I read from the article at page 3, Monday 18th, 2016, by Andre Bagu. The chairman of the Police Service Commission, the constitutional body charged with the appointment of the police commissioner, Yesterday said the PSC was not consulted by cabinet prior to last year's issuing of two legal notices which propose a new process by which the country's top cop is to be chosen. And I quote, the PSC needs to be consulted and there has been no consultation, said Dr. Maria Therese Gomes in an interview with Newsy. This is disconcerting and disrespectful in light of the constitutional role which is meant to be played by the PSC as well as the need for teamwork and combined expertise in this reforming process. Under section 123 of the constitution, the PSC is charged with the appointment of a police commissioner and deputy police commissioner uh, as well as making promotions, disciplining, monitoring and appraising officers and reviewing some of the decisions of the country's top cops. The chairman call for consultation comes ahead of a planned debate in the House. Madam Speaker, but there has been no consultation. 
and the government has been quiet on whether or not they plan to have any consultation whatsoever. But the, the, the horse has already bolted, so they had that total disregard and disdain for the Services Commission, Madam Speaker, the Police Service Commission in particular. Madam Speaker, so there has been no consultation. There has been disrespect meted out. In fact, the former chairman of the Police Service Commission, Professor Ramesh Devsaran, in the Newsday of the 19th of the 1st, 2016, at page 7, former chairman of the Police Service Commission, Professor Ramesh Devsaran, yes, yesterday warned against what he termed the privatization of the process by which a police commissioner is chosen, calling instead for a greater role to be played by the PSC as a constitutional body. Davison noted that the new procedure, procedure which has been proposed for the selection of a top cop calls for an, an appropriate local firm to be contracted by the PSC to recruit officers for the post of police commissioner and deputy police commissioner. But he, importantly, Madam Speaker, goes on to say this. I do not want to interfere in the tenure of the current chairman. But what I will say is this. The, public, the Police Service Commission will have to decide whether it wants to be a docile agency or an assertive constitutional body. End of quote. So this is what is happening. You have an independent constitutional body there has been that looks after the appointment, looks after the disciplining of members of the police service, but yet you have absolutely no consultation. And you know, Madam, Madam Speaker, if one were to review the budget presentation of the Honorable Member for Diego Martinez, This honorable member re mentioned consultation at least 20 times in his budget presentation. There has been no consultation with the NGOs, no meaningful consultation with the representative police association. Mr. M Madam Speaker, when you look at the genesis of this legislation, which I will deal with subsequently, you would see that there was undertaking that in the event of any changes, having regard to the manner in which this piece of legislation evolved, that there will be consultation with the opposition. Absolutely no consultation with the opposition. So no consultation. This is a, this is a government in which the Honorable Prime Minister is saying to the country, let us come together. Can we count on you? Let's do, it together. Let's do it together. Well, you're doing this one alone by yourself because of your lack of consultation. Clearly, Madam Speaker, what this government, as I indicated, the Minister of Finance, in his presentation, mentioned consultation 20 times. But it is clear they, they are keeping to their mantra. Do what I say, not what I do. In addition to the disregard and the disrespect meted out to the, poli to the Police Service Commission, Madam Speaker, this very parliament was treated with disdain bordering on contempt. Let us look at the timeline. The orders before us, 218 and 219, were published on December 16, 2015. They were made and no doubt signed by the minister 
on the 14th, Cabinet Secretary. I am advised by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. So for purposes of to negative a motion, the 40 days began to run from December the 16th, when it was published. Madam Speaker, Standing Orders 8A1 says a statutory instrument which is required to be laid in Parliament shall be submitted forthwith to the clerk for laying on the table simultaneous with its submission for publication. Why was there a delay? This parliament, it was sent to this parliament on January 4th, notwithstanding, signed on the 14th, published on the 16th, sent to this honorable house on the, on the, on the, on the 4th of January, and laid in this parliament on the 11th. And it is only then, when it was laid, Madam Speaker, could there have been the opportunity for us to negative this motion, this piece of, these orders before us by way of a motion? No. Why was this parliament treated with such disdain and contempt? Mr. And if, Madam Speaker, why I ascribe no sinister motive to the late delivery to the parliament? Perhaps the Honorable Minister or Attorney General in his reply can explain. I hope it is a better explanation than mere incompetence. What is the impact of this late delivery? Delayed delivery means, That's why we're rushing this week. and that is, that is why we have all this complication now with the government business of the day. Because, Madam, Madam Speaker, by virtue of Standing Order 93, by virtue of Standing Order 93, which provides for a statutory instruments committee, the standing order says very clearly, the statutory instruments committee shall consider statutory instruments that are subject to the negati negative resolution, negative resolution. It shall have the duty inter alia of bringing to the attention of the house any such instrument, which, in a, which involves the expenditure of public monies, which cannot be challenged in the courts on the ground that it is ultra virus. And at E, the publication or the laying before the house, which appears to have been unduly delayed. In respect F, in respect of which there has been unjustifiable delay in notifying the speaker that the instrument had come into operation before it was laid before the house or the purport of form which we appears to require elucidation. Madam Speaker, other relevant member, members will know that the opposition members made themselves available because a statutory instru instruments committee was convened. My colleague, the honorable member for Kuva South wrote <coughs> The Honorable Rudranath Indar Singh wrote, he's a member of the Statutory Instruments Committee. And he says, sent to a functionary at the parliament, and I quote from the letter, I refer to the caption subject and correspondence dated 8 January 2016, and wish to advise that standing orders 80 and 93 have been breached in, in relation to legal notices 218 and 219, and therefore indicate my formal objection. <clears throat> the date, Thursday, 14 January. Madam Speaker, so it is laid on the 11th. We put in our objection on the 12th. There is a statutory instruments committee convened, and then 
abandoned on the day of the meeting. Meeting abandoned. Because of the because we are told that because of the the filing of the motion to negative or to annul the no, 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 Madam Speaker. What it is if the government had arranged their business properly and brought these orders to the parliament in a timely fashion, the statutory instruments committee could have done their job and therefore it would not have placed ourselves in this position we find ourselves. So as a result, the parliamentary committee was undermined and subverted. Undermined and subverted the parliamentary committee. So you understand? Disregard and disdain for the police service commission. Disrespect. Subversion of the process in the parliament by its delay. I ascribe no sinister motive. I just want a proper explanation as to why it took so long to reach, having regard to the fact there's a time constraint associated <coughs> with these matters. He said he does not ascribe. No, he said it's some pollution, so that's a senator. Madam Speaker, it is, it is to the eternal credit of the leader of the opposition that she maintained her vigilance of this matter. I, and it is clear that it is her vigilance that is in fact why we are in fact debating this an annulment motions here today. It is clear that we have to be very vigilant of the manner in which this administration is conducting their business, eternally vigilant to protect our dem democracy. Madam Speaker, the And you know, Madam Speaker, well, as I read the contributions of honorable members of, of this honorable house previously, I happened to come across a comment made by the honorable member for St. Joseph, Honorable Gerald Yetming. And I quote from the Hansard of Wednesday, March 15, 2006. I want to comment on certain aspects of the order you are putting the package before us. Tomorrow morning, the president could issue new orders amending the criteria or the process. That is possible. I am making the suggestion that the orders of the president relative to that section should be decided after, if you wish, a negative resolution. At least if the government decides that it wishes to change the criteria, the criteria which are spelled out in the package sounds fine. Who is to say? that somebody would not wake up one Monday morning and change the criteria to suit the particular candidate. And the next thing is that the order is issued and we do not know. I think that the honorable member for St. Joseph, Jerry Yetming, was prophetic. He goes on to say, I am simply suggesting, Madam Speaker, you may not always be there. It could be somebody else. It could be a rogue and a vagabond in that position who can do all things with the right to do them. Madam Speaker, so you understand the context in which there was haste, incompetence, a lack of consultation with these orders. It is perhaps, Madam Speaker, for the benefit of the national <laughs> community and those on the other side who are not aware of the manner in which the primary legislation, the enabling act for these orders, how they came into being. Because many on that side, Madam Speaker, is suffering from newness. And nothing wrong with that. Newness. And nothing is wrong with that. Madam Speaker, you, will recall, you may recall, members will recall, that there was a package of three pieces of legislation. Constitution Amendment Bill, and this is in 2006. 
which was a bill to amend the Constitution to reform the Police Service Commission, confer powers on the con Commission of Police to control and manage the Police Service and for other related matters. The second piece of legislation was the Police Service Bill. This was a bill to consolidate, amend, and revise the law relating to the Police Service to ensure efficient and transparent management of the service and to provide that the principle of equity and meritocracy shall be applied at all times and for other related matters. And the third element in this package of legislation was that of the Police Complaints Authority Bill 2006. And this bill was to establish an independent body to investigate criminal offenses involving police officers police corruption, and serious police misconduct, and for other related matters. Madam Speaker, it was a rare and historic occasion in this House. It was a rare and historic compromise between the opposition, led by the Honorable Bastille Pandey, then member for Coover North, and the government, led by the Honorable Patrick Manning, and member for the Prime Minister and member for San Fernando East. On these three pieces of legislation, there was a historic and very rare compromise. You see, we can't even agree on what is private member's tea. <laughs> oh, notwithstanding <laughs> the, the, the standing orders. Mr. Madam Speaker, this accord, while it's not as foundational and fundamental as the Mar Marlboro House Compromise, was very important for the progress of our nation. Face as it then was, as it is, as it is today, with runaway crime. Madam, Madam Speaker, you may recall that the, Mal the Marlboro House compromise between Dr. Eric Williams, the founding father of our nation, and the then premier, and Dr. Rudrunat Kapilev, was very important for establishing the architecture of our society. And Selwyn Ryan, in his book, Race and Nationalism, states at page 330, Race and Nationalism in Trinidad and Tobago, at the opening of the Marlboro House Conference on 29 May 1962, the last of those frustrating pilgrimages to London, the leader of the DLP stated succinctly but emphatically what his delegation was after. We want a judiciary that it, which is independent. We want provisions which rarely guarantee effectively the rights and freedoms which ought to be exist in a democratic society. We want parliament democratically constituted we want a procedure for the amendment of the Constitution which effectively protects us from the arbitrary exercise of the power to amend. We want the various commissions so constituted to ensure they, they function effectively and impartially. End of quote. Madam Speaker, it is that kind of compromise that we saw. And in the words of Mr. Bastille Pandey, as reported in the Hansard, of March 15, 2006, and I quote at page 11. We had great difficulty in arriving at the methods of selecting both the members of the Police Service Commission and the Police Commissioner himself. When we first met with the government to tackle the problem of kidnapping <coughs> by making kidnapping for ransom an unbailable offense, we faced many problems. We demanded, however, that in order to resolve these problems, we should stick to three basic principles to see whether the laws we propose to this parliament satisfy these conditions. The three basic criteria we propose to the government, to which I believe they agreed, were that the laws must not lead to an abuse of power. They must not lead to the introduction of violence into the political system, and they should no way facilitate discrimination of any kind, but rather they should promote meritocracy. The Honorable Member for San Fernando East had a lot to say. 
on, on that occasion. And he piloted the bills. The Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Denwell. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, am, I, am, I quote from page five of the Hansard of March 15, 2006. I am pleased to advise this Honorable House today that the bills that are being debated have been subjects of agreement with Honorable Members opposite. And he goes on to say, Mr. Speaker, paying tribute to Sir Ellis Clark and so on, says that, and I say this at page, and I quote this at page six, members on this side, to the process of consultation on critical issues, which is an essential element of the system of democracy as it is practiced here in Trinidad and Tobago. You have not consulted with anybody. Nobody. You have abandoned the system of democracy. Oh Abandon the system of democracy in accordance with your former leader. <coughs> me, me, Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member for San Fernando Eastern goes on to talk about the various changes. And what was important is indicating that, that now the power of the veto has been removed from the Prime Minister. So that therefore the political process is that the Prime Minister no longer has that power of veto. But there is the involvement of the parliamentary process in the, in the, in the, uh, in the selection that you have parliament getting involved. There was no, so he, the prime minister is giving up a veto power. But in that legislation, that is his spirit. That is the intention to remove the politician from engineering the process, but rather to have an open, transparent process before the parliament and before the country. What do you have today? You have through a back door in a, court, in a back door where the Minister of National Security, the Minister of National Security <coughs> has a wrong side veto. He has to trigger the process. And if he does not trigger the process, there is no power in the, public, the Police Service Commission for that process to be started. So they have, this is what they have done with this order. But I'll come to that. Politician. Mr. Mr. Madam Speaker, it is the politician now once more intervening on doing the historic accord entered into with the opposition and the government of the day. That is the kind of subterfuge and stealth that is taking place. Madam Speaker, <laughs> this is what the Honorable Le Prime Minister had to say there. What the legislation now before the House proposes is that the Prime Ministerial veto disappears, but that the name as identified by the Police Service Commission will itself come before the Parliament and also will be the subject of affirmative resolution. Madam Speaker, this is what this is what that historical accord to remove the politician it was the intention of the legislation to remove the sitting politicians from engineering the process so as to provide legitimacy to the commissioner of, of police and the assistant commissioner of police. Mr. 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 Madam, Pre Madam Speaker, at the end of the process, this is what the Honorable Member of for San Fernando East and Prime Minister to see at page 114. I thank and congratulate my Honorable colleagues for sitting with us and arriving at modifications to the initial proposals that could meet with the approbation of Honorable Members on both sides. It is a historic day, and while we would not expect that there will be a change in the crime situation tomorrow, what this certainly does sets the stage for better arrangements. Mr. Spe Madam Speaker, we are faced in this country with two, 
a combination of a precipitous decline in the standard of living and quality of life as a result of the deterioration in oil and gas prices and a meteoric rise in criminal activity. This is what is impacting upon our, our nation at this point in time, Madam Speaker. And when you recognize that that, that is what is happening, and when the Prime Minister says, can we count on you? Who are you counting on when you polarize the country by your lack of consultation? You polarize the country and you expect progress. You cannot polarize this country. This is a plural society. There are fears among the people about the manner in which you are seeking to appoint a commissioner of police and a deputy commissioner. And there are real fears. There are tangible fears. There's a perception that you want to engineer the process. Madam Speaker, how much time? 19. For original or all? Madam Speaker. It's 319. Madam Speaker, I move to, the, you look at the, the express of today, Madam Speaker, in which the editorial says very clearly, clearer process for appointing of commissioner of police needed. Madam Speaker, my colleagues will deal with that. But I want to deal with this whole question of the nature and the unconstitutional nature of this selection order. Madam Speaker, this selection order is repugnant to the Constitution. This selection order is ultra virus the Constitution. <laughs> Mr. Madam Speaker, the Police Service Commission is established as an independent body under Section 122 of the Constitution. In Thomas versus the AG, Lord Diplock at the Privy Council enunciated the central reason why services commissions must be independent. The whole, and I quote Madam Speaker, the whole purpose of chapter eight of the Constitution, which bears the rubric, the public service, is to insulate members of the civil service, the teaching service, and the police service in Trinidad and Tobago from political influence exercised directly upon them by the government of the day. This means the means adopted for this was to vest in autonomous commissions to the exclusion of any other person or authority the power to make appointments to the relevant service, promotions and transfers within the service, and power to remove and exercise disciplinary control over members of the service. Madam Speaker, the Lord Diplock goes on to say that Under the Westminster system, dismissal at pleasure will make it possible to operate what in the United States at one time became known as a spoiled system upon a change of government, and would even enable a government composed of the leaders of the political party that happened to be in power to dismiss all members of the public service who are not members of the ruling party and prepare to treat proper, proper performance of their public duties as subordinate to the furtherance of the party's political aims. In the case of an armed police force with the potentiality for harassment that such a force possesses, the power of summary dismissal opens up the prospect of converting it into what in effect might function as a private army of the political party that had obtained a majority of the seats in the last election, end of quote. So the Privy Council saw the potential if you seek to bring political 
engineering to the appointment of a, of a police commissioner, and they saw the potential of the creation of a private political army. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is clear. It is clear that when you look at the selection order, it is clear that the, under the order, the trigger for the process is the minister. So there's ministerial intervention. And it is clear that the PSC will not be able to trigger the recruitment process on its own in the absence of ministerial fiat. So that the, therefore, what you have effectively, it can only be triggered with ministerial intervention, political intervention. The 2009 selection order, Madam Speaker, had authorized the contracting of a firm to conduct an assessment process of candidates and to prepare a short list of candidates. What is of note was, is that the PSC was given discretion to, dis, to discuss the results of that shortlist with the firm. The 2015 selection order now contemplates a local firm, which is currently not defined, but to conduct a recruitment process, including inviting applications. The PSC's discretion to decide the length of time and vacancies which would be advertised has been removed and they require to inform the prospective applicants of where pertinent information is to be found has been removed. The firm now has complete control over the inviting of application and the applications and there is no longer any requirement for a vacancy to be advertised. So the firm is given a discretion as to how and who to invite to apply. There is no longer any transparency in the process of inviting application. More importantly, the contracted firm appears to be given a discretion to pick and choose who may apply. This stains the nomination process from the start, since the firm may very well deliberately exclude certain individuals from the application process. The result being that the PSC would not have it before it the fullest information before making a nomination. Madam Speaker, it is clear. It is clear that when you say local firm, you have not defined that. And I want the Honorable Prime Minister to tell us, having regard to the extent of which you no doubt, as Chairman of National Security Council is aware, the extent of organized crime in this country. Is there a firm in Trinidad and Tobago that is insulated from the reach of organized crime in Trinidad and Tobago? It is clear, Madam, Madam Speaker, that when you look at the separation of powers principle, when you look at the whole question of the separation of powers, you will recognize that once more that there is an interference in the process. Once more, there is a breach of that process. That the honorable member, by virtue of the intervention of the Minister of National Security. Madam Speaker, it is clear, with, with the, the case of Aaron Hines, that is relevant, that the minister, a politician under section 76 of the Constitution, that he has no role to perform in the, in, in the process, no role to perform other than to subvert the Independent Services Commission. And when you look at the case of Leonage and R, the very structure, it is indicated at, at 1966-1, All England, 650. It is clear that, Madam Speaker, that in those circumstances, that Services Commission, whilst it applied to judges, it is similarly applicable to the Services Commission. So, Madam Speaker, it is a basic rule of statutory interpretation is that subsidiary legislation cannot be used to expand the remit or jurisdiction or powers conferred by the primary legislation. 
To do so is contrary to the ultra-virus principle. Order, two, order 218 is a, is a constitutional instrument which have to be assessed against the constitutional powers of the Police Service Commission under Section 123. The issue, of course, is directly relevant. This order seeks to give power to the minister to trigger the recruitment process in relation to the functioning of the Police Service Commission. This conflicts with the pronouncement of Lord Diplock and Thomas and the AG. The words on requests of the Minister of National Security are repugnant to the constitutional powers of the, public, the Police Service Commission under Section 123.1 of the Constitution. Consequently, Madam Speaker, it is clear. It is clear that these orders, the manner in which they came into being by stealth, the manner in which they weren't published and circulated to this House, the manner in which that the, given the primary legislation of consultation with the opposition, consultation with the, the Police Service Commission, there has been utter disrespect and disregard. It is clear as we face the twin attacks in this country from the precipitous decline in oil prices and the meteoric rise in in murder and criminal activity in this country, that you have a government calling upon us to come together, but doing one thing, unilaterally engaging in a process in which they do not want the country to come together. They are polarizing the country, but saying, come together. And that therefore, if you polarize the country, you will have no progress. If you it, therefore, I call upon this government, it, as the Express has indicated, withdraw these orders, have the necessary consultation, come back to the people, have the widest possible consultation. People have a real fear, and you are the Honorable Member for Digo Martin West, long in this politics, perhaps the, the Longest serving member. He knows the nature of this. Honorable party. member for Shogonas West, your speaking time has expired. I beg to move. Ma Madam, ma Madam Speaker. Uh, Honorable member, you beg to move? I beg to move. Member for Supriya. Thank you, Madam Speaker, I beg to second the motion and reserve the right to speak. The Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to contribute to this motion before the House. Madam Speaker, I listen with great intent to my learned colleague, the member for Shabonas West, who spent the first 30 minutes of his time speaking about a lack of consultation. If I were to summarize the arguments presented this afternoon, and I don't mean to be uncharitable, but I had expected a little bit more of my learned colleague, whom I have great respect for. So did I. But if I were to put his arguments in summary, they would be one, lack of consultation, two, an attack on democracy, three, that there was a challenge in a, a failure, supposed failure to allow for this motion to negative these um, orders to, to, to be considered, four, that there was an improper application of the Minister of the National Security, what he called a wrong trigger, to, to engage in the process prescribed by the Constitution. And then fifthly, that there was an unconstitutional argument. That's the sum total of what my learned colleague has said opposite. <laughs> Mr. Madam, Madam Speaker, let me put this out through you most respectfully for the Honorable People of Trinidad and Tobago. We stand here today, as the last government did, pursuant to Section 75.1 of the Constitution. We, Madam Speaker, stand here quite properly under the rubric that there shall be a cabinet for Trinidad and Tobago, which shall have the general direction and control of the government, 
of Trinidad and Tobago and shall be collectively responsible, therefore, to Parliament. When we go to section 53 of the Constitution, Madam Speaker, Parliament sits under the heading Powers, Privileges and Procedures of Parliament, Part 2, Section 53. Parliament may make laws for the peace, order and good government of Trinidad and Tobago, so, however, that the provisions of this Constitution, or insofar as it forms part of the law of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Independence Act 1962 of the United Kingdom may not be altered except in accordance with the provisions of Section 54. We are here pursuant to Section 123 of the Constitution, which allows for members who wish to have a statutory instrument revoked, annulled, or negatived, we are here to allow that process to continue in a parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. The supreme lawmakers. Let me deal disaggregating my learned colleagues' arguments as follows. Relative to the supposed denial of the opportunity to negative or annul this particular standing, this order which we have, have before us now, my learned colleague has no further to go than to say we are here today dealing with a motion to negative. Full stop. He made great complaint that the statutory instruments committee could not consider supposed breaches of the standing orders 80 and 93 raised at the behest of the learned minister, uh, member um, Kuba South. Kuba South. And yet, the fact is, the only reason that the Statutory Instruments Committee could, could not consider that is because they filed a motion. So you have defeated yourself by your own actions, and we are here before the Parliament, and we are engaged in the process. <coughs> That's point number one, dealing with the smaller issues first. Point number two, we heard a lot from the Honourable Member that the member for Diego Martin, Northeast, had mentioned the word consultation 20 times. He took time to, to consider it 20 times in his budget contribution. And he stands up today and in relation to the issue of consultation, seeks to strike fear into the hearts of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And not once did he reflect upon two things which are of great import for Trinidad and Tobago. One that the subject of the amendment of the process of appointment of a commission of police and a deputy commissioner of police has been with this parliament, the 10th parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago specifically, since 2010. And in fact, the contributions on the hand side, which I'll come to in a moment, demonstrate that there has been an active process of consultation commenced by the last government. The second thing which he studiously avoided, and I can't understand how he could have. So you feel it's done. I can't understand it. I cannot for the life of me appreciate how the honorable member could have skipped so nimbly past a document called the Report of the Multi-Sector Review Team on the Police Service Commission, <laughs> dated 19th March 2013. And I want to put on the record the issue of consultation. Because by my estimation, Madam Speaker, far from the need to count Diego Martin Northeast reference 20 times to consultation, the Honorable Minister could have counted the 29 events of consultation in the last six years on this issue. And let me tell you what the 29 events of consultation are. Set out in black and white in over a hundred pages of report, not even mentioned by my learned colleague. Listen to this, Madam Speaker. There was a review team, a multi-sector review team created to consider the issue of the Police Service Commission. And specifically, as one of the head items, the manner in which the Police Service Commission um, appoints a commissioner of police and a deputy commissioner of police. Mm -hmm. Who comprised this? 
Professor Ramesh Dusaran, Chairman, Senator the Honorable Anand Ram Logan, Honorable Jack Austin Warner, Carolyn Sipasad Bachan, Honorable Donna Cox, Mr. Ian McIntyre, SC, Mr. Samraj Haripal, SC, Dr. Kerry Sumer, Rye, Rye Secretary, Mr. Alwyn L. Daniel, Sergeant Anand Ramesa. How many times did that particular committee meet? In black and white, in the multi-sector review team, it says that they met six times as a review team. A subcommittee was appointed which met 15 times thereafter. An addendum report was had by way of telephone conferences, reports, and one other meeting. But not only that, the records inside the Ministry of National Security show further post the delivery of the final report to the Prime Minister then, the member for Siparia still, that December 17, 2012, 10th December 2012, 18 February 2014, 28 February 2014, May 13, 2014, June 16, 2014, July 17, 2014. But in that, I didn't count yet. Note went not only to the cabinet of the last government, the full multi-sectoral report, it went to the Finance and General Purpose Committee on May 25th, 2015. It went to the FNGP as well on May 27th, 2013. It went as well, cabinet minute number 1399 of May 23rd, 2013 shows that it went to FNGP. Cabinet minute number 1563 of June 6, 2013 shows that it went to FNGP. Madam Speaker, we heard the Honorable Member say, no consultation. The documents in the last 10th Parliament show that there has been significant consultation. Let me say what the consultation has been. And the Honorable Member said, this government, I would like to put on the record, this government's approach to governance is that the governance is a continuity issue. And that we, having stepped into the saddle now of government by an election process, we are obliged to pick up the documentations that we meet, which demonstrate conclusively that Trinidad and Tobago has had nearly six years of consultation on this issue in a wide aspect of perambulations. And Madam Speaker, that's not all. There's more. There's more. These are the Hansard records where members sitting opposite condescended to putting onto the record the fact that consultations were going on. Friday, June 25th, 2010, the first matter that the parliament then dealt with under the leader um, of the government, then the prime minister, then the Honorable Mrs. Passard Bicessa as the member of Separia was prime minister, put onto the record the whole history of the legislation coming forward, the three bills, Act number six, Act number seven, Act number eight of 2006. She went on to deal with the fact that the Penn State University to undertake the process was a difficult and expensive process. She lamented at how much it cost some $3.4 million in one year to cause the selection utilizing the firm externally as it was then. She went on at page 37 of her Hansard, she said, the objective to have a commissioner with the power to manage the service to ensure human, financial, and other resources of the service are used in an efficient and effective manner is in effect being frustrated because of this process. As an opposition then, etc. she went on to say, it cost in the last four years, the honorable member said, eight million dollars to go through that process. And in fact, the honorable member went on to say, you know, there is nothing wrong with a pronoun as it follows honorable member. It would be repetitive. Don't, don't lose your cool over the use of the word. So Madam, Madam Speaker, the fact is, the honorable member then went on to say that 
a joint team would be set up to deal with this. We can't afford that there's no commissioner of police whilst another two or three year process takes place. So we continue with the existing law. Where was that? Where was that? that was on the June 25th, 2010. We are now the 20th of January, 2016. <laughs> this was a joint position taken to review the law in the interim. She said, we, the honorable member said, we couldn't wait. That wasn't all. What happened on Friday, June, July 2nd, 2010? There was a gentleman, honorable member, quite silent these days. He was then leader of government business, the honorable member for Oropuch East. What did he have to say, the honorable member? He lamented that paid 73 of his hands out, another $8 million, three years. Effectively, that the process was too long. The honorable member went on to say that after several years, there was bloodshed, etc. Eventually, a bipartisan approach came on. The honorable member said that the process of using the foreign firm um, was a convoluted process. The honorable member went on to speak to the issue of the 2006 process being flawed. The honorable member, honorable member had a lot to say then. July 2nd, 2010. What next, Madam Speaker? He said, the Honorable Member, specifically at page 73, we have made the commitment to work swiftly and urgently with the opposition to ensure that we review the relevant law, we review the order. Two things. We can remove the cumbersome nature of this process, remove these delays so that you can get to an outcome quickly and also reduce costs. Mr. Speaker, early in the evening, like you, I was shocked to hear the revelations from the Minister of Works and Transport. Let us not fool ourselves. This three-year process has cost taxpayers almost $8 million to appoint a Commissioner of Police. Even when he's appointed, that man could not earn $8 million by way of wages and salaries. So it costs more to appoint than it would to a cost to pay the officer. That's what the Honorable Leader of Government Business had to say on July 2nd, 2010. April 1st, 2011, the Honorable Member for Oropuch East, Leader of Government Business, again recapped the process. But he went further. I would like to indicate to this House as well, this is in keeping with the last established in June 2010, to record that during the debate, the appointment of the Commissioner of Police, etc., it was a commitment by the government and the Prime Minister, the Honourable Member for Siparia still, and I want to record that the Attorney General has indeed taken steps to seek consultation with the relevant stakeholders to ensure that we have the best advice and the best guidance and we participate with the major stakeholders so that we will be coming in due course with some alternative method and some amendment to the existing law. The Attorney General has pursued that and has written to all stakeholders, including the police service. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Attorney General then, Senator Anand Ram Logan, SC, went on to describe that the issue of appointing a police, a police commissioner the AG described it as a red herring, insisting that someone will be forced to perform to the maximum if left if an acting position, since if that person did not meet the grade, someone else would be placed at the helm. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Attorney General spoke in the Parliament then on a motion, a private motion brought by Senator Fitzgerald Hines then in the period 25th October 2011 to 27th March 2012, the Honorable Attorney General entrusted with the charge to carry this on, he says, relative to the Commission of Police, he says, a commissioner he says that he lamented over the four year period that had gone on. He said, the Honorable Member, that there was an acting Commission of Police under the previous regime. There was no confirmed commission of police. And here are the words. Now, when someone is acting 
acting appointments in these serious critical offices connote something to the person who is acting. It sends a signal to the wider population at large, and it carries with it a certain undermining of the authority of the institution of the state that is involved. So that was the integ that was that runs to the integrity. The honourable member made a case then alleging that the last government prior to his was guilty of not taking steps to appoint a commissioner of police. Madam Speaker, for the record, the multi-sectoral committee in dealing with this matter specifically delivered a report to the government then a report which we picked up on coming into office demonstrated wide and serious consultation. And in the report, Madam Speaker, at pages 32 to 34, specifically, a wide range of events specifically contemplating significant amendments to the, pub, to the Police Service Commission were traversed. That it should be expanded. That it should have its own autonomy that the positions should be broadened in terms of consideration. It specifically went on to say that the process of the appointment of the Commission of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police at 4.27, that the selection criteria should be amended, Madam Speaker, and elsewhere in the report. This is what was recommended. What happened next? We heard the Honorable Member consult Consult, consult, he says. Failure to consult, he says. But what happened then? All of this work going on, what did the reference that he made to this parliament today relative to the last commissioner of the Police Service Commission bring? He said that that gentleman had been recently quoted as saying that it could be a privatization effort, etc. But the honorable member studiously left out the fact that Professor Ramesh Diosaran submitted a resignation to the then government, to the president, on the 6th of March 2013, is it? No, 6th, 2014, August 6th, 2014. It was published August 1st, 2014. And he cited, as covered in the newspapers then, the Guardian newspaper specifically, he, the Honorable Member, in a publication of Wednesday 6, 2014, <coughs> failed to note that Professor Deuceran said the multi-sectoral review team, which I chaired, had submitted its report since March 2013, proposing the required reforms to the administrative and legislative framework within which the Police Service Commission now operates. So, Madam Speaker, not a mention of Professor Deuceran's disdain, it appears to be, and frustration, the fact that he ended his second term there prematurely on the failure of the then government to deal with this multi-sectoral report. Not a mention of that. Not a mention of the amount of consultation that was had. Simply skipped over it. Jumped to today. And I want to put for the record that this government, in amending the orders as we have, considered the wide consultation in black and white, dealt with the amendments that we had considered, went into the ministries that we took control of, and carried on with the work of governance of Trinidad and Tobago for the benefit of people. Because where we do agree is that the peace, the honorable members are, are really abusing the, 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 the silence of this house. Ma Madam Speaker, the honorable member failed to acknowledge that governance is a continuing process and that there has been a serious amount of consultation. So what do we do as a government? Do we engage in analysis paralysis? Do we continue, Madam Speaker, most respectfully, the last commissioner of police to resign in this country resigned in 2012, Madam Speaker. The Parliament, I want to commend for having produced an information bulletin, shows squarely that the Commissioner Dwayne Gibbs served for the period 2010 to 2012. So let's count that. 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. 
We are, if you count it, just in numbers, five years, three years, five months, four years. Where are we four years later, Madam Speaker? Do we engage in a process and millions of dollars? Where is the report that a selection of a firm has even happened? But, Madam Speaker, I want to put onto the record another point. Could it possibly have been that the Honorable Member failed to also acknowledge that notwithstanding the fact that the Attorney General then, Mr. Ram Logan, had condemned the entire process of using an acting commission of police, could it be that he failed to recognize what the Attorney General appointed by the last Prime Minister had to say? Because it's a matter of public record that the Honorable Attorney General then, Mr. Anand Ram Logan, specifically told the nation that it was better to have an acting commissioner of police that he was not inclined nor his government inclined to use an official um, police commissioner because then there would be no motive to act better. He went on to say in the newspaper clipping that it would be better to, in fact, test him out or test drive him words to that effect. Because if you had appointed him and within six months you weren't satisfied, how could you get rid of him? That was the position taken by the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, who had a multi-sectoral report in his hand recommending amendments to the process for appointment of Commissioner Police. So you go in 2011, in a private member's debate in the Senate from saying, shame on you, PNM, for having an acting commissioner of police. You go for the member of Separia, the leader of government business then, Dr. Munilal, the member for Rupuch East, saying, we will accelerate the process. We have consultations. To all of a sudden, your attorney general saying is better to have an acting appointment because you will work harder. Government policy in the public domain. So how do we take them seriously today? Madam Speaker, let's deal with the deeper issue. How much time do I have left? Madam Speaker, what time do, is my time on um, end? Four or five. Thanks. Four or five. Twenty-two minutes. Lots of time. Madam Speaker, that deals with consultation. Simple fact, clear evidence in writing of deep consultation, clear evidence that that was a broad sectoral committee approach, including the all bodies involved in it. From this party as well, and I want to point out again, a member of the leader of the opposition's team in the person of Mrs. Donna, Ms. Donna Cox, Member of Parliament, sat on that committee and participated. Madam Speaker, that's consultation. We heard that this is an assault to democracy. We've dealt with the standing orders and the manner in which we can negative a motion. That is a non-issue. We are now on to the crux of an argument, which is whether there is any merit in the truth supposed to operate in this instance as proffered by the member for Shaguanas West. The member for Shaguanas West has essentially said that the wording of section 3A of this motion, of this order which is being considered, is offensive because it utilizes language as follows. The commissioner on request, the commission, which is the police service commission defined in the order, on request of the Minister of National Security shall, in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract an appropriate local firm, here and after referred to as the firm, to conduct a recruitment process, including inviting applications for the position. That's the 2015 order. And I would like to put this into context. The 2015 order is law right now. It was law the moment it was published, and it is so by virtue of Section 12 of the Statutes Act of the Laws of Trinidad and Tobago. It is only if it is negative that the negativing takes effect from the date of the resolution that negatives it. So let's get that straight to assist the Honorable Member. The law which previously existed by virtue of the order 
was in section 3A that the director of personnel administration shall, in accordance with section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract a firm experienced in conducting assessments of senior police managers to conduct an assessment process and the firm so contracted here and after referred to as the firm shall consult with the commission upon completion of each stage of the process. I would like to state the following for the record. What we have done by virtue of this order, Madam Speaker, is to adopt a framework approach to the manner in which the firm operates. The Honourable Member complained that the firm was not defined. The firm was not defined in the 2009 or 2007 orders. So that's a separate, you'll have your chance. So the orders would have effect. The point that there is no definition of firm is a non-issue because there was none in 2009 and none in 2007. Secondly, what the order has done is to recognize a broadening of the powers of the Police Service Commission. And I'm stating this for the record. The members have said that they wish to go to court. So let me put now, for the use of the pepper and heart principle as an aid for statutory interpretation, yes. that we have broadened the powers of the PSC consonant with the recommendations contained, the spirit of recommendations contained in the multi-sectoral report, which they did nothing with the last government. And in fact, what we have done is by recognizing that the process must go through the Central Tenders Board, through the exception to the Central Tenders Board, where NIPDEC can in fact have the control of the process, it is the client, the Police Service Commission, which dictates the terms of reference by which the firm is to operate. And in removing the prescriptive approach which the last orders have and put in effect a framework approach allowing the autonomy, broadening the autonomy of the Police Service Commission to do as it wishes in the selection criterion process by setting terms of reference, etc., we have in fact broadened the powers. And Madam Speaker, I wish to add, we have removed restrictive conditions contained in the 2009 order. In the 2009 order, Madam Speaker, the old section 3.1 said that the commission shall conduct its own assessment of not more than the five highest graded candidates on the short list. Why? If they want to conduct an assessment on all of them, they should have the power to conduct an assessment on all of them. We have broadened the power. What we have said is that there is a distinction between selection and assessment, between selection and recruitment. And by using carefully crafted terms, such as recruitment, including applications, a justum generis not being limited, by making sure that they have full assessment criterion because the Central Tenders Board Act exception allows the client, which is the Police Service Commission, through the Director of Personnel Administration, which is the administrative arm, it allows the client to dictate the terms of reference. And far from being a restriction upon the PSC, this is a broadening of its mandate, which it has been crying for for the last umpteen years. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Madam it is... Member, minutes have expired. You are entitled to a further 15 minutes on extension. If you so please, Madam Speaker, I wish to take a veil of seat. Thank you. you. Madam Speaker, let's deal with the fact further inside of what has been removed. Is it necessary that the old section 3K by which inquiries prompted an adverse reference needed to be put in a prescriptive order? It's basic principle of law that salmon letters must be written if an adverse consequence is to be drawn. You don't need to put that into a prescriptive tendency because it's the law. So that is something which was otios. Madam Speaker, and in adopting the position of a framework piece of, of, of guidance, it is by far better to broaden the powers. Let me put it simply. Under the company's ordinance, chapter 31, number one, there used to be the law that you had to prescribe every single power that a company could do. And if you didn't have a power, you couldn't do it. 
they amended the company's ordinance by way of example to the company's act. And we took the Canadian model which said, listen, no longer are we going to prescribe your powers, we're going to broaden all your powers. And let's make this clear. The Constitution is the supreme law of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, so says Section 2 of the Constitution. When you look to the Interpretation Act, Section 47 in particular, you see that no subsidiary instrument or law can be viewed any way other than, and I'm going to paraphrase, than for a purposive construction so as to enable the power and not restrict the power. It's true that you can't be ultra virus and go outside of the power, but the fact is the law must be read within the Constitution. Section 23.1 provides specifically in the Constitution that the power to appoint a commission of police vests in the public, in the police service commission. This order is to be read subject to the Constitution. Question, does the mere use of the word Minister of National Security cause problems? That's the issue before us. I was very surprised that the honorable members opposite left out what is perhaps the locus classicus in terms of the law, and that specifically is the case of Cooper versus the DPA. That case, Madam Speaker, if I can find it, is the, is the, is the place from which we find the best form of guidance. And what does Cooper say? Cooper establishes clearly that it is not every form of reference essentially to the executive that is to be frowned upon. The question is always, where is the line to be drawn between the arguments as to intrusion by the executive or legislature into the powers of the judiciary or quasi-judicial entities? Where does the separation of power line go? That's the essential argument. And the case Cooper in point there was the utilization of the examinations conducted by the Public Service Commission since 1966 by the Police Service Commission. And it fell on a publication by the PSC then, which said, we don't have the power to set these exams. That's solely the executive using the public service examination route. And the Privy Council held that that was in fact misleading and condemned it because it would have given a restrictive approach. And there would have been intrusion along the lines of that which was frowned upon by Lord Diplock in 1982, appeal cases 136, in that often quoted paragraph that has been cited here by the Honorable Member opposite. 1981. 1982 appeal cases is the citation. Thank you. So, Madam Speaker, the fact is, do we now, by use of the phrase, Minister of National Security, accept the argument that that is the only trigger? I wish to put on the record, Madam Speaker, the following points. Number one, the use of the minister as prescribed now on the, on the parliament record is merely in addition to the public service, the police service commission. It is not to the exclusion of the police service commission. <coughs> Secondly, that in fact is something which is to be encouraged. And I wish to point honorable members to the fact that in allowing the Police Service Commission the discretion to choose whether it accepts a process or not, that is what this bill, that order is intended to put into place. And the Police Service Commission has onto itself its full autonomy. What we have done is to give it the process by which it is not left in an analysis paralysis where the director of, of personnel, the DPA, takes four and six and eight years to ensure that a process is carried out. Ten which years. is the fact on the record from the members opposite themselves. Ten years. Madam Speaker, what further needs to be said re in relation to constitutionality? That approach finds favor, as I've just enunciated, in the entirety of the judgment of Cooper versus the Director of Personal Administration, 2007, one weekly law reports. And I wish to refer members specifically to paragraphs 26 onward. And I wish members to reflect upon the fact that in the Court of Appeal in Trinidad, albeit that their decision was reversed but on a different point, that it was demonstrated that it is not correct to say that any involvement by the executive in the affairs of the police service was unconstitutional. 
It was that publication which narrowed the approach the Police Service Commission took then that caused the problem. We are stating on the Hansard record today that the Minister of National Security in merely requesting that the process continue is not to the exclusion of the PSC. Secondly, they maintain unto themselves their autonomy in a framework environment where the prescriptive, unduly prescriptive approach has been removed. They, as the client, through the Central Tenders Board Act, have the liberty to dictate their own terms of reference through the DPA, because the DPA is the performing entity that does it. They also have the ability to choose what they wish out of it, because make no bones about it, the order prescribes, the 2015 order, that the entire autonomy is left in the Police Service Commission. And if they have full autonomy, you cannot possibly be complaining about it. I've heard the Honorable Member for Siparia say across the floor he's reading a different order. And I'd like her to consider the fact if the Commission still has in Section 3F now, which is the old Section 3M, the Commission shall select the highest graded candidate on the order of merit list and shall submit that candidate's name to the President. It is the Commission and only the Commission that has the power to select a point. Exactly. They could turn it upside down. They could get a list from the firm. They could take number five and put it number one, words repeated. They can do anything they wish with the firm's recommendations, but it is their power alone. And Madam Speaker, contemporary jurisprudence is very useful. If we were to accept the argument of the Honorable Member opposite, then in fact, the use of the DPA alone may very well have been an unconstitutionality. A breach. And the fact is, because the DPA can, notwithstanding the fact of being a public officer, can be viewed to be acting at the executive's discretion. And in fact, they are not a member of the judiciary, and they are not a member of the legislature, so they must be a member of the executive. Yes. You could take a strict argument really that way, works. and you can't approbate and reprobate the same argument. Yes, but contemporary jurisprudence, Madam Speaker, is to be found specifically in Fundamentals of Caribbean Constitutional Law by Tracy Robinson, Arif Balkan, Adrian Saunders, Judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice, going backwards, Arif Balkan, Lecturer, Faculty of Law, University of the West Indies, Tracy Robinson, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Law, Mona. And there is specifically for commendation at page 334, under the rubric, the need for operational flexibility, there is the following. A rigid separation of powers is neither desirable nor possible. Modern government requires the cooperation of various personnel and powers, so that maintaining a rigid separation among the branches would be counterproductive and inefficient. In the worst case scenario, it could thrust the executive and legislature into antagonistic positions, leading to a deadlocked government. By contrast, participatory processes of decision making can promote good governance through collaboration and efficient use of state resources, scarce resources. The permeability of boundaries between the branches of government is a contentious issue even in the American jurisprudence whose system espouses the purest form of the doctrine. Madam Speaker, it goes on. It says here, the latter has been unavoidable in the context of modern realities where, listen to this, the government we have built and now live with has attained a complexity and intermarriage of function that beggars the rationalistic tripartite schemes of the 18th century. How much more time do I have, Madam Speaker? Thank you. Madam Speaker, the authors go on to say, some difficulty of function allows one, he says here, another dimension of overlap between the branches is counterintuitively perhaps its potential for promoting intra-branch accountability by preventing the concentration of power in any single branch. Some diffusion of function allows one organ to act as a check on the other, reflecting in the constitutions by provision which facility interplay between the branches of the appropriate processes for high offices. The doctrine is only violated where one branch purports to exercise the whole of the power of another. 
whereas diffusion in the form of a partial spread of powers operates as checks and balances would. The search is for maintaining fidelity to the paradigmatic function which each branch alone is empowered to serve, even if some aspects are shared with another branch to some degree. Also important is for each branch to maintain and retain its autonomy, which is another way of saying <coughs> that even where powers are diffused, one branch cannot dictate what the other must do. With these safeguards, the outcome is a system which operates with checks and balances designed to prevent an over-concentration of power in any one branch of government. In its practical application, therefore, the doctrine accommodates a degree of overlap among the branches of the interests of both efficiency and democracy. And they rely specifically upon the DPP, sorry, the Cooper and Director of Personnel Administration case in the Privy Council, James Madison, Peter Strauss, Batashu Company versus CIRG, etc. And applying the present circumstances to the learning, both the contemporary law, beyond Leonage 1956, beyond Thomas 1981, reported in 1982. Beyond all of these, Cooper coming forward suggests what we have done is purely within the remit of the law and constitutionality. It is proportionate in that it allows a process to move faster. The PSC does not lose any of its autonomy. It and it alone makes the decision for a police service commission to act within a, the appointments of a commissioner of police and a deputy commissioner of police. It and it alone by the preservation of the old sections in the 2009 order, it is their autonomy wholly and solely. and solely. The use of, as the honorable member calls it, the trigger of the Minister of National Security is only ancillary. And why? Because the PSC can in fact deny the request. And if the PSC denies a request, it must give reasons. And if it gives reasons, it must do so lawfully and it therefore allows for a co-sharing to agitate through due process to move the system along. And that's what we agree must be done. In the Hansard debates from 2006, go forward. In the Police Service Commission reports, all of them, 2013, 2009, 2010, 2011, all of which I have, all of them complain bitterly about the complexity the expense and the time frame. In this circumstance, the word shall in the order, in consonance with the law in relation to the statutory interpretation of shall and may, and I wish to put it on the record, the extract from Crab, etc., from from Be from Benion, etc., all say that shall is to be interpreted as may, and that is in the law of the well-established principles in Trinidad and Tobago, both common law and otherwise. So, Madam Speaker, most respectfully, I don't think that the Honorable Member has crossed the bar of showing a disproportionality in the law. The autonomy is reserved specifically onto the Police Service Commission. The Minister's activity, or triggers he puts it, is entirely ancillary to their position, and it only goes to ensure that there's at least another arm watching but not crossing the line as the Privy Council considered in the Cooper case of where that boundary should stand in the separation of powers principle. Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute with my time having run. Member for Oro Pilch East. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, in addressing you, in addressing you, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute on this very important debate before us. And the speaker before appears to be seeking me out by pointing out statements made over the past on this specific matter and indicating <laughs> Madam, Madam Speaker, please. Would like to hear. 
the contribution of the honorable member for Oak, I'm sure I'm please. sure you would madam speaker let me begin by complimenting the member for Karani for Shabwana's West the member of parliament for Shabwana's West who filed such a motion to ensure that the country first to begin the country and the parliament take note of what took place in December the member for Shagwana's West must be complimented for filing such a motion and bringing this issue to the national community and this afternoon in making such a comprehensive presentation to the house on the evils that such an approach posed for Trinidad and Tobago Madam Speaker, the Attorney General, the Honorable Attorney General, the worthy, and might I say worthy Attorney General, really sought to respond to some of the issues raised by the member for Shagwana's West. But in doing so, I respectfully suggest, confused and confused and confused, and introduced issue upon issue, layer upon layer, of jargon, of vocabulary, of convulsion, of everything. And the matter before us is a simple matter. They, you produce two orders. They are dated, they were made on December 14, 2015. You did that. On 2016, it became law because of the process involved. Why could you not have produced those orders in a draft form? entertain the police service commission the police um, association and other stakeholders the opposition and the goodly attorney general would have had an opportunity to bring that presentation he brought before and we would have heard about crab and shrimp and dumpling and so on that you were quoting there but the attorney general did not answer one fundamental issue why did you not produce your draft orders and take it to the stakeholders and say, look, we are moving swiftly. Let us discuss this issue. Let us get your views and we shall go forward. And we will go forward. Yeah. They made law, they made law, and then it was left to the vigilance of the opposition to come to parliament, to come to parliament to alert the nation. But this is the law, as the Attorney General said, what we are debating is the law. It is a, it is a, a difficult proposition in that sense because normally we come here to make law. Huh? Right. Today, we are not here to make law. This is the law. Yes, we came here to negatize the law. And the opposition, the government of this country today should join the opposition in supporting this motion to annul the orders on several grounds. One, there was no need to do it in this surreptitious manner, in this in this manner that you know you don't care you don't care about consultation on the specifics the issue is not the 29 consultations that comprise the formation of the strategic subcommittee report it's not the 29 uh, consultations you know it is how much consultation did you have on these two specific orders that's the issue that is the issue None, absolutely none. And there are elements of the orders that cannot be found in the report of the subcommittee. Simply put. Now, is that a difficult proposition to understand? No. And we, it, it doesn't require at this stage all the quotation of law and casework and so on. It is you produce orders and you did not consult. The chairman of the Police Service Commission raised a red flag. Today, the opposition is doing the same. I imagine, given your history, your recent history, you may treat the chairman of the Police Service Commission as you treat the former governor of the Central Bank. Okay. You in charge. You in charge. You can throw the commission, at the com commission the chairman West. off the window. Throw them out the window. And I'm sure they go Martin Notice will find a way as he did before. As he found a way. So, so Madam Speaker, that is what we wanted to hear. We wanted the Attorney General to tell the country the dates and time that they consulted with the stakeholders on these specific orders, 218 and 219. But the Attorney General came to, to tell us you know, that we had the strategic subcommittee of the multi-sectoral review team. We know of that, at least those on, of, of us on this side, we know of that. 
and we know the recommendations and I put it to the Attorney General and to the House that these specific elements of both orders are not in the subcommittee report. They are not there. And it's there. I just want to remind you, it's only one order being sure. debated there. Sure. So these elements of the order are not in the report. So why did you have to go about doing it? Now, it could well be that the government means no wrong. I am not ascribing any sinister motive at this stage to the government. They, could, they come into office, they realize, look, we have had acting police commissioners here for years, we want to do something and we want to do it quick. Because we have accused the former administration of not doing anything, we want to do it quick. So let's do it quick. That could be the approach. And in doing that, it lands you into the terrain of incompetence. So you don't become incompetent. And this is why it, you know, it would have not... It could not be hurtful to the government to sit down with an almanac and work out the days. You know, you now get the parliamentary diary here. But you could have sit down with an almanac and work out backward the days. And we would not have this problem of having to debate a motion and the adjournment as to when is private members day and when is not. You could have just sat with an almanac and work out the days. This has a certain time frame. File here, debate here, Madam Speaker. But they didn't. So at best, it is incompetence that is showing itself now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a level of incompetence. And they are eager to do something. It would not hurt to wait 14 days again, invite discussions with the stakeholders and say, listen, this is our approach. We have considered this. What is your view? What would have been difficult with that? We waited five years, as you admitted, five or six years. What would have gone wrong with one month again? But no, you did this in this way. And we have also recorded the member for Shaguanas West, the very deep concern that the procedure and the law was not followed in terms of the publication and concurrently the matter coming to the House of Representatives. So that it could be so that the parliamentarians could become aware. Twenty one days later. Twenty one days later. Madam Speaker, we register our concern with that. Now what is the Attorney General going to say about that? But that was a oversight, it was, you know, they didn't, they, they were busy, Madam Speaker. But we have serious problems with the order before us. And later, I imagine, today, on the second order. You see, the country is taking note of this. And the Express today, the member for Shogunas West raised the matter, I'll just continue it here. The Express editorial today, please, no cloud over how to pick top cup. And they agree that they, we need change and we need reform. We need that. But the government, they conclude, because I, I don't want to read the entire thing. They conclude, but the government must get the process right. Meaning you got the process wrong. To come to the parliament, to tell the country, because it's the opposition who called you here today. Today you are here because of the opposition. This is not... This is not government business. You are here because the opposition filed a motion. So the opposition has called you today to explain to the country your incompetence mm -hmm. and your lack of policy direction on this matter. Madam Speaker, the government came and the Attorney General spoke on the recommendations of the Police Service Commission, uh, the subcommittee. And it is clear, anyone reading it, it, sta it states at page 34, just to read a couple lines, Madam speaker that the ambit of the police service commission it is recommended should be amended to include other offices that should be expanded and expanded role for the police service commission that the police service commission should be subject to greater and wider parliamentary reform or legislative reform the government today did not tell us whether this is a piecemeal approach, whether they have other legislative measures to reform the entire process as per the recommendations of the subcommittee. Do you have other recommendations that you are contemplating? You didn't come today to tell us whether you agree with the recommendations of the report that the, the police service commission should play an integral role and not be sidestep, as the former chairman said, you are trying to privatize the selection of a commissioner of police and a deputy commissioner. And that has severe repercussions 
Madam Speaker, for this country. As it is now, without reading in detail the order, why did you bring the Minister of National Security, and I, I at no time am I referring to the specific member for Point Fourteen, a distinguished public officer, at no time am I re referring specifically to this minister, but why are you bringing the Minister of National Security into this in the first place? At the request, suppose the minister makes no request. What happens? Mm -hmm. Suppose he makes no request, nothing happens? <laughs> suppose a government of the day prefers to leave a particular individual in place on, on one condition or another and the minister makes no request. What happens? Why are you bringing the executive and the member for Shogunas West <laughs> raise the issue? Why are you polluting that boundary between the executive and the service commissions, the independent commissions? Why are you making the police service commission a mailbox that a local firm will make a recommendation, a recommenda recommendation? And, and you remember, Madam Speaker, I remember before in a previous incarnation, you heard of a company called Eastman and Associates mm -hmm. yeah. and others in the health sector. And we had enormous difficulty with governance. What, now is what? Watkins. 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 That's not a DJ. Eh? No, Watkins, Watkins was a musician. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Speaker, and today you are encouraging this process and tainting and undermining the process. So while we had a difficult process before, and we all agree it was long, it was drawn out and possibly expensive, yes, what did you re uh, remove that to put? A process now that lacks transparency, lacks elements of good governance, encourage executive abuse. An executive abuse in an area of security. Yes. This is a country where over the years we have had a problem, the Bajan fishermen issue, that nothing came out of it. No investigation, no arrest. Drugs and ammunition found in the, former, in the former minister's water tank. No arrest, no prosecution. A former prime minister taking out a driver. And we have had so many allegations, serious allegations, of the abuse in the security sector, of abuse in the police service, of collusion between politicians and police. When the time comes now for you to put a system in place to ensure that separation, that transparency, that good governance, you fuse it into one and bring your cabinet involved. So the Minister of National Security has a function here, a politician for all intents and purposes, a politician. And a politician will go by the Prime Minister and say, Prime Minister, we have to do so and so, the law provides that I act so and so. What do you think? Who are we looking at? Which firm? And the firm, the firm could be given a mandate that we, we would like Officer X or Officer B. Because who knows, I'm not speaking about any other, other order but the one before us. Who knows, the qualifications may be watered down. It may be, I don't know, I don't know if you're speaking about that now. The, the qualifications may be watered down in terms of the criteria, in terms of the years of service. That may be so. So that you may have someone in waiting. He or she has to fit a particular bill. You change the order and you bring a politician into it to direct the police service commission on firms to request that they undertake this process. And that is a danger in a society where we have had no shortage of allegations about collusion between politicians and police. And the, and the defense sector. It is a sector that you must keep very far from politicians. And this is the order that we face today. And that is why we are here to reflect on the law and ask the government to support a motion to annul, to undo it. And we are saying, Madam Speaker, that far from what the Attorney General reported, there was absolutely not one hour of consultation on these specific orders as drafted. 
Therefore, to say that you had 29 consultation on the subcommittee report, that included issues of legislative reform, of administrative reform, and so on. And the Police Service Commission report itself, the subcommittee, suggested that the commission play a greater role in the selection recruitment. Today, the effect of these orders is to have a mailbox where a firm is uh, hired and the firm goes, select five persons, a postbox, and give them and say, look, pass this to the president. Tell the president this is the order. Pass that. Tell the president this is the order. That is the effect of this. And it is bad governance. It is a trip. It is a major, major crisis that you can create with this type of order. And to read out all of these elements of the cases and law and so on is fine, but it doesn't take, it doesn't take away from the elements of the order. You look, uh, Madam Speaker, you look, as well, uh, you look at the qualifications and what is required, not the qualifications, sorry, I'm looking at um, 3D, the selection process. The process of application of the candidate, biography, Assessor's scores, assessor's feedback, medical examination report, security and professional vetting report, etc. And the role, the role of the commission is to pass this information on to the president. That's the role of the commission. Essentially, it is not to investigate itself. It is not to, to get involved in any assessment of the merit of order, the order of merit list. It is to submit that candidate's name to the president. That is what the role is. That is what the role is. So, they get a firm to select the so you get you have a firm to select the person. And then give it to the president and say, yeah, yeah. Come on. And those with the experience reminded us over the years of the conflict between former administrations of the PNM and the Police Service Commission. They have always been at loggerheads, loggerheads under former chairman, I believe it was Kenneth Lala. Lala. Yeah. Under Kenneth Lala in 1993 or thereabout. We have always had this problem of PNM administrations in conflict with police service commissions over what they wanted to do. They Today, they have brought this order. Well, they have brought this order as well. <laughs> and look at the timing. Look at the timing. December 14th, December 16th, when reminded somewhere in January it came to the parliament, when I believe the leader of the opposition reminded everybody to follow the law, it came to the parliament. So they choose a time when the country may not even be taking note, huh? because I think this is between the red fet and the lime fet. That's the, that the time they come to parliament to discuss this. You know, they are busy trying to outfet each other at this season and hope that the country will not take note of these very serious changes. Very serious changes. Very serious. And I don't know if there's anybody from, from any other place, but why... No, and when they were boasting earlier about the legislative agenda, nobody told us about this. Nobody told us about this. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, on the basis, on the basis alone of that, of that lack of consultation on these specific proposals, this motion should be carried. But more than that, the Attorney General mentioned procedures and the work of the former administration on this matter. And at least quoting from several of us at that time, where we saw this as an important issue. But Madam Speaker, what the Honorable Attorney General did not have time to say, because he would have said it, but his time ran out, is that the former Attorney General had written to the former opposition PNM on several occasions, requesting meetings, requesting proposals, re requesting submissions on the opposition's view on making reform to the system. The Attorney General did not say, because he had no time, his time ran out, that it was the former Attorney General Anand Ram Logan that communicated with the, oppos the then opposition and made a request on several occasions, giving reminders that we would like to hear your submissions. We would like to meet with you to discuss this matter. And it is our information, Madam Speaker, that the then opposition was not forthcoming. 
with recommendations. But suddenly, within a few short months coming into office, you then have a full um, order published. When for five years, you couldn't make a recommendation. In a few weeks, you came up with the order and made it law. Five years, not one recommendation made to the government. In five weeks, three, four months, you publish orders that became law. In this manner, where the national community and the stakeholders who are key to this are saying, hold on, mash breaks, mash breaks, let's talk about this, it's an important process. And they disguise it by saying, we're waiting so long, 29 consultation report, we're waiting long, we must do this now. As if two weeks or four weeks would really undermine the effectiveness of this measure. It would not. And there are political questions to be asked, because this is essentially a political issue as well. Does the government of the day, does this government have a particular candidate in mind? And who is that that you are trying to bring in this way, in this way? Who? Who did not have 12 years and have 10 years? Yes. Who may not have had sociology but have psychology? Jacob. Why did you change that today? We don't know. Why are you relegating the police service commission to a postman to get your way with, with an executive member, with a politician, to be recommending firms? And we say local firm, proud. It was recommended, local firm be involved. But what is a local firm? What is a local firm? Is it a multinational human resource company with an office in Port of Spain? Is it Ernst & Young, PwC? Is it a regional consultancy group? What really would be a local firm for this purpose? Is it Eastman & Associates? Is it Watkins? Watkins? Is it who else? Harold Phillips & Associates. Harold Phillips & Associates is a company? <laughs> <laughs> so. I, know, I don't know the company, but if you say so. Jacob and Associates. Is it Jacob and Associates? Who would be the firm doing this? And while we agree that we would like local input in this and cut the costs and the time and so on, is it Imbert and Company? Is it who Imbert and Company? Well, you can do that because you throw the governor of the central bank. So you think you can do that as well? You think you can do that as well? You see, that's, a, that's the approach, Madam Speaker. From Juala to Jolene, gone. That's how they operate. <laughs> Madam Deputy. So, Madam Speaker, they operate because they're in charge. I would just like to remind you about the ruler are, are related to relevance. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker. I am sure that nobody for the Commissioner of Police job would be Jolene or Juala. <laughs> so, on the Commissioner of Police work, it wouldn't be them. Madam, Madam Speaker, the government should tell us as the debate goes forward the exact reasons why you changed, you make these changes. And where did these recommendations come from? That's the issue. Where did it come from? Because it is not in the report of the strategic subcommittee. Where did these recommendations come from? Unless I am mistaken, having read this about once or twice, where did this, in this report here, did they recommend that the firms must be done and shall be done on the request of the Minister of National Security? Security. Where? Where did that come from? And be brave enough to say that you would like to, to get the politician involved in the process of selecting a commissioner of police. Tell us why. And tell us why. Who do you want to lock up? Because that has been a complaint in this country and an allegation that they, that in, on coming into power, you want to effect certain things, you want to do certain things, you want to investigate certain issues, you want to proffer charges and so on, and you have someone who is compliant with the dictate of the political directorate. Is that the agenda? Honorable member, members it is 4.30. Might I ask honorable member how much longer you would have? Ma'am. The full time? Uh, might I suggest then that we break yes. at this time for th and resume it at 30 minutes uh, where the member for Oropooch East would have 20 more minutes if he be granted the extension. 
This sitting is now suspended for 30 minutes. Follow the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter. Our call sign is at TT Parliament. You're viewing the Parliament Channel 11. Also broadcasting on 105.5 FM. becomes a living reality. I, Jared Anthony Seeley. That's it. My decision is made. So many years debating and public speaking in secondary school, agitating in Uri Guild on campus, and through our youth pressure group, I have to stop just talking about change and be the change. Come to think of it, I'm going to radicalize this place. <laughs> I wonder if that's even really a word. Radicalize. I think I'll use it in my campaign slogan. Hey, where's the scene? The scene cool, but you know I intend to change that. Change? You're not tired trying to change your status quo. Rest up, man. How many various issues we try to bring up with our you? A few. Has it gotten us anywhere? Yeah, but this illusion meant, man. Check us. We're all at our first jobs and we've already realized that we can't change anything. So much for shaking things up, eh? Look, I'm not saying change happens overnight. And no one can see into infinity. Sure. But I can certainly try to take charge of my destiny. Yeah. And maybe by doing so, influence a few others to join me in creating some sort of change. Right, right. <laughs> you advocating and you manifest destiny. But what Google it now is when somebody advocates something in the belief that it's best for everyone. Like Bad Nayana. <laughs> Jared, you don't have things to do? Places to go, people to annoy? Yes, I do. But you know people like me. It's my charm on my intellect. <laughs> which makes me a perfect conduit to effect change. You all know this, which is exactly what I intend to do. By stepping into parliament as a new member of parliament for Shagarama Central. Conrad, why would somebody want to become a political candidate? My initial response is they don't, but having uh, regard to what occurs, I think that as a candidate, you have a responsibility to your constituents. You have, in some instances, 20,000 people that you have to speak for, that you have to represent. And that's a, re a responsibility that people don't understand. Um, my experience has been that candidates basically are people who can win a constituency. 
And to win a constituency, it means that you would have had to have a background in wanting to help people. And usually that is what comes to the table. I want to help people. I understand what their needs are. I keep talking to them all the time. They think that they could trust me. And therefore, if somebody says that, listen, I want you to represent me, then I say, OK, can I get uh, the support? But Kevin, certainly the whole notion of someone running as a political candidate under the banner of a political party means that to some extent they would need to subsume their personal convictions and projects that they have for themselves as individuals. How do you see that working? Well, the fact is candidates very rarely win a constituency. It is the party, and therefore when the party is choosing a candidate, they're really looking at someone who will not offend or lose them both according to the sensibilities of who they're trying to appeal to. So um, in that context, it's really a matter of um, choosing a candidate who already, I think, to mostly agrees with the party's philosophy and approach or really has no problems with the party's problems. This house has two voters. And this person is going to need assistance. She'll need transport on the day. And this elector wanted a tree trim there, the branches are touching the electricity line. Now, guys, take careful notes. I don't want to forget what I promised. Okay. Good Hi, morning. Good How morning. Are you? I'm good, thank you. My name is Gerald. Very Gerald. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I appreciate your vote and your coming Not election. a problem. Thank you. Good luck. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Boy, that was a long walk. Boy, have a new respect for candidates now, yes? <laughs> I have a new respect for MPs. I mean, trying to listen to as many constituents as possible and then attempting to fulfill all their needs, mm -hmm. that's a monumental task. It's you who sign up with you, though. <laughs> Politics chose me. You know I've always championed causes and run for office at Students Guild and social organizations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my commitment to improving people's lives is my raison d'etre. His reason for being Oh. <laughs> Practicing for parliament. <laughs> no, I genuinely want good for my country and its people. As cliche as that may sound. What happens then is that you go into the constituency, you convince people that this is who I am, you may not know me, but I will represent you properly. And then on that basis, during the election process, if sufficient people think that you are OK, then you are elected and you get into the parliament. And once you get into the parliament, it is expected that you would represent their interests. Now, being in parliament and being in government are two separate things. Being in parliament means that you have the final C in the laws of the society. You also have the final C in a representation because your constituencies, voices, their concerns, the issues that are important to them are represented by you in that forum. And what happens when the aspirations of your constituents collide with the, the broader national agenda, Kevin? Well, then always in our polit political culture, the party takes precedence. And what uh, Conrad said is technically correct, but not so in practice, in the sense that um, what the party wants, no, there's no separation between constituency and government, or parliament and government, because nowadays, with a small size, every MP gets appointed to be a government minister. The only way they don't is if they fall out with the political leader. Yes, but the appointment of a cabinet position does not guarantee anything. Because if you think about it, when you get into government, you have a structure of expenditure. So when you get into government, you know that there's $9 billion worth of cost related to uh, salaries and wages. There's $9 billion worth of cost related to debt repayment. That's $18 billion. It doesn't really matter. So when you are a minister, for example, and you're a minister of uh, works, it means that your budget and what you can do is constrained by the amount you have. And therefore, the ability for the constituents to get what you want as a result of you holding office is usually not something that happens uh, very easily. You really have to go and negotiate. You have to um, make friends. You have to ensure that you could do a better job than everybody else in looking after your people. OK, guys, guess what? I have, I have the figures from our sample survey. Uh -huh. Guess what? 
We're trending well. Ah, boy! Well done! We're doing good. Yeah. Well yeah. good. I still want us to concentrate on these areas, though. Because if we look at the previous statistics, it's polling divisions 1789, 2112, and 4753 that attracts the most swing votes. Brendan, let me see that. Well, we walked these areas three times already. Yes, and we'll walk it again, and again, and again. A candidate must walk his constituency three times. First, to make initial contact. Second, to reach those that we've missed the first time. And a third time, to solidify voter acceptance. So we're behind. But by your logic, that means it's five times in the critical polling divisions and three times in the rest of the constituency? No sacrifice, no victory, Gerard. Speaking of being victorious, though, I wanted us to check the EBC's website. Uh, they have a section on the electoral process. I'm a bit absorbed right now in reading the standing orders of the Parliament and the Constitution. Like I said before, I have a new respect for parliamentarians. You know, I wasn't really aware of how detailed the functions of the Parliament are. Or for that matter, the function of an MP. Yeah. I always thought you just convince people to vote for you, you win, and then you enter Parliament and talk now and again. Actually, the work begins almost immediately. First, you must establish a constituency office, attend orientation in Parliament, then learn the basics of creating legislation and start lobbying your parliamentary colleagues. Because to deliver to your constituents, you have to be able to lobby the government ministers in the various ministries. For box trains? Box everything? Debating is one thing, you know. But forming alliances and networking is a whole different political ball game. As well as, as an independent MP, I also have to ensure that I can successfully negotiate with the leader of government business and the chief opposition whip. Let's say the chill again. Yeah? I wouldn't mind if it was a train to Maracas. <laughs> with bacon and chalk. <laughs> Let's look at the election polls now and surveys. In some parts of the world, the UK most recently, um, polling got a bit of a bad name because of the inaccuracy, the patent inaccuracy of what the pollsters had to say. What role do, do polls play and do you think they're an effective way of, of really gauging where political parties stand in a campaign? I think polls help you to identify how your strategy should be shaped. But like everything else, if the society is very uncertain, and that is evolving as time goes on, you are going to see that reflected in polls changing. I think in the case of our society today, and certainly in the case of the uh, England experience, uh, there was a level of uncertainty about the decision-making process. People were going to be swayed on the basis of evidence, on the basis of likes, all of those kind of things. And I think that that is what is reflected in the poll. So that the poll really is simply something to guide you, to tell you where you have to go and what you have to do. If you look at our situation, for example, and you see uh, the parties changing strategy, that would be as a result of polls, because polls really tell you what people are thinking. Um, I don't think polls could tell you with some certainty what the results are going to be. But it tells you, as you are going along the way, what are the hot button issues, what are the issues you have to take to, to, to look at, where your campaign is going good, where your campaign is going bad. Kevin, your take on polls? No, polls have been improving constantly. And I, I think the English, the British thing was really an exception to the rule. So in terms of accurate forecasting, but Conrad makes an important point there. The importance of polls now is how do you shape your strategy? Because you link your poll results to new psychological techniques which have been experimented on in other cultures, but you can extrapolate here a lot of the time and shape your strategy that way. The unfortunate thing about that is that it then deals with people's kind of psychological buttons rather than issues and actual um, implementation of policies and so on. This, this is overkill. Why do I need a matrix rollout to plan my every move and activity? Just examine it, Brenda. Advertising and marketing campaign, media talk show schedule, walkabouts and cottage meetings, a manifesto, a pamphlet, t-shirts, flyers, banners. Next, you'll include a campaign song with a video and have a music track while I'm walking. Yes, Gerard. Trust me, all of this is needed. Don't you want to communicate your message effectively? Of course. Aren't you vying for political office? Let me tell you something that you already know. Becoming an MP starts by campaigning and outlining your vision. And in our Westminster system, 
there is a, it's not just about connecting with people and sharing that vision. There's a competitive element to it. And that's where the candidate with the best and most effective plan pulls ahead. Like you said, I already know this, but my concern is the cost, Brenda. This plan is too costly. Welcome to the real world. You have to spend to win. If not your own money, you need to attract investors. Let's say you become prime minister. You're going to have to sell TNT. You have to have that core ability to attract investment. You have to sell TNT. Prime Minister may be a bit far-reaching. Let's stay focused on my immediate intention. Getting into Parliament. Understood. Good. So, let's also limit the scripted talking points. I know how to articulate my vision in the way that I want to. I intend to be a parliamentarian that debates, not just reads from a piece of paper. You wait till I'm an MP in the House of Representatives. And you will be. Meanwhile, let's stay on message. And Matrix. Conrad, what's your assessment of the conduct of campaigns, political campaigns in Trinidad and Tobago? I think that we are in transition. I still think that um, the question of do you play to the audience in front of you? and get them really excited? Or do you actually talk to the undecided in the society who really want to hear a different message? Um, I think that um, the traditional parties, their bases will support them in spite of. But the way the society is becoming more, uh, with more individuals wanting to understand what is it that you are proposed to do insofar as quality of life issues are concerned, I think that is going to change uh, significantly in the future, the way campaigns are um, being held. If you look, for example, today you'd see there's a lot more conversations with people. And the reason that these conversations are taking place is because people really want to understand what it is you're going to do. You have major issues, you have issues in the society about revenue, aging population, uh, e the economy the whole change in terms of our competitiveness, productivity, these are real issues. And people want to understand, well, how are you going to solve these problems? Because we can understand the problems because we went to school. We are educated. Kevin, do you agree that the campaigns have this sort of agenda setting value? No. At this stage, not. I think that they're still appealing to the lowest common denominator in many ways. Um, th but the question of the undecided is key. You have to profile these people. Uh, only one pollster has done this so far, and he has found really no substantive differences between the what we call the floating voter and the usual uh, traditional voter. So there will need to be more polling of this group, and in terms, particularly their presence in the marginal constituencies, and then maybe what Conrad has spoken about in terms of more dealing with issues, agendas, and so on. We'll see a more of an emphasis on that because you're trying to court those people. Every election, the political parties put out manifestos. Do they have any impact, you think, in the final outcome of the elections? They must, even if it's just because people are bad talking them. So what the manifesto does, it really gives people a kind of concrete printing now that they can comment on and cite and so on. So it's going to have some effect. What that might be, I have no clue, nor does anybody else. Um, I will say that the proofreading has improved, so I'm happy about that. Conrad. The, the, the danger, that's correct, but the danger in that is this. Political parties put out manifestos. Some people don't look at it. But once the party wins the election, it assumes that it was based on the manifesto. And then usually what they do is they say, okay, manifesto is now government policy. So we put it in the parliament, we say, okay, this is what we will do, and we start to move to implement things that nobody in the country has taken time to look at. So. While it is true that during the election process, the ch election period, uh, people don't spend a lot of time understanding what manifestos say. When you get into government and you are seeing the implementation for the very first time, you say, but why are we doing this? Why are we building smelter? Why are we doing it? Well, it's in the manifesto. And to the extent that you are elected and you think that the manifesto is what caused you to be elected because you have superior policies to your opponents, then the country goes down in a particular place and you know we have all the um, 
the dissonance that we currently have in the system. But, but is it really true, Kevin, that people call pa pa parties to account on the basis of their manifesto promises? The manifesto, certainly for me, and I think for many other commentators, is a useful uh, whip. Because then you can say, but you said so and so. <laughs> Why are you not doing so and so? Yeah. These were your promises. Yeah. And so in that sense, the manifesto, it's better to have it than not have it because it makes, the, it, it commits the politicians to something. But the manifesto is also for the next election. Because when you go back to the population, you say, hey, what? I told you I was going to do all of this, and I've completed 99.99%. So it means that if I have a record of performance, then you should elect me because I am going to perform for you in the same way I've performed over the last period. So it has a value uh, in terms of how you um, validate what you have been able to accomplish to the population. On that note, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Kevin Balio Singh, Conrad Enel, thank you very much. The Honorable the Speaker. I, Jared Anthony Seeley, having been appointed a member of parliament, do solemnly affirm that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, upon which I'm about to enter. Agreed. Less walking now, more talking. <laughs> Dreaming convinces us that we know our path in life. But even I didn't foresee such a clear path to Parliament. No doubt my conviction to create a better world by impacting people's lives positively led me to this moment. Here's to Jared Seeley, the parliamentarian. Let the work begin. Nosley was once home to one of Trinidad's wealthiest men and remains an important part of our built heritage. The building was a sedate home compared to the ostentatious architecture of the magnificent Seven. But its understated elegance and enviable position on the southern side of the Savannah make it a very special building indeed. Gordon Gordon moved to Trinidad from Scotland when he was 17 to seek his fortune. He worked his way up from bank clerk to opening his own firm Gordon Grant & Company. His company offered loans to French Creole planters using their estates as security. The French Creole's extravagant lifestyles and the fluctuating cocoa market led to Gordon Grant and companies foreclosing on many estates. Tight-fisted William Gordon Gordon made up for his lack of social status by being stern and unforgiving in his dealings with the French Creoles, acquiring large land holdings, including many coconut and sugar estates. He stepped up the social ladder by marrying local royalty Gertrude Bush, the daughter of the colonial secretary. 
wealthy man like that would wish to project his success and his wealth by building a grand mansion in what was becoming a very posh part of Port of Spain, the area around the Queen's Park Savannah. It was built around 1904, the same kind of time of that Stolmeyers and Whitehall and all these other buildings were built because the Cocoa Barons were all competing with one another, really, as who could build the grandest house and etc. and showing off what they could do and how much money they had. Gordon hired the British firm Taylor and Gillies to build his town home. The same firm built Stolmeyers Castle. The Italian and German design of the architecture showed much more restraint than the extravagant excesses of the houses built around the savannah at the time. The home was designed in a neoclassical style made up of a combination of local and imported material. Costing $100,000, the house was partly made up of limestone quarried from Laventil. Yellow brick is, is, was imported from Britain. Um, you find that a lot of the brickwork in the traditional Trinidad houses were used as ballast in the ships that came in to be able to take sugar out. So when they came to Trinidad, I mean, they no longer needed the ballast. They were sold, given to the, the for construction. And this is where a lot of the, the, the yellow bricks came from. Uh, you had also imported acid etched glass on all the ground floor, windows and doors. Marble was imported from Italy for the veranda and the regal staircase was made from Guyanese purple heart. Handcrafted gesso work was done by Italian craftsmen and the ground floor ceiling included plaster of Paris details. Even though the house was built at great expense, much of its decor is beautifully understated. You know, I think one of the most important aspects of the building is, as I say, it's very tropical colonial in style. And you can see the, the, the development from, as I say, the small houses, you can see them in Woodbrook, you can see them in Belmont you know, which are like very small versions of this magnificent house. The completed house was the result of local labor and craftsmen working with contractors who were often Scottish. The name Knowsley is believed to have come from Lord Derby of the Knowsley estate in Cheshire. William Gordon Gordon lived in the Grand Home until his death in 1919. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs purchased Knowsley in 1956 for $250,000. The stately building has also been used to host presidential events since the partial collapse of the President's House in 2010. Knowsley is a fine example of how our heritage buildings can be maintained and preserved for our generation and many generations to come.
Madam Speaker. The member for Orofitch is. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before we took the break for tea, I was making the point that I want to just continue for a couple of minutes again on the issue of consultation. And the government and the country indeed may ask, well, we are raising these issues. What do we propose? What do we propose given? where we find ourselves. And Madam Speaker, it is not too late for the government to contemplate adopting another strategy today. <clears throat> A strategy that would lead to the orders, Order. Order these orders having no effect if the debate is adjourned. The government may contemplate adjourning this debate to ensure that the process is not completed and the orders lapse by that effect. And it, the government would give themselves would give themselves an opportunity to engage in some me, uh, meaningful dialogue with the opposition, with the police service commission, with the police uh, association and other stakeholders to have some meaningful dialogue in a very short term. 14 days, 21 days, as the case may be, over these matters. Like so that there is, in a way, there is, in a way, an escape hatch here. Because this is not a bill where you can propose amendments and you adopt amendments and so on. This is the law. We are debating the orders to negatize the orders. So that there, you can find a way to allow this uh, law, the orders, to lapse and let us engage in some meaningful dialogue over the specific elements of the, of the order before us. And if you do that, you would, be, you would be faithful to your own commitment. Because this is a government, as member for Shagwan as West said, at every juncture, they indicate that they're consulting. Consulting on economy, consulting on society, consulting on foreign affairs, consulting on everything. Foreign news dealers. But today, the orders are here, the order, we are debating the first order, and the critical stakeholder community is saying we were not consulted. The newspapers are saying mash breaks. You will crash. <coughs> and the government has developed in quick order a certain trend, a pattern that we are seeing. There was no consultation on the change of the foreign news car regime. There was no consultation on the VAT. No consultation on the governor. There was no consultation on other things. And in this matter as well before us, the order, there's been no consultation. So they have developed this reputation of talking consultation and doing the opposite. So you talk consultation and then do what you want. That's a, that's a trend that is developing. And the government will be well advised on this matter because, you see, if they take our recommendation and allow the orders to lapse because the process could not be completed, they lose nothing. You lose nothing. This is not collecting revenue that you will lose millions of dollars. This is nothing. There's no loss if you postpone this matter for a couple of weeks and engage the stakeholders because it is a very, very serious matter. Dealing with rights, develop, de dealing with policing, security, and so on. Madam Speaker, I want to return to the 3A of the order, where it states that at the request of the National Security Minister, in accordance with its uh, CTB Act, you contract an appropriate local firm. I already raised the issue about what is a local firm in this context. What is an appropriate local firm? Is it a firm with five years, ten years experience? Six months. In recruiting security officials? Is it a firm with six months? We have had a history in this country where a company created overnight named Sunway 
went on to get a contract for $365 million in the government campus. A company created overnight, Sunway. Is there another Sunway to come here? A daughterway? That you will then contract out to this appropriate firm? How long is this firm required to be in business? What is the business of this firm that makes it appropriate? What is the expertise of the firm? Is it a firm that, that is an office, a local operation of a multinational company? What? ...of the rule against tedious repetition. You have 15 more, I grant you the extension of time of 15 more minutes. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, to avoid incurring your wrath on rec repetition, I will just repeat the three points. <laughs> but, Madam Speaker, huh? Madam I, Speaker, I, I, remember, I would just like to guide. Sure. No one will be incurring my wrath. I'm just here to invoke the yeah. rules. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that being so, may I carry on? <laughs> the order also speaks yeah, right. to medical examination report appropriate security and professional vetting reports and so on. And Madam Speaker, it is connected. The appropriate firm is connected to what is, it is required to do because I want to advance as well that unless we can get concrete examples from those opposite, opposite which firm in this country today would you say have a track record selecting. of selecting persons in accordance with this type of um, criteria? with selecting persons in accordance with security vetting and medical examination report, uh, doing um, heavy uh, work, forensic work on biographies of persons and so on. You don't have firms that regularly do, the, do this. So this is not the, 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 the normal firm that you are talking about. Which firm will you bring? Given that they have to engage in this type of activity, this is why it was better in the order if you clarify the firm. Because it may not be necessary, Madam Speaker, to only talk of a local firm. It may be, you, you may have wished to look at firms that are regional or, or operate in the hemisphere that has experience, significant experience, in security recruitment. What is to prevent, this is an interesting question as well, what is to prevent a major security provider from using a subsidiary firm within its ambit to conduct this assessment where that firm is part of a wider operation in the security sector, maybe the private security sector in the region, and the firm is also involved in recruiting. Madam Speaker, this is a small island where when you do a drug bust and you um, seize items, illicit items, and so on, you run up to the tune of $600 million on a drug bus. You run up to the tune of a billion dollars over time in illicit items. Those persons that are involved in that can buy out, undermine, and form their own firm for the purpose of recruiting a police commissioner. So while we talk about vetting the commissioner, the candidate, we need to vet the firm. We need to vet the firm. And that is a process that the police service commission should be involved in. And they alone should be involved in that. No one else, no other authority. The Police Service Commission should be the only authority involved in recruiting and be in a position that they exercise authority, not through this process. Because if it is we continue with this, nothing will stop a drug baron, a drug lord operating in this country from establishing a firm, buying out an existing firm, and having that firm recruit a commissioner of police. A commissioner of police has enormous responsibility under our amended constitution. Enormous responsibility, including the promotion of police officers, including the formation of squads within the police, including dealing with terrorism. International terrorist syndicates and their local allies and cells can easily buy out firms. 
big, big firms and have them involved in recruiting and approving a commissioner of police because the effect of this order is that the firm approved the commissioner of police. Not the police service commission because when the firm submit their report based on A to F as is in the order, all the, the police service commission does is look at it, look at the grades and they put the order. Yeah. So if someone gets 75 and someone gets 55, they cannot change it around by, by engaging in another process or a related process. That's the point. They cannot. It is left today to a private, local firm that could be undermined in any way by politicians, by drugs, by terrorists to select a commissioner of police for Trinidad and Tobago. And I am sure my friends opposite understand the danger of that. They must understand the danger of that. They must understand the danger of having the executive participate in this process as well. Over the years, I'm reminded, in 1993 or thereabout, when a former minister of national security tried to get a sitting commissioner of police to retire on public, in, on public grounds, public interest grounds. I don't know how much of you could remember that, Jules Bernard. Bernard. Where a minister of government of national security took action to have him retire on public, on public grounds. And we are going back to those days if today you pollute this line between the executive and the independent commissioners. The member for Shogunas West made the point that it, over the years and everything we have done from Dr. Eric Williams to the member for Siparia, we have been pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope towards greater transparency and depoliticizing processes. Today, we come full circle and we go back to the politicization of the public service. And if you can do this today, you will do it again with the Teaching Service Commission, with the Public Service Commission. You will do it again. And take us backward where successive administrations and prime ministers of all parties have taken the country more and more towards independent institutions. Even if they may not like the final choice of the independent institutions. But this government is, 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 is demonstrating a frightening tendency to revert back to politicization of independent institutions. And you saw it, you saw it with the central bank, which I'll not discuss because that would be moving outside the order as well. But you saw it there, and you are seeing it here today. And the order of meritless, wanted to get to that as well, the order of meritless. Can they, in this setup here that they're proposing in the order, can the Police Service Commission reorder the merit list based on any criteria? I suggest no. They can't. And if you would have amended this using any strategy we spoke about before, you can give the Police Service Commission more leeway, more independence to exercise a professional judgment based upon the work done by a firm. But to contract out and privatize the appointment of a commissioner of police to a private firm is wrong. It's wrong. And the, the government says as well, in the presentation of the Honorable Attorney General, reading from the records, that we were very concerned, as we are, with the time taken to do this, and the money. The expenditure and the time, the process, cumbersome and so on. But yet, at number five, the order of merit list is valid for a period of one year. What happens now when one year expires? You have to go through the process again because that, that merit list, for any reason in this process, for any reason it could be bureaucracy, it could be someone on leave and nobody replace them. I mean, we know the system, some of us. <coughs> someone could go and leave. And in that, in that time the person is on leave, the bureaucracy has not yet appointed properly a person who has the legal authority to do something. We saw it, I think, in the area of land and so on. We saw that. So for any reason, you could have a delay in this process. But when you pin down the, the order of merit list, you pin that down, its validity is pinned to 12 months. What you are saying, is if 12 months and one day go by, that list is not valid. 
you know you have to go and get another firm or the same firm as the case may be and go over the process again if you had consulted with the stakeholders you had consulted with the opposition on this matter we may have been in a position to make some suggestions and recommendations to you and we could suggest that a, a, an order of merit list be valid for two years or three years as the case may be otherwise there is a real problem that you could have an order of merit list the process takes a few months and one day goes by after 12 months and you have to go through the process because someone can take you to court and say listen I was not appointed the system was unfair to me my rights have been violated because the merit list expired the validity of the merit list and these are some of the the, the nitty-gritty detail issues that we could have raised if we had sight of it before it became law because this became law and the draft order we had to read about it in the newspapers I remember sometime in December reading in the newspapers that the government approved orders two orders for selection and appointment and criteria and I'm there thinking well this has to be a cabinet decision so maybe at a cabinet press conference the member for La Hoqueta Talparo unless I'm mistaken I stand corrected did the member of La Hoqueta Talparo did you present yourself as you normally do on Thursday afternoon and indicate to the country that you have passed these orders and these are the effect of the orders and these are the elements so okay fine you did so then if you have done that why could you not have given us a draft as Minister of Communication given the country and the stakeholders a draft order before you went ahead to publish and make law the right forum when it is law already I don't know if they appreciate and understand that process La Hoketa Talparo says it's the right forum when the thing become law already you are saying that listen you really don't care the effect of this is to say I don't care we made the cabinet approve it it is law and I don't care you all do what you have to told journalists that too well I, I, I won't want to ask him any question because I know he takes questions only from reporters Reporter. not opposition members. members you see madam speaker you see madam speaker the deep issue here is that it is in the most significant area economy and crime are almost running together and they're interrelated they are running together as a dominant issue of our day today every single day you open the papers is either fat or murder on the front page or murder in fat on the front page and that you will treat a matter like this in such a flippant manner that you you say bring it to Parliament and the member for La Hoqueta Talpar is new he's a colleague I've known him for a long long time he's new <coughs> and he and I would remind him that is the opposition who brought it to the Parliament not the government you are here because the motion has been filed by Shogun as well you did not bring it to the Parliament in your world you made law and you all do what you want so the, the opposition is here bringing the government to the parliament yeah, to right. indicate to the country so it's not you brought it to the parliament to say this is the right forum and so on it's the right forum and you did not bring it yeah, madam parliamentary committee. madam speaker the related issue here is of course the timing and the parliamentary system itself other speakers would have much more time than me would also speak to this issue of the undermining of the parliament that the parliament has been undermined where the committees relevant to this could not do its business could not do its business because of the timing that we found ourselves in and the government may have a point it might be timing but they're in government they're in charge they should look at the almanac and work out the agenda don't wait to come here to scramble over which day is private members there and which day is not and whether the standing order is, is, could be amended or what. Work out your agenda properly. Otherwise you will be accused in the first instance of sharing competence and maybe by extension something else. So our message today, Madam Speaker, is for the government to take note of these issues, to recognize that the, the country and the critical stakeholders are very concerned with the process the timing the lack of consultation and the details of this and how it can be abused in an arbitrary manner it can be abused and to take a responsible step by triggering a process as well to ensure that it that the law 
is not valid in this case. <coughs> While we all are committed to implementing the law and bringing the change. A few weeks, a few days more, will really do nothing. Will change nothing. Because if you go ahead and you vote against the motion of Shagona's West today, you're not appointing any commissioner of police here. It's carnival. When carnival finish a few months after, you will probably get a firm and so on. Now this is going to happen in the next week or two. You can take the time to consult with the stakeholders. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honourable Member for Digo Martin, North East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I shall now do what the Speaker's opposite have not done. And I shall look at the matters before the House. Something they have failed to do, whether deliberately or otherwise. Madam Speaker, the motion before the House seeks, seeks to nullify or null or negative the Legal Supplement Part B, Volume 54, Number 128, Legal Notice Number 218, Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, order made by the President under Section 123.2 of the Constitution, the Commission of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police Selection Process Order 2015. Now, Madam Speaker, this order replaced the previous order which was legal supplement part B volume 48 number 59 legal notice number 102 of May 2009 and it's important for this parliament and for the wider public to understand what we are about today and the things that the members opposite have left out of this debate in the previous order, which they did not object to, the selection process for the appointment to of the offices of Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police was as follows. And this is section three of the 2009 order. The selection process for appointment to the offices of Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police shall be conducted in the following manner. A. The Director of Personal Administration shall, in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract a firm experienced in conducting assessments of senior police managers to conduct an assessment process. And the firm so contracted shall consult with the Commission upon the completion of each stage of the process. B. The firm shall advertise each vacancy for a period to be determined by the Commission of not less than seven days. C. An applicant shall apply in the form specified by the firm, shall submit to the firm his resume, references, etc. The firm shall indicate in every advertisement the guidelines for the assessment process, supply a copy of the order, or say where it will be found a written prospectus of the police service. E, the firm shall select from the applicants received the most suitable candidates for the assessment process. F, the firm shall ensure that the candidates referred to are subjected to the best practice security vetting. G, at least one of the persons serving on the assessment panel shall be an equivalent or higher rank in, in, in an equivalent or higher office than the candidate. H, the firm shall submit to the Commission the results of its assessment process in the form of a short list, and the Commission may consult or discuss those results with the firm, a report on its assessment of the entire process, which should include recommendations for improvement in respect of the candidates, the following documents, application of the candidate, resume, assessor's scores, assessor's feedback, medical report, security report. I, the Commission shall conduct its own assessment of not more than five highest graded, the five highest graded candidates on the short list. They may gather such other information as they consider necessary. It goes on to say if inquiries by the Commission result in an adverse report, they will notify the candidate. 
allow him to make representation, etc. The Commission then shall then take into account all information on the candidates and thereafter establish an order of merit list and then send that list to the President. That's the whole order. Let's see what the new order says. The selection process for appointment to the offices of Commissioner of Police, Deputy Commissioner of Police, shall be conducted in the following manner. Commission on the request of the Minister of National Security shall, in accordance with Section 21A of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract an appropriate local firm to conduct a recruitment process, including inviting applications for the positions. The firm shall select from the applications received the most suitable candidates. The firm shall ensure the candidates are subjected to the best practice security vetting. The firm shall submit to the Commission the results of its assessment process in the form of a shortlist, a report on the entire assessment process, and in respect of the candidates, the application, the resume, the scores, the feedback, the medical report, security report. The Commission shall then take into account all information on the candidates, thereafter establish an order of merit list, and send it to the President. So what's the difference, Madam Speaker? There's only one substantial difference, one. And that is, instead of the Director of Personal Administration contracting a firm, the Minister will ask the Commission to contract a firm. That's it. Everything else is simply stylistic or cosmetic, superfluous or redundant. So the only matter we're about today is, should it be the DPA contracting the firm or should it be the minister asking the commission to contract the firm? Using the DPA. Using the DPA. So let's see what members opposite had to say. The member for Orpooch East said the terms of reference could be watered down. That is impossible. Because if one goes to the actual document that we are all supposed to be looking at and debating, not some imaginary thing, it says the commission shall contract an appropriate local firm. It doesn't say the minister. It doesn't say the government. It says the commission shall contract an appropriate local firm. And the old order says the DPA shall contract a firm. What's the difference? the difference? In fact, this is stronger because the DPA is not a member of the Public Service Commission. Mm -hmm. So we now have a situation where instead of the DPA, a public servant, doing the contracting of the firm, it is now the Public Service Commission that has the authority to contract the firm. It's a superior alternative, <laughs> Madam Speaker. But that's not all. So how on earth could the terms of reference be watered down when it is the commission that will be doing the engagement and the contracting? So the only entity that could water down these terms of reference would be the Public Service Commission because we're now telling them to contract the firm. Number two, the firm could be identified by the minister. What? Um, uh, let me find out. <laughs> what a irrational argument. Because it's the Public Service Commissioner doing the contracting. So how could the minister, all you're doing is asking them when there's a vacancy, when the, the, the post of Commissioner of Police is vacant and there's a need to appoint a permanent Commissioner of Police, all the minister is saying is please appoint a Commissioner of Police. And they are the ones who will identify the firm. They, it is entirely up to the commission. In its absolute discretion, the only discretion it does not have is that it must be a local firm. And while that was said by the honorable member later, I am appalled that the honorable member could be so dismissive of local expertise yes. and local talent yes. and local professionals. Yes. This is some kind of self self-loathing madam speaker right. that we in this country are not good enough Hundreds of that right. all the professionals with with 10 years of gate with 10 with 
billions of dollars spent on higher education in this country yeah, on under successive, on successive administrations and billions of dollars spent otherwise that they could say there isn't a local firm in Trinidad and Tobago that has the ability to advertise, interview, evaluate, and make a recommendation. They are saying that self-hating. That is how I, exactly I term it. that. Self-hating. Exactly I condemn those statements, Madam. Yes. Yes. Condemn them. Me too. And the absurdity that a local firm could be bribed by a drug lord. Yes. So a foreign firm could not. Yes. We don't make drugs here in Trinidad and Tobago, except maybe a little marijuana in parts of Trinidad. And I don't want to call any places. But we don't make cocaine here. We don't make heroin in Trinidad and Tobago. It's made overseas. So a, a foreign firm is more likely to be corrupted by drug traffickers because they're in the environment of drug traffickers. But he is saying that if it's a local firm, they could be corrupted by drug traffickers. So a foreign firm could not. By the police service commission. Imagine that. Imagine that. Uh, the argument is absurd, Madam Speaker. It's absurd. But let's let's move on. Yes, they they are so not in influence. All the drugs come in from foreign. Eh? All the cocaine come in from foreign. All the heroin come in from foreign. But foreigners would not be corrupted. Only locals, Trinidadians, will be corrupted by drug dealers. That's that's the that's the thesis of the member for Orpuch East, and that is the dissertation of the honourable opposition opposite. That is what we've been told: that local firms will be corrupted, but foreigners will not. But let's let's move on. Let's. Mo that's why that's why he could only get a handful of votes in the recent leadership election. These spurious, specious, tenuous, vacuous arguments. What's the next one? The Public Service Commission could be mandated, could be ordered to do certain things. By who? By who? What does the order say? The order says the commission on the request, all the minister doing is asking. And this deals with a fundamental problem. Because the honorable members opposite sat down. Six years. Sat down from July 2012 when they summarily removed Iwatsky and Gibbs mm -hmm. and pretended that the two honorable gentlemen resigned. Peter Can't Peter fool Peter me with that. Peter. Halfway through the contract, <laughs> men just catch a vaps and gone. Peter so Peter and pay them for the full contract. When when the, the honorable members opposite constructively dismissed Gibbs and Iwatsky. July 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, what went on? What happened? The process was not dealt with. The director of public administration did what? Did was a firm contracted in 2012, in 2013, in 2014, in 2015, in 2016. And up to now, up to now, the director of public administration has not done what is required in this order that the director of public administration shall contract a firm. Now, how long we go wait? Until 2029? Because you see, the weakness in this order is that it was up to the DPA to decide when, how, and if a firm would be contracted. There was no timeline. But now we are, the minister will ask the commission to do the engagement so at least there's some sort of process, some kind of trigger whereby the executive could say, well, look, we have a problem in this country. We don't have a police commissioner. You are independent, you are autonomous. Will you please do what you're supposed to do and recruit a police commissioner. So there's a level of interplay and there's a level of communication. In the past, no communication. Nobody could have tell the DPA whether to, it should be done in 2012, 2013, 2014, or at all, or at all, at all. And that was what was wrong. And what is amazing is that members will come in here, sat down and did nothing, nothing for more, for, for, for three years, nothing. The, 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 the mantra of the members opposite was, oh, it's a good thing to have an acting commissioner of police. Because when a man is acting, 
he will be under pressure and he will be motivated and he'll be anxious Madam Speaker I'm sure in the distant pastor's eye when you you were an undergraduate at university you learned about theory X and theory Y and you know motivation by fear and motivation by encouragement and the old theory of motivation by fear went out in the 1970s and was replaced by motivation by encouragement but we come now in 2015 to hear them say the way to motivate a police commissioner is to make sure he never gets a permanent appointment you leave him in fear so that he'll be afraid that that you know he will he will he will strive to do better because he's in mortal fear of not being re his appointment not being renewed madam speaker and you know the hard part about it the government has no say in that you'd have seen recently that the commissioner the present acting commissioner was given another six months extension on his acting the seventh six month extension on his acting appointment since they did what they had to do in 2012 madam speaker and the government has no say in that there's a lacuna in the constitution and the commission uses the doctrine of necessity in order to appoint an acting commissioner in the absence of the completion of the recruitment process this has happened seven times already and the commission has decided to in in using the doctrine of necessity that they will use seniority as the basis to continue or to appoint a commissioner of police so that is where they have put this country since 2012 put us back 50 years where seniority and not merit is the criteria for the appointment of an acting commissioner that is what they have done that is what they have done to us madam speaker and you have to believe that the actions were deliberate from july 2012 to september 2015 nothing was done by the members opposite to accelerate the process to 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 um, assist the public service commission absolutely nothing leading to the resignation of the said professor de saran in 2014 in total frustration because the poor gentleman sitting down there waiting for something to be done two years afterwards nothing and they have the audacity to come into this house where you have a, a commissioner who is has suffered under acting appointments for the last three years a police service where you cannot have a permanent appointment to the police service uh, madam speaker and it causes all sorts of consequences and adverse repercussions throughout the service because the head is acting so you cannot have proper appointments coming up below in the first division madam speaker that is what they have done that is what they have foisted on this country and they have the brass face to come into this parliament today and complain about this and make it up, and make it up as they go along make it up as they go along but let's let's go further madam speaker the reasons for the change which firm in Trinidad and Tobago has the capability? Well, I dealt with that already. I, 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 find, I find their comments reprehensible. And they're talking local content. Yeah, talking about local content, but we must buy foreign. And can the Public Service Commission reorder the next list based on any criteria? Well, it's in English. It's in English. Let me read it for them, Madam Speaker, so that they will understand hopefully the English language what does it say it says e this is section 3 e of the order that we are debating now the Commission shall take into account all information on the candidates and thereafter establish an order of merit list that means all the Commission has to do all is required to do by law is to look at the report it has received from the firm and then it uses its own absolute discretion to establish the order of merit list so what's the difference in the past it was the DPA that would contract the firm and then the process follows now it is the minister asking the Commission to contract a firm as I said I, I am a view it's a superior alternative but let's go into the learning and let's go into the law because I think it is really necessary to look at the one of the more relevant um, 
decisions of the Privy Council with respect to this matter. And this is the case of Cooper and another versus the Director of Personal Administration. 2006 UKPC 37, Madam Speaker. And at paragraph 25, what does it say? It says, Kangaloo JA said in para 15 of his judgment that it was demonstrated by the passage in Lord Diplock's judgment, and the Diplock judgment they're referring to, Madam Speaker, is the Thomas case, 1982, AC 113. So that Kangaloo JA said in para 15 of his judgment, this is in the Court of Appeal because it went through High Court, Court of Appeal, and then it went to the Privy Council. This is in Cooper versus the DPA. At 128, that it was not correct to say that any involvement by the executive in the affairs of the police service was unconstitutional. Simple. And I want to repeat that. It is not correct to say that any involvement by the executive in the affairs of the police was unconstitutional. And, Madam Speaker, the fact of the matter is that what is going on here? What is the involvement of the executive in this process? What's the involvement of the executive in this process? The only involvement of the executive is that the minister, on observing a vacancy <coughs> for the post of commissioner or deputy commissioner, would request, not in shock, would request the Public Service Commission to engage a firm, Police Service Commission, sorry, to engage a firm to go through the process of coming up with a, a, a shortlist so that they could then establish their own order of merit list, which they sent to the parliament, which is sent to the president, which is then sent here for us to debate. Yes, could do it itself as well. So the only involvement of the executive in that whole thing is that the minister is asking the commission to start the process. And that is the tragedy that we have been faced with. It is a tragedy that we are now in 2016, more than three years after 2012, when Gibbs and Iwatsi left these shores, and up to now, the commission, that same commission, that same commission is saying to us, it is incapable of completing this process. And how long must a population wait? How long must a government wait? Because we are responsible for running this country, Madam Speaker, within the constraints of the separation of powers between the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. We, have a, we follow the Westminster model. There is a general election. Sorry. And the people vote. And the party that gets the majority is made the government and given the responsibility for running the country for a five-year period or less if the Prime Minister decides to call an early election. And we on this side have been given this responsibility. And we take our responsibilities very seriously. And if you think this government is going to sit down, and I don't want to say on what, but if you think this government is going to sit down, like them, honorable members opposite, and twiddle its thumbs, and push paper around, and engage in consultation after consultation, how many times it was? About 29, 50, 29 times, and it went to FGP twice, and four, and four times to FGP, and oh, 20 other know. times it went here, there, and everywhere. Over 50 attempts. They attempted, honorable members opposite, attempted to address this process or pretended, pretended to, to address this process over 50 times, 50 times. And at the end of it, what happened? Nothing. Zero. Election come, election gone. They went out of office without dealing with the most important aspect of security in this country, no, and that is provide permanent leadership for the police service. And they want us away. I'm going to tell them, they, with their prevarication, 
and their procrastination. You know, I, I, I have to say this. I remember Bas Pande very well. And he used to say, Koda, Woda, Shoda. And he was referring to the government before him. And he was doing things, and, in, and we would get up and say, well, we were going to do that. And he say, Koda, Woda, Shoda. So you think we're going to be Koda, Woda, Shoda like you? That is not going to happen, Madam Speaker. It is not going to happen. We have a responsibility to protect the citizens of this country. We have a constitutional mandate to, to make laws for the good order and peace and good governance of Trinidad and Tobago. That is section 53 of the Constitution. If you don't know, it is a duty of this executive to make laws for the good order, peace, and good governance of this country. And I want the others to tell me, you tell me, you show me how a request from the Minister of National Security crosses the constitutional line. How does it take away from the, public, the Police Service Commission exactly. the ability to set the criteria to determine which firm should be appointed, to set the terms of reference for this firm, to determine the timetable? How does a request, a mere request coming from the minister to the Police Service Commission Please start the process. How does that cross the separation and of powers? They could say no. They could say no. How does it cross the separation of powers, <coughs> Madam Speaker? That's what they had to tell us. Not all of this convoluted foolishness, completely irrelevant, completely missing the point, the their own misrepresentation, fear mongering as they are good at, trying to frighten people. Madam Speaker, let them drill into what we have done. As I said, a lot of the other changes are completely cosmetic and irrelevant. Why should we? In fact, I am of the view that when you dictate to the commission, as was done in the previous order, Madam Speaker, in the previous order, you telling them that they have to go in the local, regional, and international print media, you telling them that they have to have written guidelines for the assessment process and a written perspective of the police service. And as far as I am concerned, you are this previous order crossed the line. It in fact was telling the commission how to go about the recruitment process. It's tying its hands. It was tying the hands of the commission. Expensively. And we have decided to all of that done. We are simply going to ask the commission go ahead, do what you're supposed to do, and, do and recruit. A police commissioner for us, please, As you please. by okay. engaging a form of your choice, using a procedure that you will determine, using terms of reference that you will design, and using an assessment process that you will create, yeah. Madam Speaker. To me, the less you tell the commission to do, the less it infringes on the separation exactly. of powers. Yeah. And the fatal flaw in the 2009 order was the fact that it was up to the director of personal administration to decide when to initiate the process. And we see the, 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 the if I could use a word, the evil that has come out of that. The mischief. The mischief that has come out of that. That you, once you leave it up to somebody else who has no role to play in the process, the DPA has no constitutional mandate. The, the DPA is not a member of the executive. The DPA has no responsibility to get this thing done in any period of time. The DPA was not elected, had no manifesto, made no pledges to the population to contain and manage crime. Don't face the polls. Don't face the polls. So you leave it up to an individual that has no accountability to the parliament, to the people, to the executive to decide when to invoke the process to start advertising and recruiting, uh, interviewing people for the post of such an important post. And you leave it up to somebody who has no accountability, that is in no man's land, that, that reports to no one. And look at the results. You know, if you jump off a 10-story building without a parachute, I doubt you would fly. You're going to hit the ground and die. So that when you go and look back at this and we recognize that we have taken all of the actors out of it, 
and put it in the hands of a person who has no accountability, the end result was inevitable. The DPA would work at his or her pace, would make decisions in his or her, her time, would decide to do it or not do it as he or she feels, deems appropriate. That is why so much time has elapsed. How could it possibly be so hard? How could it take three years, going on four, to advertise and engage a firm just to pick one individual? Madam, is that efficiency? Is that, is that what the population wants? That you leave it in the hands of somebody and three years pass and nothing happens? While, as the Honorable Member for Chagonas West has said, when you open the, or, or was it Oripuj East in his jocular fashion, you open the papers, it's either FET, or somebody dead, or somebody dead at a FET. How could we allow such an unconscionable situation? No, it's Your 15 minutes have expired. You are entitled to avail yourself of an additional 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would not use the entire 15, but I would like an extension. The reason why I don't need 15 minutes is that the point is obvious. The honorable members opposite have not dealt with the issues at hand. They have not dealt with the facts. They have, they have not read the order. They have not analyzed the differences between the old order and the new order. They have not done any analysis of our constitution. They have not looked at the case law. They have not defined what is interference by the executive or involvement of the executive in the context of Endel Thomas versus the Attorney General or Cooper versus the Director of Public Administration. They have not studied Lord Diplock's judgment. They have not looked at the Privy Council's judgment in the cases, Madam Speaker. They have done no research. They have, done, they have not checked the facts. And therefore, it will not take me 15 minutes. As far as I am concerned, Madam Speaker, until and unless we hear cogent, sensible, and, and potent arguments from the other side dealing with the matter at hand, which is the dis difference between the 2009 order and the 2015 order, until and unless we hear from the other side an argument that makes sense, that deals with the matter at hand, we on this side will not support this motion to nullify the order. I thank you, Madam. Honorable Member for Carony Central. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The order, please. I would like to hear the contribution. The member for Digo Martin noticed talked about the fact that we have not examined the law and the Attorney General in his presentation took us through a long intricate presentation about legal matters but the Member for Shaguanas West on our side, in his presentation, Madam Speaker, took us through the legal history and evolution which led to the 2009 legislation. And he also addressed the issues that had come up under scrutiny in the courts of law that made the resolution that he had brought on behalf of the opposition relevant and pertinent and important in the debate which seeks to annul the order that has been placed before us today. So that the issue is not an issue only of law. The issue is really an issue of power 
and politicization. And I want to stress that, I want to stress that to the citizens who are operating. The parliament addresses the matter of lawmaking and bills are brought here and we make laws, yes, that is true. But that is rooted in a system in which you have an executive branch which on the basis of the law executes power and that is related to the judiciary or the judicial branch which interprets the law if matters were to come before it and on the basis of that interpretation makes decisions and that is what the separation of powers is about. You have an executive that executes, a parliament that makes the laws and treats with the lawmaking, and a judiciary which makes an interpretation of the law and then de uh, determines on the basis of the law what is right, what is wrong, what is appropriate, what is not. So the really key question for us here, Madam Speaker, is really the intro whether the introduction of the minister in a process in which ministerial office was not involved in the 2009 legislation, whether introducing it now is adding to the politicization of the process. And once you raise that question, you've got to ask the other question, whether the capacity, the ministerial capacity for intervention to trigger the process of recruitment can also facilitate two things ministerial inaction Very in order inaction. not to trigger the process for whatever reason for reasons they were water. Yeah. and more than that ministerial action in order to terminate a commissioner yeah. of police yeah. because the order is silent on that matter so if ministerial intervention can initiate the process, ministerial non-intervention can also not initiate the process. And ministerial intervention to trigger the process can also, it would seem to me, if that matter is not circumscribed in some way, begin the process of termination of an existing police commissioner. And therefore, that is where the issue of separation of powers begins to blur and begins to cross the line. And that is why it is important to scrutinize this process and to get answers for the questions that we are asking here. This is not a simple matter of law. This is not a simple matter of coming here and asking how long we go wait. This is not a matter of saying that the People's Partnership did not do anything for three years about this matter. This is also not a matter of talking about seniority and merit, and I want to deal with that a little bit because the member for Digo Martin noticed, you know, he spoke in the parliament on the appointment which came before this house in 2008, and he had a long speech and a lot of things to say, and I want to make reference to that. And I want to say that the real tragedy in this situation is not what the member for Digo Martin Northeast is talking about. The real tragedy is the fact 
that they really tried to pull one over the parliament. They got caught. And what we what is happening now is what is happening now, Madam Speaker, is that they are trying basically to browbeat us on the matter and to tell the population that we are causing a problem by bringing it to the attention of the population that they are doing something which they should not in fact be doing. So I rise to support the annulment of this motion. The first thing about these orders is the slate of hand approach, which got us to this point of debating the matter. These orders were signed as the leader of this side of the house, indicated by the president in December 15th, 2015, and up to January 4th, no related documents were laid in the parliament. And I came to a session here on January the 8th that had to do with parliamentary scrutiny. And in a conversation on the matter, I realized that this order had not been laid in parliament. I didn't know at that time that the leader of the opposition had in fact entered into inquiry with the parliament on what was happening to this matter. But up to January 8, we had not, in fact, had sight of that matter. And it was not laid in Parliament until the last sitting of the House that we had here, when we had a debate, and I think that was January 11th or something like that. And the government was very aware that you need 40 days to respond to that resolution. Because in this speech, by the member for the Gomartin Northeast, he raised that matter several times in his presentation. So they were very alert to the fact that for a negative resolution you had 40 days and the time was of the essence and things were required to be done in a certain way. But for whatever reason they chose to proceed in the way that they did and that is how we have ended up here having a debate today. So quite frankly, they tried a fast one to get the orders through. And they wanted to do that without a debate. And I think it is a tribute to the leader of the opposition and the leader of business on our side that we are debating this matter today. Now I want to say that the Police Service Commission is a creature of the Constitution. That is a fact of life. And the member for Shaguanas West indicated how that evolved from the Marlboro House discussion to become a creature of the first 1962 Constitution and was retained in the 1976 Constitution, which now governs this country. Now, the whole idea between, be, behind the constitutional provision which guards the po Police Service Commission is that you want to take that process out of the hands of the political directorate. That is the whole point of it. And when in 2009 there was consultation between government and opposition, and the uh, 2006 leading to the 2009 legislation, when that process was completed, it is Parliament that was given the opportunity, which still exists, to scrutinize the appointment of the police commissioner, again to take it out of the hands of the executive. Now, 
I think that to try to use executive order and to try to undermine the parliamentary process or to undermine constitutional intent, I don't think this is something that the government should have done. I really think it wasn't necessary. It could have been a straightforward process. We could have had a discussion about it. The issue could have been made more transparent and there would have been no need for contention. But at the end of the day, on these specific orders, even though you may go around the world and talk from 2013 and talk about the number of consultations that were held, when you ask the question on these specific orders and on this specific order which we are debating now, who did you consult with? With whom did you consult? The answer is really no one. Why, if you ask the question, why are you trying to sidestep a duly constituted, constitute, constitutionally empowered entity, such as the Police Service Commission, that would be a very, very hard question to answer. And if you ask the question, ascribing no motive, but ask the question, did you really want to manage the negative resolution process to avoid the debate? Were you really trying to do that? And if you were, it is really uncalled for in terms of the parliamentary process. And there are basic, basic question. Why do you want a minister to initiate the process? Why take it there? Understanding how sensitive this matter of the police commissioner is, and understanding how big the crime question is, understanding the complications of a small society, and understanding the constitutional provision which led to the creation of the Police Service Commission. Other members have already raised the issue of how you define a local firm. There is the issue of how do you, I mean all of us know who a national is, but for the purpose of this, who, how do you define who a national is for this purpose? What are the definitions in the bill are all the legal notices, so to speak? And I think that kind of clarity is important for us to proceed because there is a certain uncertainty now that the issue of political, uh, the, of the political factor has been added to the resolution, to the uh, motion here before the, the order before the House. Now, the issue of executive, abuse of executive authority is not something that the government would like me to raise. I know that for a fact. But it is an important matter given how things are evolving. Now, it seems to me that you came to the parliament read and ready to politicize the process. You had that on your minds. You came here red and ready to abuse the parliamentary process. You came here red and ready to abuse, abuse the constitutional process. And this is not the first time. And I'm talking only Madam in Speaker, the last Speaker, I rise on standing order 48.6. We are not here to abuse the parliament or abuse the constitution. Member. For Karen e Central, may I ask you to withdraw that statement? You can say it in another way, I'm certain. Okay. I, I, I withdraw what I said, but I would like to express the sentiments. It could not be that the members on the other side wanted to abuse the constitutional process, to violate the constitution. 
it is not, I could not believe, I cannot believe that they wanted to bypass or abuse the parliamentary process. But when I look at the pattern in terms of parliamentary committees, when I look at the flippancy with which they respond to some of the questions of the parliament, when I look at the dismissiveness with which they respond to real issues that we raise in this parliament, I have to question and to ask the government, please, as we proceed with the business of this country, to understand that in the parliamentary process, which we have identified as having a role in relation to the separation of, pro of powers, I ask the government to understand that there is a role for the opposition in the parliament of this country. There is a way that parliament is supposed to operate. And the government respect of that is important, as is the opposition's respect of the parliamentary process. So I want to leave this a little bit. I want to leave this for a while. And I want to go to the 2008 debate that had to do with the Police Service Commission at that time putting forward the selection and recommendation of then Senior Superintendent Stephen Williams as Police Commissioner. At that time, the government may not like to hear this, Honorable Speaker of the House, but at that time there was political interference. There was, there was a direct intervention by the then Prime Minister of the country. It is a matter of public record. And in the debate here, it became clear that there were political preferences at work in the, con at, in the confirmation debate for that particular com commissioner of police. At that time, there was in a sense, a problem of executive authority. At that time, you might say, the Police Service Commission was undermined in the parliament because when its recommendation came here, there were many spurious arguments advanced by members of this house at the time. but. Importantly, for the, from the member from Diego Martin Northeast, who argued the case against confirmation of the then recommendation of the Police Service Commission. And At that time, I'm looking for his contribution, Madam Speaker. Please bear with me. At that time, he made a long presentation. And he argued that there was a flaw in the process. And he talked about an obvious error that had appeared on the order paper. He talked about the fact, and that's how I raised the issue of the negative resolution, the order which was laid in Parliament but subject to negative resolution and therefore was not debated 
has some issues in it which in my opinion creates indicate what you're referring to please i am referring to the contribution in hansard of the member for Diego Martin Northeast on the 4th of July, Friday, 2008. And in that he argued the case for a flaw in the process. And he basically argued for seniority because he listed all the people in the police service that were senior to the then superintendent. And he went on to point out very strongly that the government had no hand in the proposal of that recommendation and this was done very independently by the Police Service Commission and that there was an arm's length relationship between the Police Service Commission and the government. I hope you understand the point I am making. Yeah. And He went on, of course, to argue against the confirmation of the, of the now acting police, commission. police commissioner. And he also <laughs> chose the opportunity. I had written an article at, a t at the time in The Guardian in which I said that the manner in which the government had dealt with this in the parliament resulted in their presenting no case. They had a lot of talk and they ended up wounding the institution that was the Police Service Commission. And for that he attacked me in the parliament at that time. He also member by the honorable member or the member the for Digo Martin Northeast. Thank you. I thought I had done that um, on several occasions mentioning that I would speak to his issue. But I I am guided, Madam Speaker. And on that basis, he argued the case against confirmation. He then went on because Mr. Um, Kenneth Lala, who had been the public service head, uh, sorry, the police service head before, had also written an article, not necessarily sharing my view, but expressing an, another view, indicating that the manner in which things were proceeding were really undermining the Police Service Commission. And more than that, that in fact, by the process of legislation, the Police Service Commission had been undermined in terms of its powers from the 1962 case to the situation that they found themselves in 2008. Now, I am not bringing these old arguments up just to make a point for the sake of a point. I am bringing these arguments up to say, to really make the point that under the old system, the system had been politicized. And that in the parliamentary process, the government actually did not take seriously the recommendation of the Police Service Commission that had gone through the entire process. It had took, taken fully 10 months, I believe, and had not, in fact, honored that process in a way that was acceptable 
to the population. And therefore, when we come to raise the issue of politicization of the process of selection of the commissioner of police, it is not without a history. And this is a very, very important thing. This is a very important thing for the country. And if you have a situation where there is doubt about whether the process is fair and open and transparent, and you have doubt about whether there can be political interference, if you have doubt in the population about whether the process is controlled by the political directorate, if you have doubt in the population that the outcome has been predetermined, then you are dealing with a situation that is very troubling for democracy in the country. And I want to lay that squarely at the feet of this parliament in support of this motion by the leader of business on the opposition side. It is a very important motion. We have, some of us, explained the tortuous route it took to get here, which led to the resolution. And I am raising the issue of the clouds, of the doubts, of the opportunities for politicization, of the opportunities for, for control of the outcome. And I think that this is something that is serious in the country. Now, we have a situation in this country where this is seen as expeditious handling of a, an important matter, a matter that is a priority. But there are other important matters, and we are not seeing any expeditious handling of that. I mean, we have an economic challenge before us, our country, and a lot of things have been said that which, which has created a lot of doubt and uncertainty in the country. We have a national security situation in terms of crime and the murders in which obviously we have a major challenge on our hands. And while this is one measure to address that, the point remains that this situation needs to be contained. It's a matter of great urgency. We have a major energy challenge on our hands emanating first of all uh, in, from the price of energy resources worldwide. And this is a matter of some urgency that requires action on different fronts. And we are not seeing urgency in these areas. We have this situation of the police commissioner's appointment and the process to make that appointment possible. And I want to say that I agree with the government. It is an urgent matter, and we should deal with it expeditiously. But we should also do it properly. And that is what I am insisting on. That is what this side is insisting on in this country. On this occasion, that is what we are insisting on. Now. The issues have been raised about politicization. The issues have been raised about the process that has been followed to get us to this point where we are actually debating a resolution to negative the order. And other issues have been raised which have to do with, you might say, the smallness of our country the relationship among entities in this country that are almost sometimes invisible. The fact that you have problems in the police service that are real challenges. We know it from having been there. We know that it is a matter that you have to deal with as challenges as well. Because 
in this country, you know. Yes. Your 30 minutes have expired. You are entitled to an additional 15 minutes. I would like to continue, Madam. Please continue. Chair. And the issue of the police commissioner is so important precisely because of the problems that we have in the police service itself. Now, there, are nothing, there, are, there is nothing in the order which really addresses what are the results that a police commissioner will deliver to the country. And I think that that is an important thing. I know that there are things which explain the job specifications. I know that there are things that identify objectives. I know that there's a 2014 to 16 plan with four major heads that are being pursued. I don't know if that is continuing to be pursued. And I know that there are objectives to be achieved. I know that there are problems that we need to solve and resolve. The murder rate, obviously, the detection rate, uh, the ability to win the cases once we get them in court, all of these things, which come ultimately in the system that we have under the jurisdiction of the Commissioner of Police and in collaboration with a number of institutions that support the police service. And we have had real problems in the police service. Now I'm going to say something that will perhaps make some members of the House uncomfortable. But if we are going to deal with this matter of crime in the country, and if we are going to deal with the issue of the police commissioner as a professional, non-political entity, and if we're going to gain control of the crime situation in this country, we have to be alert to certain things in the country. We had a situation in this country in which a very senior officer in the police service of this country at the level of deputy commissioner was actually seriously alleged to have been involved in a major kidnapping incident in this country. And that matter was whistling through the country. The entire police service knew about it. People on the street knew about it, but nothing was ever done about it. The, we also had a situation in which a senior superintendent in charge of crime eventually murdered in the country, on the eastern part of the country, was in fact alleged to have been a major person wow. involved wow. Wow. in yes. crime in this country. So the, these things happen before our time. They happen before our time. And I want to say that in this kind of scenario where you have a situation what is the standing order madam speaker i rise on a question of standing order 48 madam speaker this is members 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 please honorable member if you are ri rising on a matter of reason that it's out of order, could you kindly point out with some specific reference? I should do so, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I need your guidance. I need your guidance if you would, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, oh, Madam Speaker, I crave your guidance. Honorable Member for Lavin Till West. I crave your guidance. Uh, members, could you, members, could you kindly, please, allow me to conduct the business of this house. 
Honorable Member, an interruption is allowed on a point of order, but one has to state with specific reference the point and the order you're referring to so that I can rule. 48.2, Madam Speaker. And 48.2 refers to a matter which is sub judicial. Yes, indeed. And, uh, uh, Honorable Member, I will have to rule against you that there's any matter that has been referenced here that is sub judicial. I have not indicated what the matter was. But, Member, it would have to arise out of what the, the Honorable Member said. Honorable Members, I rule that it is not sub judicial. So far, what the member has said. Continue. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I will not pursue this matter. The only point that I'm making is that the issue of the commissioner, the jurisdiction of the commissioner, the lack of politicization of the role of the commissioner is very, very important in the context of the evolution of development of the police system in this country. Just as in politics you are not dealing with all purity, just as in business you are not dealing with all purity, just as in any profession in this country you are not dealing with all purity, in the police service you are not dealing with all purity either. And I say that with the deep understanding that there are large numbers of people in the police service who would like to see a clean, fearless, independent police service that has the power to clean up the place. And that is why it is more important than ever that we guard the process by which this is done. Look, I can tell you stories in the case of the state of emergency in this country that you would not believe. Yes. Don't be, don't be distracted. Please direct your presentation to the speaker. I am, I, I am guided. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Don't, don't cover all those nonsense. Madam, Order, please. Yeah, Madam Speaker, thank you for your protection. I, underst I, I understand the disarray in which the members on the opposite side find themselves at this time. They come here with a bogus strategy to achieve a limited objective. They have been found out, and now they've got to deal with this reality. But I want to say, the issue of national, I will tell you when I re I'm ready. The, the, the issue of national security, and I think the leader of business on the opposition side said it well when he says that the main duty of a government is in fact to provide human security. And the, it is really an important duty. And the, I, I understand the complexities. A government is elected, and the demands from the population is that the government deliver. And if there is crime in the country, the government has the duty and responsibility, and the Minister of National Security in particular, to manage that process. But that does not mean, because there is a relationship between the political directorate and the citizenry, that the institutions in between are not to be guarded and secured. And this is the point that we are making on this side. We are making the point for democracy. We are making the point for transparency. We, 
we are making the point for accountability. We are making the point for separation of powers. We are making the point for independent institutions of the state. And ultimately, we are making the point that the citizens of this country are protected more if these things that I just mentioned, transparency, accountability, democracy, independent institutions, separation of powers are jealously guarded. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for St. Augustine. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what a wonderful country this is to stand here in this parliament, first of all, to have heard the clarity of delivery of the member for Shaguanas West to be followed by once again the eloquence of San Fernando West. It was as if one witnessed the making love to the English language. And then of course, <laughs> then of course, the very frank delivery of the member for Oropooch East and then to be slammed with the insult, intelligence, and, and common sense of a member of the Martin West then to the professorial discourse. <laughs> Northeast, I beg your pardon. I shan't interfere with the Prime Minister. Um, to the professorial discourse by the member for Kearney Central. <laughs> Both sides are professing rightness on this matter. But I ask this simple test. If what the members of the government are saying is correct, if they are right, why is it that the independent institution called the Police Service Commission, not just its present chairman, but its past chairman, are raising not just red flags, but certainly speaking publicly about the process used to bring what is before this parliament? <laughs> You know, I think we need clarity here, more than ever. Because you know, the member for Dago Martin Northeast appeared to make a lot of sense. But selective reading is a very dangerous thing that we all learned as in day one in law school. And if not before, in common entrance class, yeah. selective reading. <laughs> you see, he sort of so simplified the issue that the only change before this honorable house and the consequence of this country is really removing the need for the DPA to make the call to trigger the process to one where it is triggered by the Minister of National Security. What he failed to tell this honorable house and this nation is that there was a process under the old form, gentlemen, yeah, there was an old form under the, the, the process that exists until this becomes law, if at all it should, in the true sense. And I will take a few moments just to read what they are, because it is my humble submission that this new process that is being in, in, instituted or attempted to be instituted for the sake of pragmatism and for the sake of quickness guts out those very, very important oversights <coughs> that the Independent Police Service Commission must have in the process to select a commissioner of police. Madam Speaker, if I may be permitted, and I'm once again, I have to put on record the gratitude I think we must all feel to your staff here in the Parliament for the information brief. We have done it on our own, but certainly to have seen the clarity with which this document has been um, put before us in terms of you know, the, the, the tabular fashion so one can in a moment see the fundamental changes that have come, not just calling on the commission by the National Security Minister as distinct from the DPA, which my friend from Diego Martin Nortis wishes us to believe. The process says under the old law, the DPA shall, in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, 
contract a firm experience in conducting assessments of senior police managers to conduct an assessment process, and the firm so contracted here and after, referred to as the firm, shall consult with the commission upon the completion of each stage of the process. The new process, the commission on the request of the Minister of National Security, in accordance with section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract an appropriate local firm, here and after referred to as a firm, to conduct a recruitment process, including inviting applications for the positions. Fundamental difference here is that the commission is not entitled step by step, step by step to have oversight of this firm. So whether one wants to suggest that locals are inappropriate, or whether it even is a foreign firm, the big difference is that the commission on that, if you'll permit me to say the old law and the new possibility, had a step-by-step -step control and oversight of everything this firm did. And I shall go further. At 3B, old law, the firm shall advertise each vacancy for a period to be determined by the commission of not less than seven days utilizing one, effective information communication technology, and two, local, regional, and international print media. That has been completely removed. So basically, once a job is given to this firm, hands off. They could do what they want in quiet, in silence, and certainly in darkness. That is a dangerous thing. That oversight has been removed in the new possibility. 3C, an applicant shall apply in the form specified by the firm and shall submit to the firm his application accompanied by his biography or his resume, references and the number to be determined by the firm, with current contact information of each referee. This is very important, you see. Any other relevant information that which a firm thinks appropriate completely deleted from the new possibility. The PSC has no idea of this process, who the referees might be. And I will come now to the conclusion very shortly, if you permit me. We go further. 3D. The firm shall indicate in every advertisement where the following may be found. Written guidelines, and it goes through. That, too, has been deleted. But we come down now. <coughs> to 3H, the firm shall submit to the commission the results of its assessment process in the form of a short list of the candidates. That, of course, is retained in the new possibility. But how would the commission know, first of all, <coughs> if there was any real advertisement? They shield it from that. Why is that taken from the commission? They do it themselves. You want to speak again? Yes, yes. if you give it. Not at all. Oh, you just offer. Yes. <laughs> you must understand rhetoric. Yes. <laughs> so that what we have at the end of the new possibility is a shortlist that comes out of the dark. Here you are. And as a teenager, I we were discussing this. So listen, if you want at the end of a selection process to choose a red puppy. Right, whatever you do, you want to get a red puppy. You just put four red puppy on the list. Mm -hmm. So that if you pull one at the end of it, this short list, and you see this is a danger, and forgive the skepticism, but I will tell you in a few moments why I'm very skeptical, and the rest of the society looks on with a great deal of alarm of what is happening in this nation, in terms of the constitutional abuses that we've seen in the past, and the fear of it recurring into the future. Madam, ma Madam, could we have a, I'm hearing some prattling from that corner. Um, could we have a little bit of silence? We have have some order, please. There is a standing order that relates to interruptions. And therefore, if a member wishes to interrupt, could he interrupt in accordance with the standing order? Please proceed. Thank you so much, my lady. So we are on the point of the shortlist that the PSC has had no oversight from the moment they said take this job to when it's handed to them, what went in that. And then goes further. 
where there are reports handed over to the PSC under the old law. And then at three, the commission shall conduct its own assessment of not more than the five, here is one, eh? not more than the five highest graded candidates of the shortlist. That will no longer exist in the new possibility. So they could give you a shortlist of two, two red puppies. And you know, th these are real concerns. And that is why when the member for Karani Central spoke about institutional strengthening and the independence of institutions, we must appreciate that whatever we do, whatever you, you may have the noblest of intent here today, you may. But when we do things, it must be the subject of long scrutiny and long practice. And with a sense, always looking into the history of where we were and where we wish to be. This new possibility goes against the grain of all jurisprudential leanings, which is transparency, accountability, and all those fa fancy but important terms used. Because we are in a new democracy. The old age must be behind us, where there's political interference in almost everything. And we have stood here in this parliament, debating many different things, constitutional amendment, with great uproar on both sides for what they wish to have. But what is always very important is that the country at the end of the day must feel confident that whatever we do, and in particular something as serious as the fight against crime, is left unadulterated, untouched by suspicion. Because the next commissioner of police must be one that the entire country believes and has confidence in that is not a political stooge. He must have the moral authority beyond reproach that he was not put there to do a job at the behest of any political um, governance. And for those who may not remember, it was not that long ago, but it is sometimes you know, easy to forget the very painful and distasteful occurrences where there has been actual interference with the police in the control and in the prosecutions slash persecutions of persons in this country. It is vivid in my mind today that in the year 2000, there was a rush of allegations of voter padding that a political party was changing votes, registration from one district into another. And this country was riveted on the daily news front page most times of persons arrested for voter padding. Do you know what happened then? When murder was at a very high, but not certainly as high as it is now, then the homicide division of Trinidad and Tobago Police Service was taken off their routine of investigating murders and put to investigate voter padding cases. Where is the evidence of that? I, was in the, I was a lawyer for most, and I'll tell you why. Sure. There was a terror that was unleashed on the society for many persons who may have, for one reason or the other, changed their residency, which for many of us, that's a big word, I'm, I'm very sorry. Madam Speaker, 48-1, relevant. Wow. Honorable Member, I'll allow you to continue. I give I you thank you so much. It could not be more relevant in terms of what the people believe. The long and short of this thing was that the allegation having been made we saw many persons prosecuted throughout the length and breadth of this country, paraded in handcuffs before the courts. And you know what? At the end of it, there was one successful prosecution for a young lady and her mother, from I think it was from Laventil West, who moved their vote, for whatever reason, to Barataria in the year 2000. Yes, it was. <laughs> The re all the others, and there weren't all that many, but the country was led to believe that there was this huge tsunami of voter padding, at the end of which all cases have been dismissed. 
persecution. I will tell you. Yours. The long and short of this thing is that the country believed, whether it is real or unreal, that at that point in time, <coughs> there was the use of the police by a political party to effect their ends. That is not the end of the story. For those who do not remember, around that time, uh, of course, I make no mention to my friend from Toko Sangri Grande, a lady of the highest quality. But I want to say this, Madam Speaker. Of course. Yes. May I also say this? In and around the period of the 2000s, the Minister of Government, Sadiq Bach, <coughs> He was then in opposition, former minister. Two. I remember the day, and I give him the story because it is real and it is as vivid today as it was then. Very relevant, very re as relevant as it could possibly get. Early one morning, Madam Speaker, I received a phone call from someone I knew, <coughs> person of of noted creditworthy, creditworthiness and believability. And I was told, listen, there is a plot to set up Sadiq Bakch with guns, sorry, with cocaine and mortars put into his water tank. I was, of course, taken by shock that early morning. Huh? I couldn't believe it. But because of the, 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 the sense of urgency <coughs> that a messenger had, and the certainty of the information that he conveyed to me. I said, let's not risk this thing. I also, from that conversation, received from that informant, I'll use that term, <coughs> that there was a squad of police, senior police officers from Port of Spain on the way to San Fernando that morning. I immediately called for Sadiq. He was out of the country. I was able to, he called me from Canada, learning that I was looking for him and told him of the plot. He said, protect my family. I then, as a lawyer, member for Love Until West, called San Fernando police and told them of what my information was. Raced down to Sadiq's home. And we got there at the same time that the police from San Fernando got there. I was almost joking and telling them, listen, this is the information I don't know. Go check it. Guess what? That information turned out to be real. Now, if the information that the former minister, and I think it was party organizer for the UNC, yeah, yeah, was going to be set up, I remember for San Fernando West, was going to be set up with cocaine, kilograms of this thing, and mortars, and that it was a set up by mem and including members of the police. I cringe to say it. But the other part of the information is that they were coming down to raid him, his family, his property, and if they had got there before and found it, then Mr. Batch, his wife and children, would have been the victims of prosecution. But because of timing, we were able to get there beforehand to avoid it. Listen, we don't have to look far, but I look to my left. The member for Carney East. Once again, busy as I was, received the call that they lock up them. Handcuff this man, a man who had the highest reputation in his field. Paraded him through the streets to the court. In handcuffs, eh? After spending on toll, I shan't say. Eric Williams and Frankie can too. Yes. Exactly. So there is real danger, so thanks for accepting that. I've allowed you some latitude, but I would like you to tie in while we might be very entertained with the real stories. I would really like you to tie it to the relevance of this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I do not intend to be entertaining. I intend to be 
I intend to be enlightening of the past history and therefore the skepticism that we have in relation to the choice of police commissioner and the control over police commissioner. At the end of the prosecution, it turned out that the member for Karani East was charged under an offense unknown to the law. And I could go on. I could tell you about Dan Rad Singh. I could tell you what happened at administration building, the police administration building, where he was offered a deal. We, are not, we have not yet written up. I was the lawyer. We have not yet written up the charges. If you should say to the public that Mr. Baste Pandey, the prime minister, was a very corrupt man, that he was the bag man collecting money on his behalf, they would not prosecute him for murder. That went on after he gave it. It was a constitutional motion before the High Court. So this is the sordid history we have. So as we proceed forward, and I knew this is a new dispensation, and we had great expectations for great things. But I want to tell the present Prime Minister that when he campaigned and shortly thereafter, he grew a reputation for being a straight talking man. I also want to warn that straight talk must never be followed by crooked walk. You must talk and do things. And I have had cause to reflect with some level of consternation as to what we've already seen. My friend from La Hoqueta, Talparo, now controls the post cabinet. Many have said this is a silencing of the democracy. You have no access to your ministers to ask them questions. That's one thing. You've heard, of course, others mention about the removal of a central bank governor under very questionable circumstances. And therefore, the constitution itself is endangered. We have a police service commission that was created to insulate against the very thing that we are talking about here today. What we are doing, if we should allow this to go forward, is really to subvert the very powers of the Police Service Commission. And for what purpose? To what end? Why is it? And the big question is, why do you want to do this in this manner? So that they will be presented with a shortlist that they have no control over the process as how you arrive at it. And then out of that very short, there's a two red puppy or the three red puppy or the four red puppy. Choose one and send it off to His Excellency. That is where we are. And as I speak to many people in the society, they're very worried about this. I think it is <coughs> quite right, because I do not like, to tell you the honest truth, to assume the worst intent on things. But when I see what is happening here, the unnecessary efforts to do this, because the first question that any common sense person will ask you then, well, listen, why do we need a firm? to advertise or to do these things. Why couldn't the PSC itself, member for Princess Town, why couldn't they just put out an ad in the newspapers, put it out on their website, or put it out wherever, and short circuit this unknown entity, a local entity, and we know this is a small country, neither too large nor too small, but just small enough that everybody knows everybody else, with the CTB, and we've heard of things happening there, so I, I don't want to cast aspersions on institutions. But when we do this, it raises those questions that will indeed cast aspersions on the institution of the PSC because they have now truly become, if we allow this to go far, the new possibility, nothing other than a rubber stamp for a firm, an unknown, anonymous firm, the processes of which we have no clue. It's as simple as that, you know, Madam Speaker so that we could regale each other on and on about who is right, who is wrong. But at the end of the day, we must ensure that the citizens feel confident that whatever we here decide at the end, that they will get a commissioner of police who is alert to his duty, a person who has the utmost integrity, who is impartial and does his work without fear or favor across the board. You see, still fresh in our minds, even now coming out of five years of government, there was a simple investigation that was put before the police service. They called the heart investigation. To this day, the country, and I want to tell you one thing about the government of the People's Partnership. 
we never cross a line no in trying to influence one thing or the other in relation to prosecution. To this day, which you voted for, sir, which you voted for. Yes. Thank you so much, my lady. Yeah. We could talk section 34 a thousand times over. They voted us out. You are in and you want to create your own 34 under this number. But, Adam, I was making the, uh, Madam Speaker, I apologize. I was making the point that they called the investigation after these years. Still, simple inquiry. No response. No closure. A sitting prime minister. Serious allegations of the worst kind of uh, conspiracy to murder. And to do all sorts of hideous things. Email. We forgot about that. That investigation, everybody else has included except the police. We went into an election. 48-6. Which one? In terms of, I, I don't rule that there's any breach of disorder. I, I make it clear, whenever I speak, Madam Speaker, I do not ever intend to, to, to hurt or harm. What I always intend to do is to, to, to speak what I know, yeah, to the best of my ability. So, so the point being that why is it that we have these quote-unquote inefficiencies? in relation to some political investigations. And then you have a speedy resolve of others. They can't wait to do it. They just can't wait to do it. And, and you see, that is why, Madam Speaker, that we today must be very, very cautious as we proceed. I don't know if my friends realize it, but the accolades they came in on in September have evaporated. There is now, I want to say this, a fear and anxiety gripping this nation at all fronts, not just in crime, in terms of the murders. And I want to congratulate the present acting commissioner of police for the work he and his men have done in dramatically reducing crime according to the statistics over the last five years. Serious crimes. Murders, of course, as we say, unacceptable. And they just seem to be getting worse, bloodier, more brazen, more regular. And there's that serious fear factor now that we have the ability to, because there's so many CT, CCTVs that the former government ordered and, and, and installed and then people in their homes and in their businesses. So you actually seen live killings. What an anomaly, live killings. But that's, that's the world we live in today. So there's that fear. But there's the other fear, the economic gloom and doom that we all feel waiting for the other shoe to drop being warned on the one hand, threatened on the other, the oil price slipping. So therefore, what we have is who we are. And if we don't look after who we are, we're in big trouble because as the member for Kearney Central hit on a most significant point, but the country is not yet waking up to appreciate. When things get tough in a society, when incomes drop, you know what happens first? When the fear and anxiety rivets the nation, you look to blame someone or something. This is not the first country that has gone through this. And I do not wish, as some have accused me of, of fear mongering. But what happened in post First World War Germany? The economy went into ruins. Unemployment shot through the roof. Men and women were made beggars. A once proud nation. Out of that anguish, rose a leader of darkness. And what he did to inspire his people is to create a common foe, which was the Jews. And I've given you some latitude, yes. but I really, in terms of relevance, yes. I would like you to tie your contribution Absolutely. to the motion before the Absolutely, the lady, I'm most grateful. I'll show you the relevance of the thing. That the requirement not for law and order to be, and the institutions to be respected, could not have been higher. Because, and if it be this indulgence,
But I am seeing across the board fingers pointing who to blame, who to blame. Per personality, no, no, all sides, all sides. Yeah. Personalities have been identified, who to blame. Communities are being identified. And forgive me, I, I mean no disrespect, but I'm hearing about the Syrian community, big business, uh, SIS, you name it. Names are being called and then put into the public space in an era of high anxiety. Therefore, the need for law enforcement and respect for those who have that duty is the highest now. And that is the point I wanted to make. So that, Madam Speaker, I do not wish to burn you any further except to say that unfortunately, maybe with the best of intent, they have failed miserably in this effort because they have now gone against the winds of change, against the grain of modern thinking of transparency, accountability, and openness in the process of a most important choice for an office holder. And therefore, I, for one, cannot support it. I am very grateful to you, my lady. Member for La Hoketa, Talfaro. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I had not intended to um, contribute to this bill, this motion, but given that I have been invited by several members that on the other side, I decided to make a small con contribution. Madam Speaker, the mem mem my friend from Orpus East did mention that I announced this in the post-cabinet press conference. Now, that announcement was made on December 10th. And it has taken a long time for us to get to this bill. Now, I understand my friend's predicament. Because when I made the announcement on December the 10th, he was busy looking for ballots on the banks of a river in Pinal. You see, it was just after the, um, their party's internal election, and everybody was playing police to find ballots and to account for the surprising victory of the member for Separia. So I could understand their predicament. Now, I also understand the difficulty of my friends opposite over the choice of a re recruitment firm. Now, my friend from Oporpuch East said that he doesn't know any firms that can do the, the job that we have um, put in this bill for them. Now, I know, having um, perused their tenure in government over the, five years, the past five years, that they aren't very acquainted with recruitment firms. So that when you had... No. When you had things like the appointment of Rash Rashmi Ramnarayan to a, a, a state police agency, a senior position, and they, they did not understand the recruitment process. Now, it's not the same process as is envisaged in this bill, but it certainly didn't... It certainly didn't contemplate that you get a phone call, and he appoint the most junior person. And we saw that throughout the administration. So I can understand their fear that with this bill, something like that could happen. But we aren't the UNC, we aren't the People's Partnership, and we have brought these amendments with the assumption that we have a decent government in place. The, if you examine, a lot has been said about the independence of the police, the independence of the Police Service Commission. I want to remind my friend from St. Augustine who just spoke and give us se several anecdotes about what transpired under previous administration. I just want to give him one story about what happened under the last administration. Now, we had an incident of 
a grass-like substance being found allegedly, plant-like substance being found allegedly at the, at, at, the, at the home of the then Prime Minister. I don't know who set up who, and I don't know whether people threatened or promised to rush back from New York to Trinidad. What I do know is that all the policemen who were doing that investigation suddenly had their league leaves bought out, bought out. I also know that senior police officials have been suspended as a result of that investigation. I also know that the then Minister of National Security has gone on affidavit as to what transpired over that incident. So it is highly hypocritical of the members of the, on the other side to talk about the independence of the police and how by bringing this amendment to the motion that we in somehow intend to make the, um, to interfere with independence of the police. Madam Speaker, over the last five years, the Police Association has been complaining about the political interference in the police service by the decision of the government of the day to buy out police officers leave. So that if you are conducting critical investigation and you want to um, influence, all you needed to do was to curry favor the police, police, the investigation officer, offer to buy out his leave, to sell him on a course, to, to do whatever they did. But over the last five years, we had several instances of that which brought the police independence seriously into disrepute. So that when they come here and talk about the independence of the police and the police service commission, they seem to forget that it was under their tenure that the chairman of the police service commission limited office resigned suddenly as a result of the failure of the then government to do anything about this bill. And we didn't just suddenly uh, pong this on the population as we are being led to believe. Over the last year as we campaigned, it was made clear that one of the things that this PNM administration intended to do was to amend the regulations to ensure that a national would be appointed the police commissioner in Trinidad and Tobago. And having been elected to office, we quickly took steps to put that into the legislation, and that is why we are here today. It was not a thief in the night. It was a promise, and a promise kept. Madam Speaker, I didn't want to go, go on long, but when I listen to the members opposite, I have to wonder whether they are truly interested in getting an efficient police service. They had five years to fix this. They never tried. Every, every six months, there was no embarrassment by the fact that you have a police commissioner coming um, back again and again. They had a, a constitutional majority. We on this side, even back then, were always willing to support the appointment of a police commissioner, any process that would lead to a quick appointment. 
the, the then opposition leader went on record offering his assistance in getting this done, and it was never done. So this leads me to only one conclusion. They, for whatever reason, do not want the appointment of a police commissioner. They do not want uh, a secure commissioner who can assist in the um, treating with the issue of crime. And they know that the insecurity that goes with the job of an acting commissioner cannot be to the benefit of the incumbent or any other officer seeking to combat the, um, the serious crime problem. So, Madam Speaker, with those few words, I thank you. I just felt the need to put some perspective based on the co comments I was hearing from the other side. Thank you. Honorable Member for Oropooch West. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister for La Hokita Talparo, he spoke this afternoon with such fluff and made such vacuous and inane statements that it reminded me, Madam Speaker, that when I sat in your tutorial sessions and we did not answer what your, your ladyship, Madam Speaker, would have expected, <laughs> Madam Speaker, is that you would pull your glasses to your nose and look at us. And I saw a similar look this afternoon when the <laughs> Minister of Atal Paru was speaking. <laughs> Leave me out of the debate. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is the supreme law of the land. It guides us of how laws are to be made and the process of changing these laws. Madam Speaker, this debate may be both irrelevant and insult to the Constitution, since the relevant section of the Constitution was not taken into account by this 2015 selection order, contrary to what the government want people to believe. Madam Speaker, the arrangement for selecting a commission of police is not simply a matter of mere change of process to get the best qualified local persons. Madam Speaker, it's, it's what we call an existential matter for the state of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, sir. Madam Speaker, the use of a foreign firm in the 2009 selection order was not trivial. It was animated and was based on well-founded understanding of our history and fear of local corruption in the whole process. Madam Speaker, when Trinidad and Tobago came into independence, we felt that the promotion of nationalism was its purpose. However, Madam Speaker, there were questions even before that in 1958, when the PNM had lost the federal elections, Dr. Winston Mahabir, Minister of the Health, walked into Woodford Square. While the opposition was being described as hostile. This is, Madam Speaker, a backdrop of what I am going to deal with in this election process. And I said, Madam Speaker, this opposition is not really hostile to any national purpose promoting national interest or the welfare of every citizen's country. Yesterday, Madam Speaker, the chairman of the Police Service Commission expressed horror at the actions of this government with respect to this matter, which I will speak later on. Madam Speaker, we share a culture that is common with the Caribbean. We share a culture 
that is common with Haiti and other Caribbean countries. And Madam Speaker, the selection of a commissioner of a police is, as I said before, existential for the citizens of this country and the state and the wider region. Madam Speaker, the former president of Mexico, Lopez Portillo, selected as a police chief of Mexico City, his boyhood friend, Arturo Durazo, who had been the driver, Madam Speaker, and the bodyguard of the capital's most notorious gangster. The Mexican police, as then and as now, they gouge the public mercilessly. And then we know about the third recent recapture of El Chapo Guzman. He is a billionaire, um, a Mexican billionaire drug trafficker. Madam Speaker, I am saying all this in light to the backdrop of how are we to select a police commissioner. And what we look at, Madam Speaker, even in Trinidad and Tobago, we are yet to tell the country about who invented this email gate comments that we had. Madam Speaker. Well, I, I have allowed you some latitude. Oh, sure, certainly. But I would certainly ask you to be guided by the standing order with respect to relevance and tie what you've said into the bill that is being, the motion that is before this house. Speaker, I'll be guided. Mm -hmm. Yes. Madam Speaker, we know that some governments, Madam Speaker, and some are really some fronts for criminal enterprises. We know of those things. We say that people with money buy governments and sometimes they buy also commission of police. We can never be too careful in what we do to save ourselves from men for loss of powers and so, Madam Speaker. And it is really a warning to, for us to select the just and righteous person for a high office. Madam Speaker, when we go into the details, and I will not go into the details as why this government wants to trivialize this matter by looking at it just as a simple selection process. Removal of the foreign firms, Madam Speaker, may seem patriotic, even nationalistic, but we live in a real world. Madam Speaker, why do we still need a police service commission when we look at the process of how this government, the, the order paper that they have placed before us, they are going perhaps to select a commission of police according perhaps to their political desire. The chairman of the police service commission, Madam Speaker, Dr. Maria Therese Gomes, was quoted in Newsday, Monday, January 18th, 2016, and I quote, Madam Speaker, the PSC needs to be consulted, and there has been no consultation. Madam Speaker, this is disconcerting and disrespectful in light of the constitutional role that has to be played by the Police Service Commission, and I continue or the quotation by the PS, the chairman of the PSC. She continued and said, as well as the need for teamwork and combined expertise yeah. Yeah. in reforming this process. Madam Speaker, I check again in the budget by the Honorable Minister of Finance and we really have counted the words consultation was used 20 times. And I went on further and I saw the word review was used 21 times. Madam Speaker, an important matter of this nature, the PSC was never consulted. The, the, chairman, the chairman is burdened by section 123 of our constitution which has not been repealed. 
And Madam Speaker, this is a country not like Zimbabwe or Ghana under Nkrumah, when a Chief Justice, Madam Speaker, was fired because he did not make the judgment. M Madam Speaker, we can have order without, uh, order without law, but that is a condition that we describe it as being a fascist state, the condition where you have total control by an executive. We have a constitution for a reason, Madam Speaker. We have to obey it in every detail until we change it. And until that is done, the public must know that the PSC chairman was signaling the unfolding threat to the rule of law the removal of foreign inputs, perhaps, um, Madam Speaker, makes it imperative that we focus on local. The, this question of the jury, Madam Speaker, is an action consistent with the Constitution. It becomes burdensome and more imperative, Madam Speaker, when sometimes it, you could, it is realized that party partisan intentions mm -hmm could decide which firm and which person are to be given the task of scrutinizing candidates for two important posts. Madam Speaker, how are these persons to be chosen given the nature of influence peddling? Or in the recent statements of the Honorable Prime Minister, and I quote him from the Sunday, January 17th, Express editorial, Rowley Golden Rule versus morality in public affairs. That's a quotation. And I didn't say it, it was from the editorial of the Express. And I continue, so far from mounting any moral high horse, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Rowley has more or less admitted to have done more the same himself. I'm continue, which I'm talking about the peddling and the interference. Madam Speaker, we will continue, and as I say, the Express editorial said that, and we, as we look at the speeches or the contributions made by the other side, we are seeing that some of us really are sleepwalking into a new paradigm of softly, softly spoken words with no content. Madam Speaker, We have several reports which was done by different persons in this country. We have reports done by John Laguerre, Professor John Laguerre, Professor Selwyn Ryan, and they all produce reports who can, which can assist the government in how they can move ahead and be guided into the selection in a transparent way of these um, persons to these two positions. Madam Speaker, the role of the Public Service Commission is really to scrutinize every matter this government may think is the executive preserve to donate jobs as poor relief or food bank payback. Madam Speaker, in 2009 selection order, which was done before, they did not include the role of the PSC. The PSC retained the right to know every detail on every aspect of the process of selection. The PSC was never left out. It discussed everything with the recruiting process. This unconstitutional 2015 selection order now excludes the PSC from the invitation to applicants or having anything to, to, to do with what applicants may be told by the firm. Madam Speaker, when we look at the selection of the firm, the firm, we do not know what is the prerequisite for that particular firm. The firm can decide who to ask to apply. And this may be, Madam Speaker, a flagrant recipe for nepotism. Madam Speaker, we live in a republic and it is governed by a constitution. And when we look at the way this order was done, it was no transparency. And if we look at Lord Diplock, um, 
we look at Lord Diplock in Thomas versus the AG, I, I quote, I quote, the whole purpose of chapter eight of the Constitution bears the rubric. I quote, the public service is to insulate members of the civil service. The teaching service and um, police service. Would the member give way? I'd like to, I'd just like to ask a question, please. Would you give way? Sorry. No, I, uh, no, you're not giving me. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I, can I just ask what page of you're on? Of I would, chapter judgment. eight, it's chapter eight of them. The pub, we, oh, I'll get it for you, I'll, I'll sort of send, forward it to you. The public service is to insulate members of the civil service, the teaching service, and the police service. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker, just for clarity, judgments don't have chapters, hmm? paragraphs. Um, if you're referring to a source, you would need to cite the source properly. And the question being asked is what paragraph or what page of the judgment? Judge. Members, what, maybe have some order, was, please. Yes, ma'am. It was indeed the Court of Appeal, but I would get the, the reference, Madam Speaker, and forward it. No, but I, 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 please, member, I will not permit you to refer to a reference unless you can particularly cite the reference. Remember, this is a debate, yeah, sure. and other members may want to respond. And therefore, you will have to descend to some sort of specific reference, please. I'll move on, please, Madam Speaker. The Constitution, Madam Speaker, has not been overthrown in this country. The, this government has no authority, Madam Speaker, to shackle the country with a process devoted to produce the exclusion of the Police Service Commission. The 2015 selection order, Madam Speaker, is perhaps similar I, to the Prime Minister's order recently where he asked working women to learn to peel cassava. <laughs> Madam Speaker, really it yeah. symbolizes yeah. A, mind, a mind blind to the meaning of section 123 of the Constitution. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we must face reality. We must feel, we must, we must face reality, Madam Speaker, and the truth. And when we look at the selection process, Order 2015, Madam Speaker, it reminds us of George Orwell's animal farm where the hero was Napoleon, the head pig. He controlled the police. He decided who must drink milk or eat. It's always so, Madam Speaker, when politicians think that the purpose is of the police is to protect and serve party leaders. Madam Speaker, we need at this time to hear a different story. We need to know how this government is going to deal with this process how the Madam people see Madam Speaker, to review I stand on stand in order 4410. Uh, uh, in terms of the point of order, I rule that the member could continue with respect to her references. Please limit your references and also cite your references. But more importantly, member, I have cautioned on relevance um, before, and I would wish you to really stick to the standing order with respect to relevance, and also to remind that the speaker has power if you continue to be irrelevant to ask you to discontinue your presentation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm just almost to wrap up, please, Madam Speaker. Um, I am asking, we are now looking at the review process. We are saying how this firm is to be selected. And I'm saying that we need to hear another story from the government. And that is how 
I am now saying what we need to do to assist in this process. We, we are asking how the people are to be selected to, to review applicants in this particular firm. We, we ask who is this local firm, Madam Speaker? What is the criteria used to select the persons and what is this firm? Is it the firm a subsidiary? Is it an international company? We, we, do, we do not know, Madam Speaker. Some order, please. Member for Orpooch West. I caution you for the final time that your contribution mm -hmm. is amounting to tedious repetition. And therefore, if you persist, I will really have to invoke the standing order and ask you to discontinue. Sure. Madam Speaker, as I wrap up, I am saying that this order lacks merit. It is dangerous. It allows a local firm to decide without the PSC input or reference to veto or to decide on anything. The PSC is excluded from shortlisting applicants. We do not know the whole process, Madam Speaker. And we are saying this order is a veneer. Madam Speaker, I am saying as, we cl as I close that we need to have more transparency and we have to comply with the supremacy of the Constitution. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is with great pleasure that I have the privilege to rise to briefly contribute to this debate tonight with one single purpose, and that purpose is to bring us back on track, to bring us back to a level of sanity of debate and also relevance. Madam Speaker, it is our duty, respectfully, as parliamentarians, not to mislead the members of public, not to mislead the members of public as to what it is before this House for debate here today. Having said that, Madam Speaker, I would like to start by saying that there is no unconstitutionality whatsoever in the order that is before us, which I, if I may call it the selection process order for Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner, Legal Notice 218 of 215. We have heard a lot of contribution here tonight about and surrounding the selection of a firm, Madam Speaker. And the simple question to the other side and to those who may wish to continue the contributions is what is different with respect to the selection of a firm between, between the 2009 order and the current law of 2015. The only difference with the firm is that now it is stipulated it be a local firm, Madam Speaker. The second point, and the point when it comes to constitutionality and all of this discourse about the shackling of the hands, the minds, and the powers of the Police Service Commission is a completely fallacious argument. There is absolutely no merit in that whatsoever. Madam Speaker, it is actually arguable that the prior order, that is the 2009 order, fringed on the breaching of constitutionality as it said at 3A, three, three the 2009 order, the Director of Personal Administration shall, in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central, Central Tenders Board Act, contract a firm experience in conducting. So it was the DPA who, under the previous order, was mandated in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board to contract a firm. It was not even the Police Service Commission. In the present instance, and in the order brought by this government, Madam Speaker, it is now 
the police service commission who is being mandated to contract a firm. So they are being put in charge of their own process. They are being put in charge of the process of contracting a firm and obviously one would expect that the police service commission would contract a firm with the proper and the appropriate qualifications for such a process. All of the suggestions with respect to the contracting of a firm are misdirected at the government because it is the, public, the police service commission that is contracting the firm, not the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So for those on the other side to stand here for six hours now and to try and mislead the public of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, we take great umbrage to that. Not on our behalf, but on behalf of those that we represent and every right-thinking citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. Stop misleading the public. It is the Police Service Commission that will be contracting the firm. So we would expect the Police Service Commission to fulfill its constitutional mandate and to do so in a proper manner and to contract a firm that will carry out its duties. Madam Speaker, I was distressed here this afternoon into the night to hear suggestions by those on the other side of the process being manipulated by the underworld. And I call upon them, if it is that they have connections or knowledge of the underworld trying to manipulate any legal process in Trinidad and Tobago, to take it immediately to the authorities. This government, standing on this side, is not encouraging and will not encourage any underworld activity in Trinidad and Tobago. The Commission on the... Rec Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 15.5, I beg to move that the House continue to sit until the conclusion of the business before it. Honorable members, the question is that the House continue to sit until the conclusion of the business before it. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Continue, Honorable Member, for Portis being known. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like, through you, to let the public know that the only the only interaction that the executive has in this whole selection process, and it is worthy of repeating because we've been misled here for hours today, the only interaction and participation in this whole selection process by the executive, that is the government of Trinidad and Tobago, is the proverbial pulling of the trigger by the Minister of National Security where he requests that the Police Service Commission do its job. There is no other interaction in the process by the executive. So it is extremely misleading to suggest that the government and this government is attempting to influence the selection of a commissioner of police in any underhand manner whatsoever. The commissioner, the, the, com the, the commissioner of police has not, there has been no... Honorable member for Karani, Honorable member for Karani Central, please. I answer questions that are asked which are sensible questions, Karen. Oh. I shall not, I shall not waste my time, Karen yes, Central, yes, answering yes, irrelevant yes, questions. Member, honorable member, Madam please speaker, direct your contribution to the speaker, please. Madam Speaker, again, it comes back to this simple premise. The only interaction and participation by the executive is when the Minister of National Security requests that the Police Service Commission commence a much simplified process. That is the simple and only interaction by the executive in the selection of a commissioner of police. And that can only arise 
with the greatest of respect, Madam Speaker, on the occasion where there is not a commissioner of police or a deputy of commissioner of police in office. It cannot arise legally in any other situation, and to suggest otherwise is once again unnecessarily misleading. So then after we've crossed that hurdle, which is the only interaction by the executive, and we look at the process that we now, I, I respectfully submit, Madam Speaker, is a much simplified process. We respectfully submit, Madam Speaker, that the simplified process takes nothing away from the prior selection process order. In fact, the PCS and the firm have the same powers they did before in selecting, assessing, and deciding the criteria of assessment of a commissioner of police. And to suggest otherwise is again very misleading. Is it that, listening to the contributions from the other side, Madam Speaker, is it that there is a mistrust on their part with respect to the Police Service Commission? Because there is certainly no mistrust on our part with respect to the Police Service Commission. When one does a comparative analysis between the preceding order and the current law, which is the order as per 2015, one sees when you come down to 3E, that the commission shall then take into account after the assessment process done by the firm, and the firm is still required under 3D to submit to the commission, Madam Speaker, the re one, the results of its assessment process in the form of a short list of candidates, two, a report on its assessment of the entire assessment process, and three, in respect of the candidates referred to, the following documents, the application of the candidate, the biography or resume of the candidate, the assessor's scores, the assessor's feedback, medical examination report, and a security and professional vetting report. So Madam Speaker, in other words, what the process expressly re requires the firm to do is provide the, public the police service commission, sorry Madam Speaker, with the results and the scorecards utilized in its assessment process. The Police Service Commission shall then take into account all information on the candidates, and it does not expressly hamper the Police Service Commission, Madam Speaker, from doing its own homework on the candidates. And any information that the Police Service Commission finds that is of concern to it it is allowed to adopt that into the process. One does not have to express every single ingredient of reasonableness that will be carried out in a process. We, Madam Speaker, expect the Police Service Commission to do its job in accordance with the normal tenets of public law. Follow natural justice, follow proper procedures, follow fairness, and follow what the Constitution stipulates they must do, as per the Cooper case that was referred to earlier. The power in appointing the Commissioner of Police lies in, section, in the Constitution with the Police Service Commission. And I repeat, at the risk of being accused of tedious repetition, Madam Speaker, that the executive plays an extremely limited role in this election process. The only, the only injection by the executive and participation in this process is the Minister of National Security requesting that the Police Service Commission commence the process. And how could that ever be unconstitutional, Madam Speaker? So lest the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago had any fear or any apprehension by listening to those on the other side here today, that this was a process that was be being created to cherry pick anyone, disperse and dispense those fears immediately because this government does not intend to interfere in the process. What we're looking to do is fix a current problem which exists for the last three and a half years and for the last three and a half years when we were not in government but we were in opposition and nothing was done by the former government to ensure that there was a permanent commissioner of police. So in keeping with the promise of the Honorable Prime Minister, 
and this government, we moved very quickly on coming into office to simplify the process that to simplify the process of the appointment of a commissioner and deputy commissioner of police, Madam Speaker. And quite frankly, there is nothing that sh can be argued to be wrong with that process. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there is a desire on the part of this government to govern the country properly and to find solutions to problems that exist, to rebuild our society, Madam Speaker, and to move us towards a first world status. As I said before, Madam Speaker, a lot of fuss has been made here today about the selection of the firm. And in conclusion, I say one, we have in no way whatsoever restrict, restricted, hampered, or to use the language that came from the other side, albeit mispronounced, shackled the Police Service Commission. In fact, what we have done is provided them with a much simpler process, Madam Speaker. There can be no argument about the choice of a local firm, Madam Speaker. The candidates must be nationals of Trinidad and Tobago. I have heard it suggested here tonight that we have not defined who is a national of Trinidad and Tobago. As is pointed out, that will come in the second order. But the simple point I was going to make, Madam Speaker, is how could there be any disparity or any uncertainty, any lack of clarity as to who is a national of Trinidad and Tobago, especially for current purposes. So Madam Speaker, in closing, I would like to thank yourself, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and the members of this house for the opportunity to allow me to rise and hopefully to clarify and to bring some sense to the debate that there is no interference taking place on behalf of the executive in the selection process. We are attempting to find a solution to ensure that this country gets a commissioner of police, a permanently appointed commissioner of police. And that task is completely mandated and in the hands of the Police Service Commission, working along with an appropriate professional firm in locating and finding a national of Trinidad and Tobago who will serve Trinidad and Tobago as a commissioner of police. With those few words, Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Naparima. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I rise and I stand representing the 15,000 loyal, hardworking citizens of the constituency of Naparima. And they have advised that, that we support the view that legal notice number 218 uh, brought by the honorable member for Shagonas West be annulled. In rising, we wish to state categorically, categorically that we support the appointment of a chief commissioner of police with the utmost dispatch. We do support. We understand the challenges with crime we, we, the, the Minister of National Security is a person who we feel um, has the credibility to deal with the problem, but he needs the support of a permanent uh, Commissioner of Police. We also have no objections to the view that the Commissioner of Police should be local. We have no problems with that. In fact, it was under their watch that they created a system and a procedure that led to the appointment of a foreign commissioner of police and a deputy commissioner of police. And in fact, as I'm advised, uh, uh, denied a local, uh, a qualified local. Please don't be misled. We're talking about the selection order. This is the one that yes. we're talking about. There's no qualification. So please be relevant to the motion. Okay, we support the use of the local firm for selecting, for selecting the Commissioner of Police. We say all this, in the, uh, but we will not support the, uh, the, a unilateral approach in the appointment of the Commissioner of Police. We believe that the, it ought to be done in consultation with the opposition, the Police Service Commission and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
we do not support a process which relegates the police service commission to, to being largely a postbox function to ratify decisions taken by the executive. And thirdly, we do not support the pro a process for selected a commissioner of police, which reduces the qualifications of the commissioner of police or acts in a manner that is ultra virus the Constitution. And the reason why we say that is we believe fundamentally that we are dealing with a broader issue of the, of, of the separation of powers. We, 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 we understand that in the separation of powers, you have the legislature, which makes laws, and that's why we're here looking at this legislation and reviewing it. The executive, they carry out and implement a, a, a policy and the judiciary is responsible for making decisions with respect to the legality of the actions of the executive. I come from a media background, and we include in our discourse in the protection of our democracy the concept of the, the fourth estate, which is supposed to provide information to the citizenry, and we are doing that here today via the media, in four decisions so that they can make information, so that they can make informed decisions. Now, in, in looking at this election process and the qualifications, we have to understand what, were the th what was the thinking by the framers of our constitution about the role and function of the Police Service Commission. And if you look at the independence uh, uh, constitution in, in, in 1962, we see that it, it brought into, uh, it established the Police Service Commission, which was chaired, the chairman and, and four members of which were appointed by the Governor General, acting on the advice of the Prime Minister. So in the, initially, the, the, the Public Service Commission, the Police Service Commission, was brought in as, a, 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 as, a, as, a, as an institution to protect the process and keep the executive at, arm, at an arm's length relationship. The safeguards for the independent commissions in the, in, the, in the independence constitution. Credit has to go to Mr. Lionel Sukaran and to Mr. Tajmul Hussein, who insisted and said that this was their gift to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We find it a little surprising that the grandson of Lionel Sukaran and the member of parliament, the honorable member for San Fernando West, will be part of, of in, in our view, a process which we see as weakening the power of the Police Service Commission. I'll say why subsequently. You see, you see, our Republican Constitution went further to insulate the Police Service Commission from the long reach of the executive. Members of the, of the Service Commission were appointed by the President after consultation with the Prime Minister and leader of the opposition. Now we are told that by the member for Digo Martin Northeast that we have been discussing this matter for years and there has been no action and he made reference to, he made reference to uh, a report of the strategic subcommittee of the multi-sector review team dated 12th of June and, and which they had representation from the, from the opposition. It, uh, June 12th, the 12th of June, the 2012. It recommended, it recommended inter alia that the selection process for the offices of Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police should be changed to give the Police Service Commission the jurisdiction to select and appoint persons to those two offices. And in other words, it was speaking to the empowerment of the constitutional established institution that carry out its functions uh, to appoint a commissioner of police. And this would eliminate, that report said, and I'm quoting, the report said this would eliminate the roles currently played by the office of the DPA and the firm and simplify the procedure. 
So the question we are asking is if they had gone into the consultation that was necessary to develop the legal notice, they would have understood that discussions had taken place and the discussions had pointed to the empowerment of the Police Service Commission. And they cannot come here, they cannot come here and tell us that oh, the only difference is that um, they have replaced the Director of Personal Administration uh, with the, uh, the Commission on the request of the Minister of National Security shall in accordance with uh, 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act contract an appropriate local firm to conduct a recruitment process including inviting applications for the, for the. It is not only the change of a firm, they have fettered fettered in this notice, they have fettered the, the, the Police Service Commission by developing a process and telling them that they need to hire a firm and telling them the process. For example, under 3E, the firm shall select from applicants receive the most suitable candidates for the assessment process. In other words, whereas in, um, uh, section 123 of the Constitution, which I understand is still the guiding legislation in Trinidad, section 123, uh, it says the Police Service Commission shall have the power to appoint, and I quote from the Constitution, persons to hold or act in the office of commissioner and deputy commissioner of police. It does not say that they have to be advised by a firm, and the executive cannot develop a process that limits the, 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 what the Constitution tells us is the purview and remit of the Police Service Commission. This points us to the, to, 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 to the point, and, and, and we could look at this as the, the creeping overreach of the executive in the governance of Trinidad and Tobago. A creeping, a creeping overreach where you look at, and if you look at them singly, you can, you can perhaps dismiss it. But if you look at it in its overall context, you can see that there is a, a, there is a tendency to, to, to not act consistent with the principles of separation of powers. I know you're going to, uh, but this is relevant because it speaks to an attitude um, on, on, that, on that side. We are concerned about the overreach of the executive. Oversight, we see it in other instances which we could ignore the oversight committees being chaired by cabinet uh, ministers sworn to the principle of cabinet collective responsibility. And a foreigner has to come here and take up our foreign exchange to tell us what we already do, that if you want to have oversight, it is better not to have control and to fetter parliament in that regard. We have had instances where, where for example, <laughs> you know, you increase the, the, the borrowing ceiling and you do not tell us why in Parliament. And that speaks also to the, to the process of hiring this commissioner, where the Parliament is being put into a straitjacket and not being given the freedom to carry out its constitutional mandated responsibility. We could speak also of the, uh, of, of the firing of the, the governor of the Central Bank, which in addition speaks to that overreach. And in a previous incarnation, a speaker was placed under house arrest Madam through... Madam, 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 oh, sorry. Member, in terms of relevance, I'd like you to withdraw that and continue with your contribution, please. Our concern, our concern in terms of the selection of the police commissioner is not without uh, uh, a history uh, and, and personal experiences. It is important it is important that the commissioner be selected in a transparent, open process that we can all abide by, whoever it turns up. We have, we have, and, and a, a bit of reference was made to it, where, where it, and I'll speak about I myself, being subject to a police search in respect of offices 
in, uh, uh, in, in Chaguanas years ago re 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 uh, regarding voter padding. Police knocked on the door of the office and they came looking for, in, in an intimidatory way, looking at, 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 at the question of voter padding and we understand that no one was charged. Uh, no one was convicted. They were charged but, but not convicted. Just a couple months ago, it, there was a five-hour search of our campaign head, head office in Chase Village on the eve of the last September general elections. That, so, it, it, in, in a sense, five hours, that has to do with our concern about the, the independence of the police and the independence of the leadership of that institution. We had the Sadiq Bash affair. We had the Sadiq Bash affair Madam, when cocaine in the stand. Madam Speaker, I rise on standing order 48-1. Member? 48-1. 48-1. Yeah. And that's with respect to relevance. Yes, ma'am. And, and, member, I've cautioned you before. Apart from that, I think some of the matters you're raising have already been ventilated by members on this side. I am cautioning members about tedious repetition. Continue, Honorable Member, for now, We are We are going to ask the question, for example, about the process of selecting and we are of the view we are of the view that yeah we are of the view and we call on this we call on to to on to, to understand that the process all we are asking for is a process that is transparent and a process that recognizes the fact that it is important to all of us citizens that, that we have something that, that we could abide with. In terms of the, we asked the question about the qualifications from a, uh, from a university. Madam Speaker, that is not before us. Mm -hmm. Honorable Member for Naparima, there is one motion that is before the House, and this is the selection process. Okay, we say all we wish to say is that many of us, many of us are prepared to defend with our lives the rights and privileges afforded us by the Constitution. We know that the Constitution, the rights assured therein, may be our last bulwark against any government which wishes to write roughshod over our democracy. We understand that this is not their country, it belongs to all of us, and we will defend our. Our, our rights and the system that will lead to a transparent process for, the, for, for identifying a commissioner of police. We call on them to honor their pledge to uphold the constitution and the law and, and not in any way undermine our institutions and our democracy, a key element of which are our independent service commissions. I think the population owes a debt of gratitude to this opposition, this leader of the opposition, this alternative government, this government in waiting, led by our, our, by our leader, who will rescue our country from the investigation of crime and the vacuity, vacuity of ideas on that side. I thank you. Honorable Member for Point Forte. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I stand today to speak on a motion that I believe is extremely important to the peaceful citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I stand here to give my support to this government courageous initiative to make right an untenable situation that has been left in abeyance for far too long, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I speak about the appointment selection process for the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners of Police. I want to thank Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the members before me, in particular, the member for Digo Martin Northeast, for doing an intense comparison of the motion, the Attorney General, for the legal and implications and the processes. Madam Speaker, when I look at the amendment, it is but a simple amendment from the previous version. And it simply states that the commission and request of the Minister of National Security shall in accordance with section 20A1C 
the Central Tenders Board Act contract an appropriate local firm, herein after referred to as a firm, to conduct the recruitment process, including inviting application for the position. A very simple amendment, Madam Speaker. And I, and I can't understand why the members on the other side are having so much indifference about this statement. And as peers as do, Madam Speaker, to use a Shakespearean firm, the ice is not itself but by reflection. As appears as though they are seeing ghosts, they are seeing nefarious activities behind the statement. And I wonder why, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, this motion is much more about the legal processes and so on. This motion is about leadership and governance in the police service, Madam Speaker. As you are no doubt aware, Madam Speaker, the position of Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police are the new class of leadership of the Toronto Bigger Police Service. The Commissioner of Police is the highest ranking officer. He is at the pinnacle of the organization. He is the ultimate leader. He is a hippie among constables. In some jurisdictions, in the UK, is referred as the Chief Constable, Madam Speaker. So when one understands the importance of that leadership, understand what that does to the organization, then you must understand the urgency and the importance of the leader of the Commissioner of Police in the process selection process in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is both a civil and paramilitary organization, which functions in accordance with the Police Service Act Chapter 1501 of the Laws of Trinidad and Tobago. And the TTPS is charged the maintenance of law and order the prevention and detection of crime and the prosecution of offenders. Madam Speaker, the Police Service Commission in July 2012 appointed Mr. Stephen Williams, Deputy Commissioner of Police at the time, as the Acting Police Commissioner with effect from the 7th of August 2012. What is important, Madam Speaker, is that that very same appointment, and I quote, the Police Service Commission says, in this regard, the Commission has today instructed the Director of Personal Administration to invoke the provision of Legal Order Number 102 to ensure that the officers of the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of Police are filled permanently in the earliest possible time. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I repeat, the earliest possible time. Madam Speaker, it is now three years and five months since that statement of the Police Service Commission was made. And to date, the definition of the earliest possible time and the importance of this matter appears to be a, have had no significance on this past administration, Madam Speaker. Right. The present acting commissioner has now in his seventh, six month extension in an acting position as a head of an important institution as the Toronto and Vigo Police Service, Madam Speaker. This situation, Madam Speaker, is untenable, unbearable, and shows a lack of political will or an outright lack of care and concern for the peaceful existence of the people of Trinidad and Tobago by that former administration, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Gisha Kaulesa, writing in the Trinidad Guardian dated 30th of June 2015, stated, and I quote, it is reported that there are concerns among the first division officers regarding the length of time it was taken to recruit and appoint a substantive commissioner of police. One senior officer said it was a demoralizing and insulting to the organization. Unquote. The news day of today's date in an article written by Andrew Bargo on page 18, the president of the Social Welfare Association said, Madam Speaker, and permit me to quote, the need for a commissioner of police to be appointed has overriding importance if we want to be serious about improving national security and public safety. The police is suffering too much. We must all adopt a mature approach, Madam Speaker. That, Madam Speaker, is instructive. And a sense of the importance of adopting this procedure, the Police Welfare and Social Organ Association is in support of the measure, Madam Speaker. I can quote from the newspaper clipping, Madam Speaker. Permit me the quote from the paper, Newsday, page 18, dated Wednesday, the 20th of January, 2016, Madam Speaker. President of the Police Social Welfare Association, Inspector Anand Ramasas, is quoted as saying, he said, 
He had no problem with the pro's requirement that the recruitment firm be hired by the PSC to oversee the recruitment be limited to local firms, Madam Speaker. This is the Social Welfare Association, Madam Speaker. So they are agreeing with the proposal here, Madam Speaker, because they understand the importance, they understand the significance of appointing a police commissioner in today's security environment, Madam Speaker. Let us remind ourselves, Madam Speaker, that the TBS is a paramilitary organization. And like all other such organizations, as the military, for instance, at the core, at the very foundation, are the twin philosophy of leadership and governance. Madam Speaker, in the military and paramilitary institution, such as the Tron Tobago Police Service, the Tron Tobago Defense Force, the Tron Tobago Fire Service, Tron Tobago Prison Service, some members bear arms on behalf of the state and at times are expected to make the ultimate sacrifice in the performance of the duties. In fact, many lives have been lost in the performance of duties in some of these institutions, Madam Speaker. The leader in these institutions, the leader in the institution must be able to provide an environment in which the moral of the subordinates are high. We have heard the voices of the senior officers with respect to the morals, the moral of the officers and men in the Toronto Bay Police Service. Madam Speaker, in the military, theorists such as Sun Tzu, Confucius, General Patton, General Montgomery, they have all declared, all declared, Madam Speaker, that moral is a fuel that drives the individual to be on the call of duty. And what we have seen over the last five years, over the last three years, Madam Speaker, is a demoralization of the persons that are trying to a police service. There's no incentive, there's no motivation to go beyond the call of duty because of the absence of a legitimate leader, Madam Speaker. And this is what this government is trying to put right, Madam Speaker. This is what this government is trying to fix. This is the problem. This is the remedy. This is what we are trying to fix at this point in time. It is to put right what has been wrong over the last three years and five months, Madam Speaker. So it's against this background that it is fundamental to the very existence of these institutions that are very hierarchical in nature, that strong and sustainable leadership be executed from the top echelon. The leadership of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, like any military organization, must be provided with the proper instru instruments of legitimate authority, Madam Speaker. Because a leader of this most important institution must never be subjected to the vagaries of political decisions, but must be a substantive office holder to execute the, the business of policing effectively and efficiently, without having to wonder whether or not, at the end of every six months, whether you're going to get the contract or not. <laughs> it leaves a, a sort of state of disrepair in this institution. One can remember how former commissioner of police, James Phil Button, two weeks, was given two weeks' notice because he was in an acting position, Madam Speaker. Two weeks' notice to the Met Office and humiliated publicly after a man have served for more than 40 something years in Trinidad and Tobago as a dedicated and patriot citizen in Trinidad and Tobago he was humiliated and literally hung out of office. Why? Because he was in a six month contract. Speaker. See? And therefore, Madam Speaker, it is important for these institutions to have this legitimate authority, Madam Speaker. It is generally accepted that our police service suffers from security of tenure at the leadership level. The leadership of the police service has been in a state of instability for the past five years. Despite having a special majority in parliament, the past regime made absolutely no effort, no effort whatsoever to improve the system. Yet they come here today to negative the attempt by this responsible government to make it right, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Police Commissioner must keep his organization strong, he must dedicate to its task and communicate with the public under very demanding and stressful situations. The Police Commissioner and his deputies must set the tone for the officers, especially in leadership position. But without security of tenure at the top, how can there be meaningful governance and improvement? How can there be, Madam Speaker? It filters down throughout the organization. The sense of insecurity filters down. I've mentioned before, the moral, the fuel that drives people to go beyond the call of duty is non-existent, Madam Speaker. 
And so the Ministry of National Security has a critical responsibility in setting the policy framework and the strategic agenda for the administration and operation of the police service. And so it is in this context the role of the Ministry of National Security must inevi inevitably involve policy directions in relation to the government's responsibility to the, pub to the public for the strategic le leadership and governance of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. But it must be based on a police commissioner who is legitimately there to receive the kind of instruction, the kind of directions that is required to, to effectively and efficiently deal with the situation in today's security environment, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is known to all that the incidence of crime and violence and disorder in society today is one in which we are treating with. But for us to treat with the incidence of crime and security, we must have that willingness, we must have that sense of security, we must have that sense of authority to treat with it, Madam Speaker. And no doubt, no doubt, if we have to keep over our heads that at any point in time our security could be taken away from us, it creates a vacuum, Madam Speaker. And so it is important for us in treating with the motion before us to understand is not merely in terms of the legal terms and processes and so on, which we have explored tremendously throughout this debate. It is about leadership, it is about governance. And those are the important salient factors for me as Minister, Minister of National Security that I see that is warranted as a matter of urgency to assist in treating with the issues of crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, reform efforts have already been produced in terms of strategic perspective for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. However, a new phase of reform calls for development of good police governance in accordance with government's policy. What we seek to build is a modern driven and proactive police service with a leader that has the commensurate authority that is practical and motivated to meet the service's annual benchmarks and surpass them. Such a police service would be manifested by the following personal and organizational features. A police service that is accountable to the public for its action. A police service that operates within the framework of the law and international police and standards. A police service committed to the promotion of high standards of moral and ethical conduct. A police service whose policing priorities and strategies are based on the needs and demands of local communities. Madam Speaker. A police service with a comprehensive, structured, and disciplined approach to the management of financial, technical, and operational resources. Madam Speaker, all of these I mentioned could only take place if the police service is structured with strong leadership and strong governance. And that can only be possible, and I repeat it, could only be possible if we go through the processes as, as placed here by, the, by this government to ensure that we have a police commissioner who has the legitimate authority to execute this action, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, it is not today or yesterday or even just prior to September last year that we have been calling for changes to be made to the, to the way that we choose our Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police. This is not just yesterday. The records will show that as far back as July 2nd, 2010, the Member of Parliament for Digo Martin West, the then opposi opposition leader and now the Honourable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, spoke out vehemently against the shortcoming of these constitutional orders that are now the subject of this debate, and which were the basis to a large extent for the selection of Mr. Dr. Dwayne Gibbs and Mr. Iwaski. We recognize, Madam Speaker, that the processes used to select a commissioner and his deputies are indeed cumbersome, protracted and of course, incurs great expenditure. As recent as yesterday, in one of the daily newspapers, a former chairman of the Police Service Commission has reiterated the need to amend the orders, which, is, which he termed as convoluted, Madam Speaker. Convoluted, and as a former chairman. We have listened, and we have taken note of the many calls for change, Madam Speaker. This government is about keeping its promises, as indicated in our manifesto. One of the first matters of hand we address is, in fact, and we talk about it, this year of the Acting Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police. Madam Speaker, we keep our promises, Madam Speaker.
Madam Speaker, in 2006, when the Constitution was amended to give the Commissioner of Police the complete powers to manage the police service, it was never contemplated that the holder of that office in the police service would be exercising such a critical power in an environment of uncertainty that exists today, Madam Speaker. It was never contemplated that we would exercise that amount of power in an area, in an environment of uncertainty. This, Madam Speaker, is what we are striving to correct, that the police commissioner would exercise the powers granted to him by virtue of the Constitution in an environment that is stable so that he can execute it effectively and efficiently, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, while we recognize that there are times when an acting appointment is necessary in order to facilitate sometimes the efficient running of the workplace. We do recognize the potential pitfalls associated with such long-term arrangement. And I can just list a few, Madam Speaker, with your permission. There's a perception that holders of acting appointments are not given the respect that is afforded to substantive holders. There's a perception that holders of acting appointments do not make the decisions that could have far-reaching consequences because of fear factor. They do not make long-term decisions, Madam Speaker, because of security of tenure. Madam Speaker, there's already the perception that acting appointments, particularly over a long period of time, give the impression that management does not care, either for the person or for the organization. And finally, Madam Speaker, there's also the perception that our regional and international partners may see us as not being serious mm. in dealing with us, in giving us information, or treating us in the area of crime and security, Madam Speaker. It's a very untenable situation. I want to make it abundantly clear, Madam Speaker, that we are not here to talk about the performance of any specific individual. We're here to talk about the benefits and the importance of changing what exists today to better be able to select a commissioner of police that has the legitimate authority, Madam Speaker. This is what we are about today. One that lead, that will execute good governance and good leadership for the benefit of the security and the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. We are here today to fix that problem. We are here to fix that, Madam Speaker. We are here to put in place what is constitutionally required to ensure that the best possible candidate from Trinidad and Tobago, whether living here or abroad, is chosen to lead the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, Madam Speaker. That is why we are here today, Madam Speaker. So therefore, Madam Speaker, let me say that today we live in a world of interdependence, one in which no entity can choose to the many things that confront us. And therefore, we expect a responsible opposition we expect an opposition that understands the security climate that we exist in today. And therefore, don't look for things that do not exist. Don't look for a simple process that is put forward to you and come to this house without taking full consideration that we are treated with the security of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. We're treating the issues that are pertinent to all of us, every single citizen of this country. And everyone has a role to play in children's issues. Let us not be showstoppers. Let us understand the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that every citizen of this country has a role to play in the security of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, let me see. As we go forward, as we go forward with this motion, we have to once again lift the moral of the members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, by extension, the entire national security apparatus. Because because they work in proximity, one affects the other. If moral is low in one side, it's low on the other. So we take a holistic approach. Let us ensure that the apparatus of the Ministry of National Security, the moral is lifted by ensuring that we put in place a legitimate <coughs> individual commission of police. Madam Speaker, we want, one only has to look at what happened at the Defense Force quite recently. And I bring that just to show by a matter of comparison. The last administration, we talk about moral, the last administration, in their wisdom or probably lack of wisdom, 
extended the, the service of a former chief of defense staff past his, past his retirement age. Past his retire compulsory retirement age. You know what I did to the defense force, Madam Speaker? The moral of the senior officers, those who had legitimate expectation for moving to the next higher rank, went down, Madam Speaker. The defense force, the best stand of defense of this country. Interference. Interference with the structure of the defense force, Madam Speaker. In fact, yes. In fact. Past your retirement age. At one stage, you say you're not buying out people leave yet. You buy people. You buy leave at the other person right now, and then you extend them past beyond the compulsory retirement age. So that those who had legitimate expectation had to go without reaching to the point of of, the, of chief of defence staff. Madam Speaker, I may get emotional because I am. When you see the interference that took place in one of the contributors of security in this country, Madam Speaker. And yet you come here to tell us. Yeah, let you come here to tell us. You're interfering with the governance and leadership of institutions that have the responsibility for security of this country, Madam Speaker. Mm -hmm. This government is here to fix that. Yes. This government is here to fix that, Madam Speaker. And we said we're going to fix it in the shortest possible time because we understand the need. We understand the urgency. We understand the importance. We understand the importance. Security in and Tobago is a framework, it's a bedrock, like this. everything else takes place, Madam Speaker. If we don't take care of the security, nothing else takes place in Trinidad and Tobago. Because this government understands the importance. Hence the reason we said in our campaign, and we said in our leader that the questions dealing with the Commissioner Poland, Deputy Commissioner Poland, is something that we'll address very urgently. Promise. And we've kept our promise. We've kept our promise. We've kept our promise. And so, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, in closing, may I say, Madam Speaker, that as the Minister of National Security, I urge members on the other side to get beyond, behind, beyond the politicizing of crime, get beyond the partisan approach. Because crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago is everybody's business. Understand the big picture. Be mature in your approach. And let us treat with this as we ought to be as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Princess Town. Madam Speaker, I rise to contribute in support of the annulment of these two legal notices. But I will first deal with the first legal notice, 218. Madam Speaker, today is a watershed day in the history of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. It is, an, it is a day when we in the opposition stand in this honorable house in support and more importantly in defense of the rights of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the constitution of our republic. Madam Speaker, the speaker before me, the member for point 14, the honorable minister of national security, spent a lot of time speaking about leadership and governance in the police service. Madam Speaker, this is a minister who is on record as saying in this honorable house that despite having 29 murders recorded in the first month in this year, that there's no spike in the murder rate. Madam Speaker, when you want to speak about leadership and good governance in the police service, you must first start with a minister with responsibility for the police service. And Madam Speaker, Time and time again, we continue to see from the members opposite, senior cabinet ministers, senior government ministers, failing to provide that same leadership that they ask for, that same leadership that they speak about in the police service. And Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister spoke about when we were in government, meaning the People's Partnership. 
And Madam Speaker, he spoke about having the political will to do what is right and ensuring that the police service is equipped with the tools that are necessary to get the job done. And Madam Speaker, may I remind the Honorable M Minister and the Honorable Member for Point Fortin that it was members of his own government, the member for Digo Martin West and the member for Digo Martin Northeast, who stood in this very parliament and voted against very important pieces of legislation that could have changed the landscape of this country. And Madam Speaker, I make particular reference to the hanging bill, where they refused, when in opposition, to give their support to serious pieces of legislation that could have ensured that several persons who were murdered in this country could have had justice today, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, what do you see on the front pages of the newspapers? On one side, you see the Prime Minister whining in effect, and on the next side, you see a mother clutching her baby because the mother... Madam Speaker, on a point of order, and I write, yes, again, and I rise on uh, standing order 48.1, and I also rise on standing order 48.6 and 48.4. In fact, we know all the standing orders. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Member for Princess Tong, again, on the question of relevance, I would ask you to withdraw that statement, and I will again caution you about relevance and the power of the speaker to call on you to discontinue if relevance is not shown. And to the other members of the House, I would like to remind the standing orders with respect to members being able to make their contribution in silence and to desist from excessive crosstalk. Continue, Honorable Member. For Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Madam Speaker, may I remind the Honorable House that I am responding to comments made by the Honorable Minister and the member for Point Fortin. Honorable Member for Princess Tong, I ruled that the statement you had made should be withdrawn. That's a statement with respect to um, pictures with the Honorable Member for Digo Martin West whining on the newspaper, which I said was not relevant to the issue. So I've asked you to withdraw that. Madam Speaker, I'm so guided. Madam Speaker, I withdraw with a lot of hesitation, but I withdraw Honourable nonetheless because. Honorable Member, Honorable Member for Princess. Honorable Member for Princess Tong, that is total disrespect for the chair. And I will again would ask you to apologize or else I will have to invoke the order. Madam Speaker, I apologize and withdraw the comment. Madam Speaker, over the past few decades, we have seen many examples of interference by the People's National Movement in the independent institutions in our country. We have seen examples where the hands of politicians in the PNM have seeked to influence decisions. Honorable members, honorable members, please, may we have some order? Continue, member for Princess Tom. Madam Speaker, it still doesn't change the fact that we have seen examples where the hands of the politicians in the PNM have influenced decisions that are politically expedient to them. Madam Speaker, the legal notices of 2015, legal notice 218 in the criteria for the selection of the police commissioner and the deputy police commissioner proposed by this administration is a slap in the face of the Police Service Commission and the role that is afforded to Madam them Speaker, by the Constitution. Madam Speaker, I rise on... Thank you, sorry. Honorable members, when one member stands on a point of order, the other member should sit. 
at no time two members should be standing in the chamber at the same time. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise on standing order 8-1 and request that the word seek be expunged, <laughs> given that it is incorrect English. 8-1, please, Madam Speaker. Members, I would allow the Honorable Member for Princess Stung some latitude in that while, while standing order 8 1 speaks about the debate being in English. <laughs> could we please have some? Could we please have some order, please? I will draw a distinction between Queen's English and what sometimes we, members please, what sometimes in Trinidad and Tobago amongst the dialect. Honorable members, I have made a ruling with respect to the point of order made by the leader of the house. If I go to invoke standing, standard English in here, lots of us will be outside. <laughs> Continue, please. Member for Princess Town. Madam Speaker, today, once more, we in this country are seeing an attack on our independent institutions. An attack on our independent institutions. We are seeing an attempt by an administration. Please have some order. And if I have to rise again huh? for order, I am going to suspend the sitting. Continue. Madam Speaker, today once more we in this country are seek seeing an attack on our independent institutions. We are seeing an attempt by an administration who operates like a runaway Madam horse. Madam Speaker, I stand on standing order 4410 which you have ruled on several times. It is now becoming pathetic. Honorable member, honorable member, you are allowed to make some references to your notes, but, but one is not allowed unless one seeks leave to read completely. So while your notes might be extremely full, I would ask you to remember this is a debate and therefore limit your references to your notes, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I make reference to comments made by the Honorable Member for Point 14. Minister of National Security. And while the Honorable Minister went on to quote Anand Ramasa, he was particularly silent with respect, with respect to the chairman's, chairman of the PSC, who spoke about not being consulted with respect to the two legal notices. Madam Speaker, one would have thought that today the member for point 14 would have come to this house prepared to answer the chairman of the PSC on those charges. Madam Speaker, the government continues to speak day after day about consultation. About consultation with different institutions, with consultation with different sectors of the society with respect to decision making. And Madam Speaker, once more, we see that the minister with responsibility for the police service in this country, remaining silent like several of their other colleagues on very important matters that affect this country. Madam Speaker, the honorable member for point 14 and member, Minister of National Security, 
spoke about the demoralization of officers in the police service and generally in the protective services. And Madam Speaker, I am reminded of the years prior to the partnership coming into government when day after day after day you had officers who swore to protect and serve this country facing the brutality of a government who did not put mechanisms and measures in place to protect them. And Madam Speaker, while they speak about demoralization of the police service, let me remind members opposite that it was a Kamala Passad Bises administration that came into government and ensured, member for Separia, and ensured that we, we attempted to ensure, Madam Speaker, that we put mechanisms in place to protect the families of our officers, our protective officers. <laughs> and Madam Speaker, we ensure that over 3,000 officers, police officers in this country, received $1,000 extra in their pockets, Madam Speaker. We ensured, Madam Speaker, that the families of officers who put their lives at risk every day were protected. In the event of their demise, that they would have been able to access one million dollars, Madam Speaker, that would give their children a start in this country. And you know, Madam Speaker, they want to speak about all the things that they wish to do to ensure that the police service and the protective services are well equipped to get the job done. And you hear the Honorable Minister and the member for point 14 speaking about demoralization and he's speaking about all the good things that, we, that they can do to lift the morale. And while they want to correct me, it seems that they did not have the same feelings towards their own member who could not even pronounce the word morale and kept saying moral. And Madam Speaker, let me remind this honorable house and this nation that when the partnership came into office, we came into office, Madam Speaker, with a police service that was amounting to just over 2,500 officers. Madam Speaker, there was a shortage of 3,000 officers in this country when the partnership honorable came into members, office. Honorable members, I would like to hear the contribution of the Honorable Member for Princess Town. Honorable Member for Princess Town, this is, the, this is the last opportunity I'm going to get to caution you on relevance. And if you can really bring your contribution and relate it to the motion in very short order, or else I will invoke the standing order. Madam Speaker, in my effort to respond to the Honorable Minister of National Security, not so, not so he was the one who raised the issue of demoralization. He was the one who spoke about mechanisms being put in place by his administration to make the lives of officers a little bit easier. And Madam Speaker, what I'm simply doing is I'm simply identifying the double standards and hypocrisy of this government. And Madam Speaker, as early as 2006 and up to 2009, certain modifications were made by the Parliament with regards to the selection and appointment of the Commissioner of Police and the Deputy Commissioner of Police. And it was done in tandem with groups from civil society and the opposition so that we could have a meaningful contribution to getting the desired result. Madam Speaker, while we may not have agreed with all facets of the arrangements, what we were happy with was that the matter was ventilated 
and the process was not amended in secrecy and in a clandestine manner. And Madam Speaker, there's a general feeling in this country that the government continues to operate without consultation. The government continues to operate in secrecy. The government is not consulting with the population, Madam Speaker. And while this government seeks to undermine the value of the Police Service Commission to regulating them, and several of my colleagues use the analogy to a post box or a conduit, in the selection process, it was a Kamla Passad besides a member for Separi administration who spoke about strengthening of the PSC through former Minister of National Security, Gary Griffith, in December of 2014. Madam Speaker, then Minister of National Security, Gary Griffith, recommended to the government that the DPA be removed from the entire selection process by bringing amendments that would have strengthened the role of the PSC in the selection process and it would have given full autonomy to the PSC in the process. Madam Speaker, the partnership government was and continues to remain committed to, implement, to maintaining sorry, the independence of our state institutions. Madam Speaker, under Section 123 of the Constitution, the PSC nominates, and that nomination is subject to approval by the House of Representatives. The PSC can only appoint once its nomination is approved by the House. But Madam Speaker, that is the final stages of what happens. We must understand what happens from the very beginning. We in the Parliament must be concerned about what happens at the beginning of the process, Madam Speaker, and not just at the end. Madam Speaker, the Police Service Commission today is being told that there will be nothing more than a rubber stamp. And the fact is that they are not even being told, Madam Speaker, because the left hand is not even speaking to the right hand. Madam Speaker, these notices are shrouded, as I've mentioned, in secrecy, and they are under a dark cloud cover. Madam Speaker, the Police Service Commission is being compromised by this administration by making it answerable to a sitting politician in the person of the National Security Minister. And Madam Speaker, you would have heard from Speaker after Speaker on this side of the House the concern that we have about replacing the DPA with the Minister of National Security. Madam Speaker, again, we are fearful on this side that the political players in the PNM may be at work. And what are the desired outcomes from these machinations to have the commission directed and ultimately answering to a political figure? Madam Speaker, the brazen attempt by this administration to involve political figures is not only limited to the PSC. We are seeing it right here in the parliament, Madam Speaker, where government ministers are chairing oversight committees. Madam Speaker, they are asking their own questions Madam and Speaker, providing their I rise own answers. On Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Madam Speaker, I rise on Standing Order 48-1. Honorable Member for Princess Tong, again, I caution you with respect to relevance. This, this deals, this motion deals with a very limited matter, the selection process. I ask you again to keep within the confines of the matter before this house. Madam Speaker, I'm so guided. Madam Speaker, the government needs to tell the population today what constitutes an appropriate local firm. And Madam Speaker, what I'm seeking to do is indicate again what the government has said, but to show through their own actions in the past, Madam Speaker, how they have not been able to maintain the accuracy of the statements that they make. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, the government needs to tell the population what constitutes an appropriate local firm. Would an appropriate local firm be a firm in which it is directed by locals purely? Is it a firm where there are no foreign affiliates? Is it a firm that one of their ministers' spouses will be affiliated to? I don't know, Madam Speaker, I'm simply asking. Madam Speaker, this is the same government whose chairman's spouse moved from being a housewife to a million dollar contractor. Madam Speaker, this is the same government whose well, finance Madam minister Speaker. moved. Honorable Member, for Princess Tong, I'd ask you to withdraw that. And this is my very last warning. Madam Speaker. Members, could you kindly keep silence? Madam Speaker, I'm simply asking these questions. You ask me to withdraw? Withdraw. Madam Speaker, my apologies. I withdraw. Madam Speaker, what I'm concerned about, again, is that while my colleagues would have raised several issues with respect to the legal notice and the provisions made in these legal notice, in this legal notice, sorry. <laughs> what we are concerned about on this side, Madam Speaker, is that... Members, this sitting is suspended for five minutes to get some order in this house. the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter. Our call sign is at TT Parliament. Parliament Outreach. I, I do think that there are some biased comments that, that go out there into the media, especially in newspapers when you read articles. Um, you could you could pick up on the biases as also in terms of letters to the editor certain opinions when there are many people who write letters to the editor but only a few are selected to be published and that shows some sort of biases. I think they should report on what is truthful and not really what they want because if they re report on what they want then they would just make shock headlines in order to increase their revenue. No, I don't believe they should report on everything because it's all about how they sensitize things. Some things the media will not be able to handle. The public, sorry, public will not be able to handle. And to display that to the public could cause a lot of uproar and eruption in, of emotions. And so it's, you sh it should be sensitized and limited to some extent. Parliament Outreach. Check our website for showtimes, ttparliament.org. Parliament Outreach. The roles and responsibilities of an, of an MP is to ensure that he carries out about his duties and that he makes sure that his constituency is being taken for. The lecture series today was very informative, especially from Mr. Mr. Hamid Ghani. He made me very aware of what of what the got what is mostly the main
Honorable Madam Speaker. Member for Princess Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, through the legal notice 218, it undermines the confidence in the Police Service Commission through its removal of Section 3J and 3K from the 2009 order. Madam Speaker, the 2009 order ensured that the Commission could make inquiries on candidates in that the Commission may gather such other information on each candidate as it considers necessary and appropriate to determine the merits of his application and suitability for the office for which he is being considered. Madam Speaker, like my colleagues before me, we have raised several issues of lack of consultation, with lack of several clauses being removed from the 2009 order, and also, Madam Speaker, areas that remain ambiguous and silent. And Madam Speaker, while we on this side of the House support the annulment of the legal notice, Madam Speaker, we do so on the backdrop of understanding that we have had, we have had in the past, and even in the recent past, Madam Speaker, several examples where we are not comfortable we're trusting this government. We are suspicious of the political interference as we have indicated before. As time and time again, through our recent history and even over the decades when the PNM was in office, Madam Speaker, that they come to the Honorable House crying crocodile tears, Madam Speaker, about citizen security. But Madam Speaker, what in fact they are uh, trying to do today, Madam Speaker, by coming to this House only after being forced by the opposition through this annulment, that they are trying to hoodwink the population by not answering to the rational, the rationale and the reasons being put forward for making these fundamental changes. Madam Speaker, it is our view that this is why we cannot trust the government and why we are suspicious about political interference. Madam Speaker, I will remind you of several instances of political interference by this People's National Movement Administration. And Madam Speaker, as I wrap up, I want to remind members of the national community that we have several of the same players in the government again, who were in government before, in the 1994 government, in the 2006 government, Madam Speaker, who remained silent, who remained quiet on these issues, and remained also not only mum, but also numb on these issues because they said nothing, they did nothing, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to refer to one case as I wrap up, and that is the case of former Chief Justice Satnarain Sharma. Madam Speaker, Madam one. Speaker, 48 1 again. again. Finally. Honorable Member for Princess Town, having warned you several times, I will then now order that you take your seat and discontinue your contribution. Honorable Member for Diego Martin. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It really dampens my enthusiasm to enter this debate, to have to come in after such an unfortunate ruling. But the rules are the rules. I joined this debate, and hopefully I won't be too long, because I simply want to put on record a response to a couple of the 
statements made by members today. I would understand that the new members would not have the correct breadth of the perspective and the history of this development. So as I sat here all day today and listened to members on the other side talk about how the government has come virtually as a thief in the night and has dropped this thing on the house without consultation. And in fact, at least two members have gone as far as to say, as they praise themselves, as they want to do, that we are here in this house today because the opposition brought the government here. Madam Speaker, you would know, we came here today as per our instructions last time the House met, to come to do the finance bill. It is the finance bill that brought us to the House today. And we took the opportunity, having come here to do the finance bill today, to dispense with the motions filed by those on the other side, to seek to stop something which should have happened a long time ago. For the benefit of the new members and the public who for the last seven or how many hours were regaled by these allegations of suddenness and unpreparedness by the government and unwillingness to consult, let me for the record indicate that this solution which we put to the country which is in force and is subject to negative resolution did not suddenly arise in this administration. It's a continuation of something that arose two administrations ago. Correct. It started with an ex a requirement to change laws to respond to crime. And the PNM government of the day brought to the House a package of legislation, which is loosely called the anti-crime anti right. bills, a package of legislation. And those bills required a special majority, two-thirds two -thirds majority. But the PNM didn't have two-thirds of the votes in the House. But there is a requirement in the country to have those elements of legislation passed into law so as to respond to the rampage of the criminals amongst us. The opposition at the time agreed that there was need for the legislation, but they placed strictures, political strictures, on the passage of the legislation. They laid down conditions. It mattered not that the criminals were running up and down the street and that the mountain number of dead was in front of us. They said to pass the legislation, they will hold their votes unless unless the government of the day, the prime minister of the day, takes steps to remove certain conditions that existed with respect to the appointment of the commissioner of police. At that time, a commissioner of police was appointed by the public, the police service commission, and the prime minister held a veto over a nominee that would have appeared before him as a selectee of the commission. It's just simple. The police service commission throughout the years would look at the situation and make a selection of a commission of police, but the law required that the prime minister review it and say yea or nay. That's what we call the veto. Those in the opposition said that is tantamount to the prime minister appointing the commissioner, and they wanted that change. And if that doesn't change, they're not going to vote for that legislation which was meant to respond to the crime rampage at the time. Mm -hmm. The PNM had reservations about what they put forward. And what they put forward, in order to get the bills passed, giving priority to the requirement to pass the law as against preserving any veto, the Prime Minister of the day agreed to have the law amended so that there was no veto and that Parliament selects the Commissioner of Police. Put the reservation on the record. 
and the reservations unanswered. The bottom line was one group of politicians was saying to have a veto over an appointment made, a, a recommendation made by the commission was tantamount to the politician, the prime minister, the political party appointing the commissioner. But that same group didn't see that the party and the prime minister, who had the majority in the house, had even more political clout in appointing the commissioner. Because with the veto, what would have happened that if the commissioner came down the line, it would have taken two or three recommendations for the prime minister to have nothing to veto. And the veto would have ended very quickly because you couldn't veto the whole police service. But in the parliament, in one stroke, the political majority chooses the commissioner of police. So if we want to talk about commissioner of police being chosen by political action, there is no greater political action than partisan politics in the parliament selecting the commissioner of police. So he went. And the very first time that it was put into use, they, they use it. I happen to have been in the seat where my colleague for Separia now sits. And the other member was standing, sitting here. She was a brand new prime minister, freshly minted, glowing from head to foot. <laughs> and it was one of, it was one of, as prime minister, it was one of the first items we met, dealt, dealt with in 2010. And at that time, the government was in support. The government was in support of Mr. Gibbs. The opposition was not. The government used its majority, and it voted Mr. Gibbs into office as commissioner of police. And the record will show that halfway through his term, all the reservations that we had about that fresh out of Canada commissioner of police came to pass, and it was the government itself that terminated Mr. Gibbs' term halfway through. And it resulted in a minister of the government, I don't want to use an unparliamentary word, but speaking inaccuracies to the country, saying that Mr. Gibbs was fired by the Police Service Commission. It took the commission to come out publicly and say, we did no such thing. Correct. It was the government that negotiated a, a separation of Mr. Yeah, Gibbs yeah, and Mr. Iwatsky. Exactly. And they were paid millions to go halfway through the term. Exactly. I didn't they make that up. Tracked. That is the record. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, during the debate, during the debate when the government voted in support of Mr. Gibbs and the opposition was not in support, the new prime minister then said, in response to a claim to the debate, gave an undertaking that the, <clears throat> the, the cumbersome system which we experienced in the selection of Mr. Gibbs, the new prime minister gave an undertaking that in very short order, the government will come back to the parliament and we will change the existing arrangements. And as leader of the opposition, I gave the assurance that the opposition will support that move. That was in late 2010. No such thing happened, except that a, an acting commissioner of police was put in place after the Gibbs misadventure. And there we had an acting commissioner to seven, this day. Seven times now. Seven Every six months, the press is speculating. Seven Will he get a passing grade? Seven there were times when he, as he's going up to, to the commission, there's speculation in the press. Will he be humiliated? Will he pass? When he came out, they're asking him, what did the commission say? Have you got... And that is how the commissioner was put out in front of the public. Then there was a bit, there was a protracted period of increase criminality, violent crime, and murders. I, as opposition leader, initiated contact with the prime minister. And I asked her for an audience. And she graciously agreed. And I took to the office of the prime minister a team of parliamentarians and 10 proposals from the opposition. Number one proposal. Number one proposal was 
that we should proceed to place someone into the substantive post of commissioner of police. And we told the government's team then, bring it any Friday evening or call parliament any day of the week and you're guaranteed to have the opposition support. At the time, the Minister of National Security was the, uh, the, Nash, the Minister of National Security, sometime yes, later on, Gary Griffith, yes, was the yes, advisor. Yes. The Attorney General was Anand Ram Logan. Yes. And I distinctly recall in the meeting that both of them and the Prime Minister expressed support yes. and gave us the assurance that it will be done. We left that meeting having made other proposals, but that was one. There were other proposals made, but that was one. I mean, we expected that the government will proceed. The government of Trinidad and Tobago, during the period subsequent to that meeting of 2013, did absolutely nothing. But that isn't exactly correct. They didn't do anything about bringing it to the parliament. But a lot happened with respect to discussing it, passing it through the systems, readying it to come to Parliament, but the government was distracted. Read the papers. I saw where Minister Griffith is making reference. I've seen the documentation of the involvement of the Police Service Commission in these very discussions, taking a position that the changes to be made ought to be made to simplify the process. <laughs> Also, to simplify the process, to remove from the process the first three steps that were the impediment to it being done. And there was another, there was another feature of that period, you know. When, under the new arrangement, there was to be an appointment of the chairman of the Police Service Commission, and the name of my former colleague at the UWI, Ramesh Diosaran, came up, I supported it fully and he was made chairman of the commission. After three years, the term expired. But these impediments were in the way, and it was a very sorry period. The commission was eunuched. And it produced nothing, and this impediment of not being able to get a commission of police into the substantive post was a bone of contention with the commission itself. And then, strangely enough, after all that was ventilated in the public on this issue, the president presented the name of Ramesh Diosaran again to continue into another term as chairman. And I was flummoxed. Because here he was in the first term saying how futile were the attempts and how stultifying was the process and how meaningless was the term. But he was prepared to take another term. And I asked in this house to do what? And I led my team in the opposition to oppose his reappointment. The government used its majority and had him appointed. And within a matter of, was it six months? Less than a year. Less than a year. He, of his own volition, in the ultimate frustration, resigned the position and left it. And in the meantime, our commissioner of police was getting another six months mm -hmm. to get another six months. And now he has a record. Was seven, seven seven he, I understand he's just been given his seventh extension. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we had to listen to the Attorney General making joke or government policy in the face of public comment on this matter and opposition interventions I described, saying, I think it was in this house, that you get, the, you get more out of the man if he's acting. Yes, yes. yes. Wasn't joking. Yeah. I don't repeat what I said today because others have said it. You get more out of the man because he'll work harder because he wants to be appointed. Yes, well, based on that principle, apparently there's no end to how much he has to do to prove to them that he deserves to be confirmed. But that is not the point today. The point today is that this, uh, this government had the opportunity to take part in the general election campaign. And while they were running up and down, spinning wheel and playing the fool in the election campaign, 
I was telling this country, if you vote for the PMM, if you elected us into office, one of the first things we will do is to come to the parliament and change the system that is so cumbersome. So, we've done that. And according to the arrangements, from the time we put the order in place, because it is an order that was required to be changed, and the government knows it, because Minister Gary Griffith, who was Minister of National Security in the government of the member for Separia, had expressed it very clearly, not once, but many times. We knew what had to be done, but it was clear that the government was either distracted or was not prepared for reasons best known to them. They just were not prepared to do it. They knew what had to be done. And they also knew, most importantly, that they had the support of the opposition if they came to parliament That's to right. do it. That's right. And they come here and detain us from half past one today and waste parliament time for the whole day pretending to be, I mean, to, be, to be opposing this matter on the grounds that there was no consultation. But let me tell you in your fight something. I was in the cabinet when a prime minister sought to talk to a chairman of the police service commission. I was there. I don't know where you were, but I was there. He wanted to talk to him in the same spirit of consultation that you advocated all day today. And I heard his name called here today with great reverence. And what did he say to the Prime Minister? He said, I can't talk to you. I'm independent. I'm in an independent commission. I'm, a, I'm head of an independent commission. I'm not talking to you. I can't talk to you. And said that to a Prime Minister who sought to consult him. And I had to listen here for the whole day that we can't go any further. We're undermining the Constitution. We're borrowing on the ground. We're creating landslide in the Constitution if we don't consult the Commission. And then, of course, the current chairman of the Commission jumps out to say, or to give the impression that something wrong is going to happen in the Parliament because we had not consulted her. But she's sitting on an important Commission who is having to watch that it has no role in initiating a process to put a commissioner in place because somebody else didn't do what somebody else had to do. For four years. And this, that is in place now put there by us, gives the commission the power to act in a similar circumstance in the future. So I don't know how giving you power to act is undermining you. Exactly. Where did you get your logic from? We are giving the commission, we, we have given by changing the order, where for four years a commission sat there, a commissioner chairman resigned in frustration because the existing arrangement gave the commission no opportunity to intervene. And we give the commission now that power to intervene. And you spend six hours trying to mislead the country that we are taking away power from the commission. <laughs> that the election campaign continues because you have to think that the people of this country are stupid because anybody who's listened to you today and understand that what the order does is to give the commission an opportunity to intervene a power it does not have how could that be undermining the commission my friend from Chagones he spoke very eloquently and with great aplomb Chagones West sorry Chagones West and it sounded like a good argument. When I was in high school, I used to make those arguments. Because they'll give you an argument, one side of the argument. Whether you agree or not, argue that. Right? And in school, that's high school argument. Be it resolved that the sun is made of green cheese. <laughs> and you have to argue the color looks like cheese. It's far away, and I think I got a whiff of cheese. It's an argument. You're building an argument. It does not make sense. Right? It doesn't have to be true. But that's what it does. But he got up here today and quoted law. Well, of course, I want to congratulate my colleague from San Fernando West, the member of the Gramatic Northeast, and from Port of Spain, for three of the most lucid explanations I've ever heard in the parliament on a matter of success. But they were forced to do that because the opposition came in here today hell-bent on misleading the public that the government was doing something that the government was not in fact doing. I don't know. If 
anything like the Minister of National Security because the effect of proper arrangements not being made and the demoralizing of the men and women under arms Correct. that went over their heads. So one member equate the pronunciation of morale with seat. This is not a place to make jokes. The, the, what stands between us and the criminal empire and the criminal industry in Trinidad and Tobago is the police service. And we have to stop playing politics with it. And that's why I led my team to the prime minister's office on the initiation of the opposition and said, we are available. We are available to work with you, whatever you want of us in the opposition, we are available. The, current, the opposite was when we brought bills to the parliament and blood was flowing in the streets, mm -hmm. the UNC said, we're not voting for those bills unless you give us this convoluted thing. Correct. And of course, mm -hmm. the convoluted thing has in the structure this guarantee of perfection that a foreign firm must choose. And we, people of Trinidad and Tobago at the time, spent millions of dollars or some similar figure Eight million. to train people up in the police system. And a man with a degree from Cambridge prepared as part of the successional planning of the police was passed over. Black Penn Street. State, Penn State passed over our homegrown. University of Cambridge. A man from trained at Cambridge in policing, paid for by taxpayers. Some nameless, faceless people from Philadelphia <coughs> told us that Mr. Gibbs was better than a degree from a diploma He got a PhD and a MSc in the same, in the same year. year from a and I don't want to waste time going there because that, that was made clear in the debate. But the government, the government voted in him, and Mr. Pigott resigned. Or he left the service and we lost the potential to have him because the government chose Mr. Gibbs. And he's telling us. In fact, when we opposed that, they told us we were xenophobic. Yeah. They told us we were xenophobic. Before that, that means we are, we are afraid of foreigners. We don't like foreigners. Reach me to tell him but of course, when they ended with him, in the middle of his term, there was no talk of xenophobia. It was just rank, unadulterated failure. <coughs> and basically what our colleagues on the other side saying to us tonight is leave it so like it. leave it so for another five years like so when Mr. Williams goes and whatever time he goes somebody else will act because the commission can do no more than that appoint the next person in line and then of course in all this pseudo legal argument I heard here today about the government, the government wanting to appoint a commission I want to make it very clear as leader of this government, I have no horse in this race. I have no idea. I have no idea who will become the commissioner of police in the new process. And all I want out of it is that the process works and works trans transparently. And of course, I heard a name call of some officer from Tobago who I don't even know. He walks in here now, I don't know him but I be accusing the Prime Minister of wanting to appoint a Tobagonian. Well, if a Tobagonian is next in line and the best person, and the best person, if a Tobagonian is the best person, then so be it. And, and I don't want to go, I don't want to go any further about Tobagonians being the best for the job. Because my girl Tobagonian opposition leader too. <laughs> anyway, but the point I'm making, all kinds of accusation being made. No consultation. The government is against consultation and the government is dictatorial and the government is as I speak to you now. There are hundreds of people in Presal taking part in consultation on local government reform. Yeah. Following consultation in San Fernando, overflowing where overflowing crowds, crowds came from Bitongo over into the streets. Consultation on the way on local government. Does that sound to you like a government that doesn't know what consultation is? 
a government who is now led by an opposition, at the time an opposition leader who walked to the Prime Minister's office to go and listen to the Prime Minister, give assurances, and then turn back on it, did not do a single one of the things that we said would be done. SRC. But tonight is not the time for that. And of course, here had a brilliant argument from one of my colleagues on the other side. That they is, and I'm, I'm quoting here, because I, it was so spectacular, I had, to, I had to write it down. Let me quote it. I like that word. Mm -hmm. Is there a firm in this country which is beyond the reach of the criminal element? <laughs> well, let me tell you all something. There was a time when Colombia didn't have an attorney general in Colombia. The attorney general of Colombia is operated of New York because the criminal element made it impossible for there to be a, an attorney general in Colombia. So if you want to talk about the reach of the criminal element, what is the length of the arm of the criminal element? Do you know on the other side? So when you raise this kind of argument, indicating that we in independent Trinidad and Tobago, we don't have a firm that could do our head hunting and could evaluate applicants in this independent territory. What you are saying, unless it is done by foreigners, cannot be done on our behalf. It's the same nonsensical argument that keeps the CCJ not being a court of, of a fight, final. final court of appeal. And unfortunately, the person who led that argument is the same person who is now opposition leader and carry on the same mentality. And you proposed it. Sign the agreement. Now, if it is that we, that argument holds for this particular operation today, and on this order, why not let it hold for the head of the FIU? Are you going to say that we can't find in Trinidad and Tobago a citizen to head the FIU because such a person of Trinidad and Tobago can't be beyond reach of the criminal element? Well, let's take it further. Let's not have any local judges and magistrates because they will be within the reach of the criminal element. Do you all hear yourselves when you talk those kinds of things in the parliament? It makes absolutely no sense, but of course... But of course I can take it further. But the argument today was about wasting time and misleading the population. One member got up here and said when they came into office, it had 2,500 policemen. <laughs> now if you could put on clothes, put on tie, put on whatever you put on and come to the parliament and, and stand that. up on parliament floor and say there were 2,500 policemen in your time, where you come from? In a serious face. Huh? A serious debate is taking place in the parliament where the opposition is accusing the government of undermining the constitution. Giving guarantees outside the parliament that under no circumstance will you support this measure. But of course, here, here, here your argument that there were 2,500 police officers and, when you, and, and under your brilliant stewardship of the lady you love, you added 5,000 more. <laughs> Every school child knows right, that the last time we had 2,500 police officers was in the colonial days. Right. And way into the colonial days. But you come to talk in parliament as some hot shot. The more peace of the opposition. And that is what I have to stay here and give up my sleep to listen to. <laughs> because they know they're joking. The entire intent of the opposition here today was to mislead the public and create an agenda fair. When in fact there was nothing to fear. All we are doing, if I may repeat the crystal argument of the member for Port of Spain North, St. Anzies, all we are doing as an executive is to remove three impediments. This thing about somebody has to find somebody has to find somebody. The story of God call man, send man, man, send monkey, monkey, send the tail. Right? That's what's going on here. We have to change that. All we are doing is to, is to allow the thing to begin to move. I distinctly recall. A little while ago when some argument, some inquiry was made of the government, this government, the people in opposition know as to why action had not been taken to begin Honorable the Honourable Member Fatigo Martin, where?
Your 30 minutes have expired. You're entitled to an extension of 15 minutes. I thank you. I, I, I thank you. Thank you. You know, the government of the day, which people now in opposition, will ask, where is the process with respect to the, how far has the process reached with respect to the appointment of a commissioner? Because there's great expectation among the population that we serve. Of course, my colleague from Naparima only served those who vote for him. Eh? 15,000 only. Got up this evening and say he represents 15,000 people. So the other 14,000, he don't represent them. Eh? Yeah, he represents those who vote for him. But those of us who represent all the people of our constituents. And as a government, we represent all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We can quite confidently dismiss the intent that they came here with today. As I was saying before I got the extension, I must thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving me the extension. Before, when the government was asked, where is the process now, how far has it reached? Spokespersons of the last government told the population, can reach nowhere, has gone nowhere, it hasn't started, because some initiator somewhere has not initiated the process. And then one minister says, we have no authority over the initiator. And somebody asked from the public domain, can't you make a phone call asking where it is happening with it? And the government said, no. We have to wait until. In other words, if the DPA never ask, and there were questions, clearly the minister to whom the DPA reports or interacts with must have some persuasion to ask the DPA to proceed or inquire. The government said and did nothing because it was somewhere else. All we have done is to bring it out of an area of darkness, bring it in the public domain. The order goes into law and all the law says is that now the process can start and it starts with the commission taking charge. One, you initiate the process and two, you choose as a commission an appropriate firm to do the head hunting. Well, if you are so afraid of that, no, one day in the opposition. <laughs> because the very commission that you say we're undermining has control, complete control of the process. And the government doesn't see it until it comes in this house. All other arrangements are in place. So why are you setting out to mislead the population that we are doing something so harmful to them? All other arrangements are in place. All we have moved is the logjam position, which allowed us and forced us by law to have to go abroad to find. What we are told is that the, 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 the whoever it was couldn't find an appropriate firm. <coughs> Imagine that. All over the world. This person or agency that was looking couldn't find a firm to initiate the process. Well, clearly, yes, I didn't do. what was meant there <laughs> is that we remain constipated forever because there was no movement. <coughs> and they're saying to us, leave it so. And we are saying, no, there was an election in this country and we were elected to change that. That's all we're saying. You might see it as a sinister action on our part. We see it as a responsibility. We have a mandate. There's an expectation. And we are absolutely convinced that no harm will come to the people of Trinidad and Tobago's interest as a result of initiating this process. In fact, I think there'll be jubilation in the police service. Because once the commission is appointed, the career of all the other officers will get back on track. Correct. Madam Speaker, that's all we're doing. And I want to say one thing. In an attempt to make a case here today, because you know they had to say something. Because we didn't expect them to come here and say, well, okay, 
we have nothing to say, so we support what you say. It doesn't work like that in Westminster politics. They will, and they're required to do that. They're required to try to poke holes in the government's arguments so that at the end of the day, the government argument must stand scrutiny. But when you get up and say, and who was that? I can't remember which one it was, but I, I've come to the habit now of not focusing on who says what, but just what was said. One of my colleagues on the other side said that Attorney General Ram Logan, and I'm quoting here now, has written several letters to the opposition leader asking for submission on this issue. That's an answer. Giving the impression that this matter was going through a completely different course to what I've just said here. I want to put on record that as opposition leader, I have received no such several letters from any attorney general of the government of the day on this matter. So it was quite misleading and possibly malicious for a member on the other side to come here and seek to bolster and strengthen an argument that had no merit by saying that the previous attorney general of the government of the day was writing to the opposition leader trying to get a consultation on this matter. The only correspondence I received from the attorney general in any similar circumstance was correspondence about the, government, the opposition's position on the bill that was described here today as the hanging bill, where they wanted to interfere with the penalty. And my response was then, and it still is now, we gave our response on the parliament floor, it's on Hansard, and we have nothing different to say. So I have nothing more to write to you about. If you want to know the opposition's position of the time, or the PNN's position, it's on Hansard. And it was clear what we were saying. And I won't go into that debate now, but it was a complete misrepresentation to come here and say that, you know, there were letters coming to the opposition leader. This matter started between us, those of us who are in the House now, in 2010, with a recognition by government and opposition. We're on different sides now, but in 2010, in supporting, in the same way we supported the budget of the day, we voted for the budget that year. We said, there's something that is wrong here. Let's fix it. The record will show that the government of the day did not do it. And the record will now show that this government that came into office five years later would have done what we had agreed to support in the opposition and what we now put in office, put in place, as the government of Trinidad and Tobago. That is all this is all about. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Well said. Honorable Member for Sipparia. Madam Speaker, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to contribute in this debate on the motion to annul the legal notice 218 of 2015. Madam Speaker, we have heard uh, contributions on both sides of the House, and I think there's something that is very clear coming from this side, and that is to say that we understand and we acknowledge the need for government to move apace with the appointment uh, selection process and of course we, the later notice we'll deal with, there is need to do that. What we did or did not do, the population has spoken as recorded election results and therefore it befalls the present government so to do. So we have absolutely no, we have absolutely no difficulty with having an expeditious uh, process um, being on the records. We have some silence so that the Honourable Member for Cipria could make a contribution, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have absolutely no problem with government moving to ensure that there is a permanent Commission of Police in office. I listened and I was very impressed with the contribution by the Honourable Member for Tunapuna. Very impassioned and indeed... Um, point 14, I'm sorry, point 14. Uh, the Honourable Member for Point 14, Minister of National Security. I'm sorry, uh, to the point, I, I obviously, uh, Major, Major General uh, Brigadier Dillon, I was very impressed with your contribution. I heard your passion with wanting to have a permanent uh, Commissioner of Police in place and uh, explaining 
the reasons why it was very important for the morale and otherwise for the police service. And I share that. I agree with you. It is very important. And in fact, many members here have stressed in their contributions the need for such to take place. Now, that having been said, I think it is not uh, accurate to say that we have been wasting time in the Parliament, Madam Speaker. The very process of the Parliament allows for this debate to take place. Indeed, the member for Ruka Maloney, leader of government business in the House, got up to move the extension of time from the 8 p.m. for the House to continue to sit uh, in keeping with our standing orders for, the, uh, for this debate to take place. And that is why we are here as parliamentarians, Madam Speaker. And I think it would be a great disrespect to this Parliament should it be termed that what we've been doing here all evening is wasting time. This motion, this motion has allowed us to hear the government side. It has also allowed us to hear the other side, and that's what the Parliament in Westminster style, that is what it is about, that we hear both views, the public will make their minds up, and of course where there may be a serious infringements on the constitutions, the uh, Judiciary is a guardian, the Supreme Court is a guardian of the Constitution, and therefore that can be dealt with in another place. So I want to um, disagree with the Honourable Member for the Martin West, the Honourable Prime Minister, that the time spent in the Parliament was time wasting. Because we got to hear, as I said, the, the great contribution from the Member for Point Fourteen, Minister of National Security. I could hear his frustration, as I say, and his passion, and therefore his haste in wanting to have this order in place, an order in place, <coughs> with respect to having the appointments. We were, uh, we were um, regaled with the fancy language of the member for San Fernando West um, in, in these proceedings today, and again, showing us his thinking on how matters went. For on this side, I was very happy to hear the member uh, for Chiguanas West in support of this motion, indeed putting on record concerns that we have, and that is what our duty is. So I endorse what has been said by the member for Chicago West and thank him and congratulate him for bringing this motion to the House, in keeping with parliamentary practice, in keeping with parliamentary procedure. Likewise, I endorse the statements made by the member for Carney Central, the member for St. Augustine, uh, the member for um, Princess Dong, who seems to have run a foul from time to time, but I enjoy listening to the member of Princess Dong <laughs> in his contribution and the member for Urupuch East and West. And as the debate continues, there may be other members who wish to contribute. So I, with greatest of respect, I would not want to see this debate as a waste of time. Madam Speaker, several of this, uh, those who came before talked about the genesis and the history of this particular uh, lawmaking power, subsidiary lawmaking power, power coming under Section 123A, I think it is, of the Constitution. And the Honourable Prime Minister gave us uh, some of that history as well, taking us back to the discussions that were held between the then opposition, some of us were members of that uh, group, and the then um, administration headed by the Honourable Prime Minister Manning. In those discussions, begun with respect to the police bills, and the Honorable Ryan is correct when he says one of the things that was discussed was the removal of the veto power of the Prime Minister over the appointment of a commission of police. And let us remember that there's a difference between a prime ministerial veto and parliamentary approval in terms of the transparency of public debate. So the of the veto has been important for transparency. Because there could be a scenario where the Public Service Commission would make a recommendation. The recommendation can be vetoed by the Prime Minister under the, um, the old law as it was. And recommendations could be sent again and again and subsequently vetoed and you'll get down to the person that the Prime Minister may really want to have as that. We saw that um, with respect to appointments of the Director of Public Prosecutions. We saw where that veto power is used on several occasions to um, veto persons who have been recommended for that particular position. So there is a great difference, and let us say, 
It is not that we moved the law. Jointly it was done as a bipartisan approach, for which I would like to commend the former Prime Minister Malin uh, for that initiative. In terms of the consultative process that took place, I think the member who is now Faruka Maloney was also on the committee, and several others who are here may have been on the committee, but I do recall um, that the Honourable Member Faruka Maloney making really uh, reasonable suggestions um, raising concerns for us to reach a consensus as to what we would do in the Parliament. We must remember that the consensus was exceedingly important because the provisions that we were seeking to amend, which was Section 123 of the Constitution, that all that um, falling within the role of the Police Service Commission, its functions and so on, it is not just entrenched, it is deeply entrenched in the Constitution. Any change to that would have required a two-thirds majority, it's not your normal uh, three-fifths or whatever, a two-thirds majority, which is the second highest tier in terms of uh, entrenched provisions and changes to it. So in arriving at the consensus, we decided that we would have a compromise. Instead of the veto power of a prime minister, that there would instead be parliamentary approval. And if I'm, 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 my memory serves me right, the Honorable Prime Minister today, today in his contribution, uh, spoke about the parliament approval of, um, of the, <coughs> sorry, or the Parliament appointing. The Parliament does not appoint, Honorable Speaker. I think perhaps just um, perchance he may have uh, sipped on the, on the actual words. The appointment is first to be made by the police service, secondly to be made by police service commission. What is required instead of the veto was now this parliamentary approval where you would have an open debate. So there'll be transparency and accountability where the members could be brought the candidates could be brought to the House, and again, the House will then approve, and only thereafter will the Police Service Commission make the appointment. So there's, there's a big difference in terms of what was there and what came thereafter. Now, we saw <coughs> these provisions first coming into place in 2008. They were based on orders made in 2007. So under that Section 123A, Two sets of orders were made, and now the third set, the 2015 uh, orders. The first set of orders made in 2007 followed upon the debates and the agreements that had been reached for the amendment of the Constitution. And from that uh, order, the first order in 2007, the process churned up or turned up or brought forward names for appointment of a commissioner of police. The order coming from the president to this house for approval brought name forward of uh, then superintendent Stephen Williams. So that was the first time that orders made under section 123 were utilized for the appointment of a commissioner of police. For reasons known only to, him, to itself, and the prime minister today mentioned it, that we have now placed in the parliament a greater political power than would have pertained or obtained under the veto power. And the parliament then, and the government then, rejected the local candidate, if we would say so, but rejected then superintendent Stephen Williams, even though he had come forward based on the process of the firm. And may I just say that that order, that first set of orders, the ones in 207, and the ones in 209, which these now seek to replace, neither of them said that it had to be a foreign <laughs> firm. It said a firm, but did not specify the firm. Now we are actually restricting, seeking to restrict it to the, uh, the local firm, and that I'll speak of in a moment. So that first person, the first person that was used out of this whole process, which took, a, as mentioned with the others, a long time and a lot of money, ended up with the person being rejected. And we went back to a position of having an acting commissioner of police. <coughs> so from 2008 till thereafter, until 2010, we had an acting commissioner of police. Fast forward now to 2010. In between, the orders in 2009 were made the selection process order was made in 2009, which this now seeks to revoke. That order was made by the then government, uh, led by 
uh, Prime Minister Manning. And the person who moved the motion for parliamentary approval <coughs> of the order was the Honourable Member for Diego Martin Northeast. So that the existing 2009 order, or maybe old order, was the, was the creature, was the creation of the then PNM government, um, ably advocated in this honorable chamber by the member for Diego Martin, Northeast. <coughs> the opposition then, of which I was a part, and several of our members were part of that <coughs> opposition, we filed, just as we've done now, we filed a motion to annul the 2009 order. Motion was filed to annul it. Madam Speaker, in that way we registered our disapproval with the 2009 order. <coughs> so it is not, as uh, members on the other side seek to say or are saying, it is not that we are saying to keep the 2009 order. We are not saying to leave it at its, as it is. That is not what we've said at all because we rejected that 2009 order. Then, we were not in government, the majority of the parliament was used for that order to go forward. So that 2009 order, Honorable Prime Minister said on several occasions today that we are saying to leave things as they are, keep things as they are. From since then, we were against that order. And therefore, we are not saying that today we should keep that order and reject this. We are not saying we should not move the process forward as they, they're very anxious to do, and the population is anxious to do, the police service itself is anxious to do. That's not what we are saying. We are saying that these specific orders that have been brought to the House are coming on the basis that, look, we have to do this, we have to do it quickly, and it is good to do because of leadership and morale and so on. I have no difficulty with any of those assertions. Our difficulty is with these specific orders and the provisions, the provisions contained in the order, the specific provisions contained in the order. And I will um, go to the uh, provisions there in a moment. So we've had discussions here. My colleagues have raised you know, the genesis and the history of, of what took place in the parliament. The Honorable Prime Minister has attempted to um, share with us some of that history. But I think it is important for the record that we indicate that all the orders that were made under Section 123 were orders made by the then government under Prime Minister, Pat then Prime Minister Patrick Manning. We rejected the 2009 order, parliamentary fo went forward, and as I said, the greatest proponent for those 2009 orders were, was the member for Debo Martin, Northeast. Fast forward now, that was 2009, the first set of um, recommendations that came had to do with and then Superintendent Stephen Williams, at present the Commissioner of Police, Acting Commissioner of Police. 2010, we came into office. Um, the Honorable Prime Minister said that was the first time that we were using the order. No, we were using this for the second time. The 2009 now, amended, uh, of the 07, and the recommendations that came forward, an entire process took place before we came into office in 2010. It came, all that took place, the process, the firm, the recommendations, the assessment, and so on, took place prior to our coming into office. And therefore, we met the recommendations. Those recommendations were done prior to our time in office. In keeping with the spirit of the law, under the Section 123 and under the existing uh, order, 2009 order, the name that came up at the top of that list that is the name. We did not reject the process then. We did not reject the person as was done in 2008 when Stephen Williams, Mr. Stephen Williams, was brought forward as the candidate. We accepted what had been done through the lawful process. That's where we were. The rest of it now is history. Here we are with the 2015 orders. And My colleagues have dealt with some concerns we have about the, the process by which these orders, this order was made and the process of it coming to Parliament and so on. Um, so there are two limbs on which we are looking and sharing our concerns with the order. That which has to do with the process and that which has to do with substance. And I would like to spend a little more time with respect to the substance because I think my colleagues have spent a lot of time 
on the issue of consultations. But there is one point on that I would like to repeat. It is this. The Honorable Prime Minister tells us that right now in Presal, consultations are going on on local government reform. Good. Excellent. I just trust that those consultations will not be used to delay um, a local government reform has happened on three consecutive years under the former uh, administration led by Mr. Manning. And therefore, he says the government is very aware of what consultation is about and what consultation is. The Honorable Member of San Fernando West, and if I may use his words, which I'm sure very familiar to, familiar to you, Madam Speaker, that you cannot approbate on the one hand and reprobate on the other. So whilst we have the government saying, look, we consulted 29 times when we were in government, pull up the report, the multi-sectoral report on the one hand, and then on the other hand say, well, we did nothing. And then on the other hand say that they're very familiar with our consultation, but no one here has been able to tell us, and from the other side, what consultations were done on the specific orders, specific substance, and uh, the provisions in the, in the legal notice to me. They did not come from that multi-sectoral multi report that the member for, honorable member of San Fernando West referred to. Definitely did not come from there. And others have already shared the specifics of um, the recommendations that were made. So we would be very happy should the government tell us at some point <coughs> where did these uh, proposals come from? We're talking about the specific orders. I want again place our arguments here in the context we are not against changing the process, the selection process. We are not against having it done expeditiously. We understand the frustration of the member for point 14, the Minister of National Security, where you do not have that leadership. Um, you know, infuse the morale into the entire protective service, the police service. We understand that and we fully appreciate it. But it is the specific provisions here, the substance of the order, that we do not know where they came from. The country has no idea because there was no consultation process. And whilst it is that the Honorable Emperor Diego Martin West gave a good defense by saying that once somebody wanted to speak with somebody uh, maybe that's like the one where God said man and man said monkey and monkey said tail. I don't know if the similar kind of experience, the similar kind of analogy could be used. Where we see this particular order <coughs> coming to us, and we do not have any idea if it came, if God sent it to man, if man sent it to the monkey, and the monkey sent it to the tail. Where did it come? Did it come from Mars? Was it the Honorable Attorney General? Was it the Honorable Member for Laventil West, who I know is a very learned attorney at law? Did they have input into this? Where did these proposals come from? And I think that's important because it did not come from a proper consultation process. Prime Minister has said to the Honorable Prime Minister that he very much knows what it is, and that's what is taking place in Prisal now, a consultation. But for these, there has been no consultation with respect to the specific provisions of this order. So yes, you have spoken, members on the other side. Yes, you said to the Police Service Welfare Association and others that they want to get a commission of police, they want to get the selection process order and so on. But none of them have actually been shown or spoken to about the specific provisions of the order. Yes, they want a, a local um, uh, commissioner of police. Yes, we all want a local commissioner of police. But they have not, you have not shared with them the specific provisions contained here. So that's the first point uh, on the consultation, and others have spoken more on that. I want to turn now to the um, actual substance of this order. And the members on the other side have made it clear that there is objection to the fact that the Minister of National Security is now inserted into this process, and that without more, what is wrong with that taking place? What is wrong with having a firm uh, involved in the process? But Madam Speaker, it goes further. Because you see, we are losing sight of the process to be employed 
when the order makes reference to the Commission on request of the Minister of National Security shall, in accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act, contract an appropriate local firm. In accordance with Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act. And what does that act say? The act tells us, 20A1C, which was inserted, I think there were some amendments <coughs> to the Central Tender Board Act that um, provided, that allowed for NIPTEC to contract on behalf of the government or a company wholly owned by the state. I don't think it's in there. I have there. I'll find it in a moment here. Yeah. A company wholly owned by the state. Now, what it does is if, you, if the contracting is done outside of the uh, if it is done under 20A1C, then the rest of the Central Tenders Board Act is jettisoned. It is exempt from everything else within the Central Tenders Board Act. And what is within the Central Tenders Board Act, as we know, is the transparency, the transparency, accountability, and the process for tendering. And I'm hearing mutterings is the same as in 2009. Madam Speaker, I said we, I was a member of the opposition then, who applied to annul the 2009 order. And again, Madam Speaker, may I repeat that what we did and didn't do for five years, we have paid the price for that, Madam Speaker. So that the 2009 order, we had, a, we had filed a motion to reject that order, to null it. And therefore, if we are looking at 20A1C, I'm not going to be distracted from the matter in space across the floor from the person who never stops speaking. To notice, please, please continue the cross talk. Continue, Honorable Member, for thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. So 20A1C, we, the firm is to be contracted. Sorry, the, the legal notice tells us that the commissioner on request of the minister, and there's been a lot of talk about that request of the minister, um, in accordance with section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act. And that says, you jettison all the other provisions of the Central Tenders Board Act that are there for, to ensure um, transparency, accountability, <coughs> checks and balances in tendering procedures. And you go to now NIPDEC or a wholly owned state company. Let's take NIPDEC and the same thing will apply with a wholly owned state company. The board of directors of NIPDEC is appointed by whom? The board of directors of NIPDEC is appointed by the cabinet, by the executive. There are certain members who are not so appointed, but the majority of the members are so appointed. Even if one is so appointed, Mr. Speaker, the point still holds. Secondly, secondly, and the same with a wholly owned state company, they're appointed by the executive. Secondly, what is the procedure under the, uh, under the NIPDEC or the wholly owned state company, which is now the one really doing the contracting? They're the ones going out there to look for the firm. And <coughs> under, <coughs> under the NIPDEC, the chairman of the tenders committee is the vice chairman of the uh, NIPDEC. I am, honorable speaker, again, can I please have some protection from the member of the Gomati Northeast? Honorable member for the Gomati Northeast. No, I am hearing. So that please don't let me have to warn you again. Continue, please. Honourable Madam, Madam Speaker, I thank you for your protection. And so that person is a person appointed by the executive. Similarly, with a state, if you use another state, wholly owned state company, you will also have the directors being the persons appointed by the uh, government. And this is where there is grave concern that the hand of the executive will be very much plunged into this process, starting at the top from the selection of the firm. The executive would have their appointees on their appointees determining who is the firm that shall be selected. 
And we have grave concern about that, Madam Deputy Speaker. And so to say we want to leave it as it is, no, we are rejected in 2009. We reject it again and we reject it in this present form that is being reproduced with respect to Section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act. We have further concerns, Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker. Uh, when we look at the amendments being proposed, we now have a process where the firm will be inviting applications for the positions. Now, what does this mean? Previously, there was a process where advertisements would be placed, so to John Public. And that has been replaced with the words inviting applications for the position. This is for the firm, huh? inviting applications, um, a contract, an appropriate local firm referred to as the firm, sorry, to conduct recruitment process including inviting applications. What is the difference between advertising and inviting applications? Is there a difference? Plenty. Now, if there is no difference, <laughs> then why change it? If there is no difference, why change it? And it is my respectful view <coughs> that the change now allows the firm to invite, to select and invite <coughs> applications for the post of commissioner or deputy commissioner. So that firm is to conduct a recruitment process, including inviting applications for the position. So you see where, again, our concern coming from what I've just um, described, where the NIPDEC, the members are members appointed by the executive, the chairman, the deputy, the chairman of the tenders committee, because that is a tendering process will now be used. Having jettisoned the central tenders board uh, tendering uh, procedures, you have now placed the NIPDEC using their tendering procedures. So where you have this firm being selected, first of all, and that firm is then to invite applications for the positions, we track it back. And that is a <coughs> grave concern for us. Inviting applications for position as versus advertising. Inviting means I can decide whom I will want to invite. If you advertise, it is open to the world. Nationals everywhere, if it's a national that we want, a local, as it were, a citizen. So it's restricted and I'm sorry. It's restricted and confined. Yes, so by, by changing it to this now, on, on reading it, in my respectful view, we are now saying, look, that firm, I will choose Tom, as we say, Tom, Dick, and Harry Lau. Honorable Member for Superior. Your 30 minutes have expired. You're entitled to, 20, to 15 more minutes. Do you intend to? <laughs> and leave is granted to you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Yes, so we can now cherry pick, as it were, select persons to place into uh, the as candidates in the recruitment process. Then the firm shall submit to the commission the results of its assessment process in the form of a short list of candidates. Secondly, in respect of candidates referred to in subparagraph one, the following documents, application, biography, 1529, uh, assessor's course, assessor's feedback, medical exam report, security and professional vetting report. And these now, we have now omitted in the new order, we are omitted the words guidelines for submissions by applicants to the firm omitted. So the firm will not have um, sorry, the, the Commission will not have the benefit of the guidelines for submissions by applications. Further, the list of submissions from the firm to the Commission has been included, but the following has been omitted. References in the number to be determined by the firm with current contact information of each referee and any other relevant information which the firm thinks appropriate. Those have been left off. Again, in a sense, blindsiding in my respectful view, blindsiding, blindsiding the Service Commission from information that could have been more useful for it in doing what it had to do. The requirement for composition of an assess assessment panel, that has also been completely admitted. The Commission may consult or discuss those results with the firm that has been left out. 
So we have here now the firm shall submit to the Commission the results of the assessment process in the form of a short list of candidates. A report on its assessment of the entire assessment process and in respect of the candidates referred to in one documents, application and so on. So here, where previously we had that the results of assessment process in the form of a short list of candidates and the Commission may consult and discuss those results with the firm. So honorable members on the other side who said to us today that the, the, the Police Service Commission will be in the process from the beginning to the end and throughout the entire process. It's not accurate if we read the specific provision which says the Commission may consult and discuss those results with the firm that has now been omitted. There is no requirement and therefore there is no permission under this uh, order for the Commission to consult or discuss the results of its assessment process. And which shall include written recommendations for improvements when necessary. This has also been left out. A report on its assessment of the entire selection process, which shall include written recommendations for improvements when necessary. That's what the firm has to give to the Commission. But in this new order, the words which shall include written recommendations for improvements when necessary has been left out. I'm, I, make the, I, I point to these omissions, Honorable Madam Speaker, because I'm saying, as others have said, and, and giving support to the view that we are, in effect, curtailing the powers of the uh, Service Commission, the Police Service Commission, by restricting the information that will come to them and by restricting what they could do, can ask about, uh, inquire about. Those have now been left out, thereby, I say, blindsided, but in effect, really, uh, really abrogating or derogating from the constitutional powers of the Police Service Commission. So if I may look at the, the Constitution itself, at Section 123, and if I may spend a few moments with your leave, Madam Speaker, on the whole purport of the Service Commissions, all the Service Commissions, in fact. Um, can you find the Lord de Plocka reference on me? I think it's 1981. Section. It's on the notes that I prepared. Ah, look, it's here. No, no. No, that's not it. It's my sheet of notes. Do you remember it? The only sheet of notes that I have. 125, 123. Mm. No, no, I'm looking for my, the notes I shared with you. The constitutional note, yeah. 123, there shall be a police service commission for Trinidad and Tobago, which shall consist of its chairman and four other members. I think one member already pointed out the, the process by which these, I think member from Aparima, who talked about the 62 constitution and, 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 and made the distinction 1962 and then the Republican 1976 constitution, which is the one we have now. In the 62 constitution, members of the service commission were appointed on the advice of the prime minister. Now that means when I tell you X, it is X. That's what that reading of uh, interpretation of the Constitution, uh, advice of the Constitution, yeah, this is it, advice of the uh, Prime Minister. That was improved upon in the 76 Constitution, Republican Constitution, when it became that they shall be appointed by the President, of course, after consultation with the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition. So the bipartisan consultation. In this case, the President does not have to go with any name given to him. The President, in his own discretion, will look, will consult, but he doesn't have to follow whatever is recommended by either the leader of the opposition or the Prime Minister. Previous to that, it was that the, on the advice of the Prime Minister, which means you must do what the Prime Minister said. So that the uh, Commission was given greater autonomy and greater independence in that regard because of the manner in which uh, the persons were appointed. Then the powers of the Service Commission, 123. The Police Service Commission have the power to appoint persons who hold or act in the office of the Commissioner or Deputy Commissioner, make appointments and promotion, remove from office, exercise discipline control, monitor efficiency and effectiveness of the discharge of their functions, prepare an annual performance appraisal report, here determine appeals. These are some of the duties of this uh, um, commission. Appoint persons to hold or act in the office of commissioner and deputy commissioner of police. 
Now, what does appoint mean? In its ordinary word, does it just mean that they sign a letter of appointment? Is that what is meant when the Constitution says that the Police Service Commission shall appoint? Then came the amendment that was made in Section 123A, which was made in the package in 2006, which says that they will now, the Commission will now nominate persons for appointment to the offices specified uh, in subsection 1A and section 22.1 mm -hmm. of the Police Service Act with the criteria and procedure prescribed by the order of the President subject to negative resolution of Parliament. This is section 123, I'm sorry, 123.2. 123.2. Eight more minutes here, thanks. Seven. So the Police Service Commission now, under the Constitution, has two powers. Two, two sets of powers. One is the power to appoint, the power to nominate and send according to the selection criteria and of course the qualification criteria. Um, they, they send the names to the president who sends the order here for approval. So does this then mean that through subsidiary legislation which does not require the heavily entrenched provisions for amendments to section 123, that is to say a two-thirds majority, can subsidiary legislation take away or derogate from the parent legislation? And the answer is obviously no. The subsidiary legislation is legal notice, the order. The order is a creature, uh, a creation of the parent law. And therefore subsidiary legislation must stay within the four corners of the parent law which is the Constitution. And given the structure of our, uh, our constitutional framework with respect to service commissions, given our constitutional framework with respect to the rule of law, with the three arms of the state, uh, four, as you said, the fourth state, but the uh, judiciary, the parliament, and the executive, given the entire grounding, the foundations of constitutional provisions, given such a heavy entrenchment, requiring a two-thirds majority, two-thirds, it is, it is almost, uh, you know, it is, very, it is very few times this parliament has ever seen a two-thirds majority being given. And that way, given heavy protection, a deeply entrenched provision, section 120 of the Service Commission. And it is our view, given now the provisions in this order, that those provisions infringe upon the constitutional powers of the Peace Service Committee. And appointing cannot merely mean that after the candidate's name come, names come to the Parliament, and this Parliament approves a name, all the Police Service Commission now is required to do <coughs> is to sign it. So in addition to being a post box that others mention, there is also with these provisions, what we are producing the Police Service Commission to do, to be, is a robot, basically. The firm goes through the entire assessment process. The firm selects whom to invite, how to invite, when to invite, where to invite. The firm does all the assessment. And all that the Service Commission is then required to do is to put a signature after it comes to the Parliament. There must be something, you know, there must be something inherently wrong where you have a service commission, a service commission that is so uh, deeply protected or so greatly protected by a constitution that through the subsidiary legislation, you can take away that power from the police service commission. That has to be a violation of the constitution. And as I said, the, the, the Supreme Court is the guardian of the Constitution, and it will be the Supreme Court <coughs> who shall decide that should this order uh, stay and become retain the law. So, Police Service Commission has the power to do all these things, to appoint and all the other things, plus to nominate. But this order, this election process order, in my respectful view, how much time? Two minutes? In my respectful four view, infringes and violates the parent legislation, which is the Constitution. And at that, as I say, a heavily entrenched provision of our Constitution. Madam Speaker, there are other matters others have been um, dealing with, uh, dealt with. Um,
Yes. So I close by saying it was not the intention of us on this side. And it cannot be said that we came here to waste the Parliament's time. Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Speaker, we utilize the provisions of the Parliament under the Constitution. We utilize the standing orders of the Parliament. We utilize the law of Trinidad and Tobago. And we are lawfully here raising concerns that we have on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And I do not care, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is only if Madam Speaker, I'm sorry, only if Madam Speaker you rule us out of order. We will comply with that, we will abide with that. But as long as we've been here and you've allowed us to voice our concerns and we are within our lawful rights, so to do, and I do not care how many times they will sit and mutter, waste of time, we have done our duty as the duly elected opposition of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Lavin, Till West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I begin by saying from my own experience that the life of the police is not an easy one. Whether commissioner, deputy commissioner, or last joint recruit, policing is a very tough business. It is dangerous in the extreme, especially in today's world. I spent my youth in there so I would know. I'm saddened to some extent that this evening we were not discussing matters of police pay. I know someone mentioned that we gave them $1,000, but of course that is not calculable in respect of their pension, no long-term or sustainable benefit from it. Doesn't improve their pension package, but we heard that. I would rather be talking about police morale what could we do as a parliament, as a people, to boost their morale, to deal with the difficulty that they face? And I heard the member for Princess Tong try to distinguish between morale and moral, of course, and he criticized the member on this side, not realizing the member was probably talking about his favorite game as a child. I thought we should have been talking about detection rates, a serious issue training, the skill sets required, the application of modern technology, the general welfare of the police officers from commissioner, deputy, right down, in terms of whether we could do like England and make public sector housing, subsidized housing, a part of their pay package. Many of them come to me concerned about these matters. Matters of efficiency of the police service. Matters of the brain drain where the seniors are now leaving the police service and there seem to be a dearth of that kind of experience when they do. The, prime, the former prime minister came here and tried to tell us, leaving her other members adrift. I'm surprised she spoke in this debate at all. Usually in the most important debate, she's not absent, including the variation of appropriation recently. But she got up to speak this evening after the prime minister, thinking like a knight in shining armor, she would do what she normally does. But I am here tonight to respond to her. I want to put on record that I'm really proud of the presentations made by my colleagues on this side. They were necessary, they were useful, they were instructive, especially, and I say without apology, that of the Prime Minister, factual as ever, principled as ever, a comprehensive analysis and historiography of the facts, which we all and the public most importantly benefited from. But what did the former Prime Minister do? She suggested to us, in essence, that she's not in principle in disagreement with what we are doing this evening. See, she's not in disagreement as a matter of principle, but she's concerned about the specific 2015 order and found herself in the difficult place of trying to demonstrate, especially when, especially when she had previously objected to the 2009 order, as she's objecting to the 2015 order, and saying that there is something specifically difficult or unacceptable about the 2015. But why did you then? What was the reason for objecting to 2009? What was it? 
This is a ruse yet again, Madam Speaker. So she found herself in this very uncomfortable place and told us that she had two objections. One, the member for Separia. Thank you very warmly, Madam Speaker. The member for Separia. One, the process. In respect of the process, the member argued just get the note here. Thank you. That she wanted, the member wanted to know what consultation was done on this specific order. A subtle point of no great moment or value. She wanted, the member wanted to know where did the proposals come from. Well, they came from the cabinet. And they came from a cabinet with someone who had the historical memory of all that has happened in this. That is to say the member for Dago Martin West. And the collective memory of all of us who had something to do with it. Because I participated in those debates as well in 2006. And the clear recognition that we were stuck in a rut since then and we had to do something about it. So we came here this evening to do something four months into our term as we promised about it. There's where it came from. And then, of course, the more meaningful objection according to the member for Separia was the substantive one and the member spent a lot of time dealing with section 20A1C of the Central Tenders Board Act. And really saying that that permits us to hire NIPDEC, a partly state-owned and controlled enterprise. Yes. Yes. And, because, yes. and because the board of NIPDEC will consist of at least one or a couple more persons, because not all the members of the board of NIPDEC are appointed by the cabinet or the government. Maybe just because there's one, there's this big possibility that the government could have so much influence on NIPDEC so that it would influence the appointment of this local firm. That is the, that is the member for Separia's argument. And embellished that, or attempted so to do by saying that the chairman of the tenders committee, which will receive the bids in, and, and analyze them to select this local firm, will also be the vice chairman, well, the chairman of the attendance committee is the vice chairman of the board of NIPDEC, which need not necessarily be, of course, the government appointee on that board. So the argument is very frivolous, very fleeting, and then accuse the government through that kind of argument of the possibility of cherry picking. Well, I submit that the member for Separia is nitpicking, looking for somewhere to hang her hat or her sip. The member is looking for somewhere to hide to hang the member's hat. <laughs> Didn't read, for those who would listen, the few, the provisions in E and F of the order. E and F of the order, yes. Three E and F of the order. And let me just read them. E, the commission shall then take into account all the information on the candidates and thereafter establish an order of merit list. The member for Separia was arguing that we reduced significantly the role of the service commission. And I think that E, as I've just read, really enhances their role. The DPA has nothing to do with this anymore. It is the service, the police service commission, which will take into account all the information in front of it and establish an order of merit list. A major and critical role. And F says that the commission shall select the highest graded candidate on the order of merit list and submit that candidate's name to the president in accordance with the procedure set out. So I am suggesting, Madam Speaker, that that argument is thin because it is the Police Service Commission which designs the order of merit list. And of course, in section 4.1, I think the biggest issue here, one alluded to by the member for Dago Martin West and the Prime Minister, 
is that after all of that, the selection of the firm, the establishing of the merit list, and forwarding same to the presidents in accordance with, in accordance with section one, two, uh, 123 of the Constitution, we then come to the Parliament. And as the member for Dago Martin West, this is the saddest part, this is the biggest and the worst bite of all as far as I'm concerned. The Parliament now will decide whether it will accept the nominee who came out on top of all of that process. And here's this. The member for Separia went on to argue that there, this is an improve, and in her view, this is an improvement of the veto power that the Prime Minister used to have, which the member for Separia in opposition in 2006, she actually led the charge, the member led the charge, holding the government then by its neck. We were responding to a crime epidemic at the time. And we wanted to improve the management and efficiency of the police service. I was here. And the member for Separia led the charge demanding more than a pound of flesh. We will not give that to you until you remove the veto power. And that's how, according to the member of Dago Martin West, for Dago Martin West, we ended up here. So, Madam Speaker, when you bring this matter to a debate, and it is a debate in the parliament on the, on the appointment of the commissioner and deputy, you leave room in this for scandalizing, for rumor mongering, for he say and she say and who here. Today we heard the member for Carney Central in this debate call an I virtually identified and now deceased senior police officer accusing him of kidnapping. The man was never arrested, charged. First time I ever heard of that in all my life. But the member for Carney to Central told us that everybody in the country knew about that. Hmm. And it was discussion in every corner. God is my witness. The first time I ever heard of that, and I was in national security at the time as a junior minister dealing with the serious issue of kidnapping in this country and ought to have known because we were briefed regularly. <laughs> but the member for Carney Central demonstrating my point, it leaves room for scandal. And if the person after the scandal, because a majority vote will carry, after that, if that person is appointed, then the public who was willing to listen to those arguments would have lost confidence in that office holder. And to my mind, on that basis, I say the worst bite of all in this process is this parliamentary public scandal that she, the member for Separia, insisted on. Hmm. insisted on. So, Madam, Madam Speaker, I support the measures that are before us today. They, like the introduction of VAT on food items in this country that were hitherto, that were previously, sorry, not VATable, it is necessary. We got to move on. We got to move on. And the member for Separe is telling us this evening, without shame perhaps, that she agrees that we must move on. But she has already, before this debate, told the country that she's prepared to go to court. So what was happening here this afternoon is that she, the member for Separe has indicated that they are prepared to use the courthouse as usual to resolve their issues that they could not resolve on September the 7th. To obstruct the people of this country and to interfere. And I want, as I pass from the member for Separia, to say to her and to the country, if her arguments are what they are, and if this procedure is so wrong. Why did you keep it for five years and did absolutely? You had about six minister national security. You had at least three, is three attorney generals or two? Five. About 10. <laughs> why, if it was so wrong, member for Separia, why did you keep it? And worse still, why did you use it to appoint 
Gibbs and Iwatsky. But you come here this evening to tell us how bad the very procedure is. That is hypocrisy in the UNC extreme. A matter with which the country became very, very aware and reacted the way they did on September the 7th. Thank God. The member for Princess Tong caused me a bit of laughter. He produced the word seeked. I thought it was quite unparliamentary, so to say. It was also an attack on the Queen's, on the lexicon, as it were. But Madam Speaker, there's one matter I want to address before I retain my seat. This discussion about foreign commissioner and local, and I've heard all the arguments. But I say to myself, when Trinidad and Tobago as a footballing nation wanted to go to the World Cup, we employed the services of Leonardo Benhaka, a foreigner. And he was able, with his expertise, to take our team to the World Cup, and everybody celebrated it. I want to argue, in my view, like in football, policing, modern police leadership and skills are, in my view, a piece of transferable technology. People go to university, Cambridge, Oxford, and all the other top universities in the world and study this business of police management and police leadership. And it is transferable from one state, one county, one country to the next, quite easy like any other management skill. That's one. Local knowledge helps, of course, because if you're fighting crime or you're dealing with issues in a local terrain, you need to know something about that. So there's some advantage in having a local too. The other point I wish to make, I do not altogether, and I understand the points that have been argued in favor of it, but I do not altogether accept this argument that because someone is acting in a position, being paid at the higher rank, all of the privileges and responsibilities in the higher rank, simply because he or she is an acting office holder, he or she cannot function with efficiency. I do not easily accept that. But I do understand that we have legislation that was cumbersome, difficult, complicated, and we as a parliament and a country can have done better than that. And we promised that we would have done better than that. And this evening, a short four months after coming to office, we are here to do better than that. We are here to do better than that. And as such, I support this motion and reject any suggestion of its annulment. And I am confident that the citizens of this country, I am confident that members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will easily understand that this very complicated and cumbersome process that was left to languish during the cold experience of the UNC term in government it has now come to the fore again, and we are proposing a resolution of that to simplify this process, make it easier, and so we would go on to appoint a commissioner and a deputy and put an end to this story. So, Madam Speaker, I think that it is now clear to those who would listen that the argument put by the member for Separia are frivolous and vexatious. I think it is even clearer still that I think they're just opposing for opposing sake. We need to organize our police service. We need to organize the assist them in becoming more efficient to deal with the issues that are in front of us. And that we will do. So Again, and in conclusion, I support the measures that are in front of us today and urge all members of the House to do that. Let's put this nitpicking behind us and get on with the business of organizing the police service. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Tabakit.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to join this debate for a few minutes. Madam Speaker, I listened with great interest to the Honourable Member for Laventil West. And I want to say, begin by saying that he made mention of the political leader and leader of the opposition, political leader of my party and leader of the opposition, the former Prime Minister, as not speaking on important debates like the variation of appropriations. Well, there was no variation of appropriation debate here today as far as I understand it. So I don't know what he's talking about. But Mr. Madam Speaker, it is very clear that the Hansard records would show that on the, all the debates that took place in this parliament, the leader of the opposition when she was prime minister often led those debates, concluded those debates, and also she has made many dramatic interventions, like she made today in this debate. And I would have thought that, I would have thought, Madam Speaker, that uh, after the brilliant exposition and contribution by the leader of the opposition and the member of parliament for Superia, the case was made. And the case has been made by her and before her by other speakers on this side for a responsible government to do what is right. And what is right is for a responsible government to withdraw this order and allow the consultations that are being called for to take place. And the consultations that are being called for is not just a consultation on the part of the opposition. We are not the only voices calling for consultations. You listen to the radio talk shows, you look at the blogs, and you listen to the people whom this legislation and th these orders are going to affect in the long run. And if you ignore the calls of the people for consultation and for a transparent process, then you are defeating the role of the parliament. This, what we are doing here today goes beyond us. It is about the people. And we must never, as parliamentarians, ignore the voices of the people. I stand here and I can only surmise, and I hope that I'm wrong, that what we are seeing here on the part of the government is not the attitude that they have espoused from the very first day that we met in this parliament and repeated um, thereafter that they are in charge now and we have to deal with that. Well, the people, it has to be understood that there are things that the people may not be able to deal with because they don't have the voice here. But we are their voices and the voices of the citizens in this parliament. And we have to do what is right, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, throwing jabs at the opposition leader, throwing jabs at us, making snide comments about where you put a sip or where you don't put a sip, Madam Speaker, is not going to change the merit of the arguments that have been put forward by the leader of the opposition. It's not going to change the merits of argument. And any responsible member of this parliament, any fair-minded member of this parliament, would agree that she has put forward very powerful, cogent arguments that should persuade a responsible government, or a government that claims that is responsible, to withdraw this particular order. Madam Speaker, the member for Laventil West, uh, you know, made reference to the government as being obstructionist. And other members on, on the other side, they have also made reference to that. But let me just say this, and let me say it loud and clear. If the rights of a citizen or citizens are threatened in any way, if you intend PNM government to use your majority to move ahead at the cost of transparency and openness, then we reserve the right to use those institutions that are within our constitutional remit to protect those rights. And if, therefore, we have to go to court, we will go to court. Because that's what the courts are there for. And that's what we must do in order to protect the rights of citizens. We go beyond the walls of this parliament. And we will rise up and fight. We will not lie down and die. We will fight on behalf of the people of this country for transparency. And we warn the government not to trans transgress, not to trespass 
upon the rights of the citizens and the freedoms of the citizens of this country. Not to do it. Because you're going to face a wall on this side. And you're going to face 18 persons on this side with the strength, determination, fortitude, and courage to move forward and do that which is right at whatever level it takes, uh, Madam <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, it is rare, very, very rare, that both a former chairman of the Police Service Commission and a sitting chairman of the Police Service Commission would comment on this matter of these orders as publicly as they have done. I refer, of course, to Professor Ramesh Deusaran, the distinguished um, Professor Ramesh Deusaran, and uh, the current chairman, Dr. Marie Therese Gomes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, when a person holds a position of significance, as Dr. Gomes holds, <coughs> but can exercise the independence to come out and speak as she has spoken, without fearing a Jwala Rambaran kind of justice, you must know that that person holds the interest of this country above any personal interest. And I commend, I commend Maria Tiras Gomes, because, to, because she, she can suffer the fate of a Jwala Rambaran justice in this country, because that's how people are, are reading things now. You don't agree with the government, you criticize the government, you're going to get Jwala Rambaran justice. You know, injustice. You know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Express newspaper describes itself as a fiercely independent newspaper. Fiercely independent. That's the tagline. They describe themselves as that. And uh, for many years, they wrote some very negative comments about this government, and we accepted their comments. We never questioned it. We, in fact, we gave more freedom to the media than any other previous government gave to the media. Because we believe in transparency, we believe in openness, and we believe in freedom of expression. And the, the, the former prime minister did everything that was within her power to ensure that we protected protected the freedom of the media. We did that. You actually spoke to the media. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. No one can argue about the extent to which we went in uh, this government in order to ensure that the media had freedom. So when they express, just within five months of this government coming into power, and people were saying openly in this country that they express was in fact supporting the government and wanted the change of government and so on. And when after five uh, months, just under five months, <laughs> the Express, 133 days, the Express can write an editorial, and an editorial eh, that says, please, no cloud over how to choose a top cop. You have to take this seriously, because they represent the voice of the people. Just like they represent the voices of the people in, their, in a daily uh, question that they ask um, of, of the people as to how the people feel about what is going on in the country on some particular issue. And the big question they asked this week was, to yet, today, well yesterday, what, today still yes, do you agree with the National Security Minister that Trinidad and Tobago is not in a state of lawlessness? That was the question they asked. Margaret Edwin San Fernando, no, I don't agree. Sandra Philip Tanapuna, housekeeper, no. I think there's a lot of lawlessness. Joseph Romero, Pitibu, no, I don't agree with him. If you look around the place, there's a state of lawlessness. Everywhere you go, people are talking about it. Keith Ligore, 68 years old, no, I don't agree with him. There's lawlessness all around. Margaret Mac Williams, 49, Laventil, no, just look around, there's point a state of, of lawlessness. Mr. Deputy Speaker. So let me make my point. You're making no point. Um, you on a point of order, please. Standing order 48 1, relevance. I will ask the member for Tabaki to continue. Um, I don't see the importance of the point of order, madam. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But just to clarify for the honourable member for Aruka Maloney, I'm establishing the credibility 
of the Trinidad Express as a fiercely independent newspaper in order, in order to continue my point. But I made the point that everyone in this country is saying that there is lawlessness. The only person saying there is no lawlessness is the Honorable Member for Point 14 and Minister of National Security. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, therefore please, it says, no cloud over how to choose top cop. And they are pleading on behalf of the readership who are citizens of this country. They are pleading when they say, when the House of Representatives co convenes today to address procedural issues, which is what we are talking about, relevant to appointing a commissioner of police and deputy commissioners, the government is well advised to withdraw the motions and revert to consulting with the opposition. Consulting with the opposition and police service commission before returning to parliament with new legislation. I'm glad that they put consulting with the opposition because they recognize that the opposition has an integral role to play in the process of governance of this country. And the government will be, do well to remember that when they sat on this side, they used to remind us about the role of the opposition as an equal partner in the governance of the country. Therefore, we say we have a role to play, and we will play that role. We will not be stymied, we will not be stopped, we will not be pushed aside, but we will stand up and play the role in governance that we have to play, Mr. Speaker. And then they continue. When we understand, while we understand government's resolve to end the charade of a commissioner of police acting in that critical office for more than four years and the urgency to appoint a substantive commissioner, the procedures to do that must be seen as fair and transparent. Transparent. And finally, my final quote from it. It seems that in the haste to simplify a convoluted process, the government failed to hold discussions with the PSC and the opposition, as well as other important stakeholders, before drafting and publishing two orders that have become controversial. When something becomes as controversial as these orders have become, when they have become as controversial, and when your le leading newspaper has the courage to tell you, no cloud over this, if you refuse, if you refuse in a spirit of arrogance, if you refuse because you think you are the government to ignore the voices of the people as represented through the media, which has an important representative in its own right, then what you are doing is demonstrating the beginning of what you have always shown the potential and intent to be an authoritarian government. And that, that the people have begun to reject already. That the people have begun to reject already. Because their people are seeing some intent. So whether it is a member for La Hokita Talparo saying, I don't answer questions from the opposition, or whether it is any other member there trying to dismiss the opposition of this country, the legally elected opposition, the constitutional opposition, then the people are beginning to see the birth of a level of, of authoritarianism in that government that they will reject. We moved away from authoritarianism way back perhaps in 1962, when we move into a more participative kind of governance. Today, people want a fair opportunity to have a say in how they are governed. And this, therefore, is not just about the order. It is about the people's right to have a say in what is happening in this parliament and the people's right uh, to be consulted. Mr. Speaker. Deputy. Mr. Deputy Speaker. The member for Laventil West spoke about what should have been done about the police service. And he's correct. He said he thought we'll come here and speak about what should have been done about the police service etc and set, uh, how to motivate them and, and inspire them and so on. I just want, want to remind uh, my honorable friend that a lot was done by this government to deal with the ills of the police service when we came into office. A lot was done. If you remember, in the very first year of office, we sold a number of Prados that had been bought for the Chogam. 
and we took that money instead and I believe we bought we, we, we gave some to the children's life fund and we also gave Prados a number of Prados to the police service we bought over 300 new cars at one point in time and they were delivered in tranches to the police service motorbikes we bought uh, 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 new weapons we did, we did, we did, we gave, we gave resources to the police service. It cannot be said that the People's Partnership government ever under-resourced the police service. That would be wrong. That would be wrong. We built police stations and provided a better environment. You talk about motivation and you talk about inspiration. One of the things that people respond to is a better working environment. And, and we provided better working environments in at least eight, I believe, eight areas. There was one particular um, police station which was destroyed in the year 1999, burnt down in um, Brasso. 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 And Brasso. And for all the years people were, you were in office, you did nothing about it. It took 15 years. And then this People's Partnership built back a police station in, um, in Brasso. I want to ask you, how many police stations have you started up in the last um, couple of months that you yourself have conceived and started up? What have you done to improve the living conditions of policemen in the several police stations across the country at this point in time that they are complaining about, about um, the conditions under which they are, they are living and working? What have you done? What have you done to improve the state of the Chaguanas police station where it was discovered that there were no windows at one point in time. And when um, women police officers had to change, they had to put up towels along the window in order um, to avoid the public see what that they were changing. What have you done to do that? What have you done to do that? To, to improve that? To improve the conditions of, of the police? You are in charge, many, though. How many stations did you <coughs> it, do, it doesn't hurt me at all. It doesn't work. You know, I come, I, I come from a background. I come from a background where I understand. I understand. I understand what it is to be on one side today and the other side. But I understand well that you must never be arrogant and say that we are in charge and deal with it. I understand what humility is more than anything else. You know, people, you know, Mr. Speaker, there's a whole truth, you know. It's only when you can't deal with a situation that you get angry. The ability to stay calm and unruffled in a situation means that you're in control. But when you get angry in a situation, it shows that you have lost control. You know what? The gov Mr. Speaker, the government is losing control right now because they are unable to manage this country. And why they are, why they are, why they are using authoritarian methods, Mr. Speaker, is because they are incompetent and they cannot manage. And therefore, that's all they could drive fear into people. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, but the mutterings across the floor, I can't hear. Yes, Honourable members. Speaker, I would like to hear the Honourable Member, please. Honorable Member for Tabakit, continue with your presentation. And members, please, it's after 11. Let's keep focus, please. So, Speaker, we are prepared to go if it's 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Minister of uh, National Security and the member for Point 14 really spoke very um, well. And I agree with the opposition leader, and I commend him on his speech. It was full of passion. But I wonder if that passion is really a reflection of how he, he feels about what is going on around him. And perhaps, I hope it's not an expression that he feels he's drowning amidst um, the lawlessness that is, has begun to surround him. And I, I hope that is not. I hope he wouldn't lose that passion and have the courage to fight. But you know, he spoke about leadership and inspiration and the, the commission of police is required to inspire, and that's why you need a commissioner of police. I agree. I agree. And there's a vast difference between leadership and management. Management is how you get the job done. Yeah. But leadership is really about inspiration. But Mr. Minister, I want to remind you about something through the, the Honorable Deputy Speaker. It is this. It is this. 
that you don't wait for a police commissioner to inspire the police service. You are in charge of the police service and you're in charge of national security. And you are the first leader that needs to inspire the police service. And if the police service isn't being inspired, it's because they are not getting inspiration from the top. From where it has to stop. You're a good man. I've always told you, I tell you in the parliament, I tell you outside the parliament, you're a good man. I've always admired your career. But I'm telling you something. You, if you say today that the police service has not inspired, ask yourself what it is that you are not doing to inspire the police service. Because I'll tell you something. You cannot have any strategies to deal with the situation unless you first develop a vision for the police service. And right now, the entire government, PNM government, is bereft of a vision for this country. And that includes a vision for the police service. Because vision, vision is the foundation for strategy. You cannot have strategy without vision. Vision is the foundation for strategy. And I have not heard from the, from the PNM government any vision for the police service, much less a vision for the country, and especially a vision in this, these are the times of economic gloom and doom. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wanted to make uh, these couple of points. <coughs> the Honorable Leader of the Opposition has already dealt with the particular provisions of the selection process and, uh, and shown uh, how it sidelines or marginalizes the Police Service Commission. The Honorable Member for Chagonas West has spoken about the disrespect for the Parliament between the filing, publication, and laying of the legal advice. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I just want to close by saying that the duty of this Parliament, whether we are in the opposition or in the government, is to ensure that the selection process is transparent, that is right, is fair, is just. And that the system of selection must not undermine the role of legitimate constitutional institutions. It must not allow them to be undermined, undervalued, or bypassed. And in this case, I refer in particular to the P Police Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of the members on this side in terms of this particular motion that has been brought before the parliament. I thank you. Member for Shogona West. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is clear that we have had quite an evening of engagement. Evening. And I think that notwithstanding the utterances by the Honorable Member for Digo Martin West, the Honorable Prime Minister, that we are wasting time, it is clear that his members engaged the debate and wasted the time equally if one were to <laughs> accept his utterance that we waste time here in this parliament. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Leader of the Opposition, spoke eloquently. And, and, and when I listen to members on this side putting forward the argument, both the process argument and both the sub, and the substantive argument for the ultra-virus nature of these legal the, the legal notice uh, number two one eight of 2015, I want to commend all members for their elucidation and their erudition in this regard. I want to indicate that. We come back to the point that what this government says, they do not do. In fact, I think one member, I think the Honorable Member for St. Augustine, who said, <coughs> they, they talk, straight talk must be not be followed by walk. Yes, straight talk one. must not be followed by, followed by crooked walk. <laughs> and when, you, when I make reference to the the Trinidad Express newspapers of August 25th, 2015, an article by Carolyn Kisun, Rowley, and I quote, Rowley, we will pay ex carony workers. And this is a quote, and I quote from the article by Carolyn Kisun of August 25th. <clears throat> he said, as the election is called, the Kamla Passat Bissessa government discovered from 12 years ago 
that cane farmers were owed money. They didn't pay them in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2015. Madam Speaker, on a point of order. Mr. Madam Speaker, standing order. Sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, standing order 48-1, relevance. Member, could you just re retract that statement, please? No, what? I just, I just. Please, let's retract and proceed. No, no, the last one that was just made, let's retract it and move on, please. No, but Mr. I just want clarification, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is in response to a comment made by the Honorable Prime Minister. Relevance and move on, please. Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, very well. But it talks about the crooked walk, and we will deal with that on another occasion. Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, the the issue also as to the whole process of consultation. When you look at the Guardian newspaper of Saturday, January 16th, the editorial reads. Clearer process for appointing commissioner of police needed. While it's long overdue to put a commissioner of police with tenure in the job, the process must be transparent. At the same time, unmade and untested arguments and delays cannot be allowed to block the appointment of a, of a commissioner of police. The editorial goes on to state, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the need is for cooperation between the government and the opposition to get the process of selecting and appointing a commissioner of police up and running with little delay. It is about three years since the country has had an acting commissioner of police. The legal notices filed in the parliament by the government to revise the process of appointing a commissioner of police can be only be derailed by a negative majority vote. The objective of the notice is to refocus the process of selecting a, a commissioner of police. And they go on to state, Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is the responsibility of the opposition to poke holes in the government's procedures in the interest of achieving quality processes in and out of the parliament. The opposition is to inform the country of the details of its contentions, and the government would respond. <clears throat> there may be need for adjustments to be made to the legal notices and the establishment of rules and regulation which can withstand scrutiny. One of the main concerns attending the legal notices, and one raised by first by Professor Ramesh Devsaran, who was at one time chairman of the Police Service Commission, is the requirement in the government's legal notices for a private firm to be hired to receive and process initial applications made for the job of Commissioner of Police. Why should there be a private firm interceding in this process when in fact that, is, that it is one of the responsibilities of the Police Service Commission? Was the question raised by Professor Dave Saran and, now, and one now being put forward by the opposition leader. Not only will the hiring of a private firm do the, process, do the processing result in an additional cost a government strap of re revenue cannot afford, but it could be trampling over a constitutional provision. Mrs. Mrs. Mr. Honorable Mr. Member, while you are allowed to refer to an article, you can't read the entire article into the record. Very well, Madam Speaker. The government must respond to such contentions. So it, it must respond to such contentions. So Mr. S Mr. 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 Madam, Speak Madam Speaker, so the, but the government has not responded and tell us who did they consult with, the specificity of their consultation. The government did not tell us <coughs> They did not tell us the explanation. They did not provide an explanation for the delay in bringing this matter to parliament. 
They did not meet the threshold of the consultation requirement. They provided no explanation. And, they, and, they, and as we indicated on this side, that we are of the view that this legal notice 218 of 2015 is ultra virus the Constitution. We are of that view, and they have not met that point of view, Mr. Mr. Madam Deputy Spe Madam Speaker. Successful, the, the Honorable Prime Minister, in his, in his contribution in the debate, says he does not understand the fear. He says he doesn't understand the fear. <laughs> Mr. Madam, De Madam Speaker, it is clear in this society, in this <coughs> plural society, given the, the history and the colonial nature of the constabulary, constabulary <coughs> that we inherited, that there is a real fear in this society wherever you rest coercive power, if you seek to appoint someone in that position and the, 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 the process cannot meet the, the scrutiny of transparency, accountability, and the necessary pol pol and lack of politicization. It is clear in the contribution of my colleague, the member for Kearney Central, spoke at length on the political influence that can be brought to bear in the process. And it is clear that for any commissioner of police to be successful in this country, that commissioner of police to, to deal with the mammoths before him or her must be provided with the necessary legitimacy. The Honorable Member for Lavantil West indicated that if having gone through the process, if and, and now subject to the approval of this House, that that is not appropriate approval. That the Parliament of this country should not meet to deal with the approval of a Commissioner of Police. And that that process is fraught with danger. I would refer you to your former leader, who indicated at the end of 2006 that he, ought, he wanted to congratulate all the politicians and all the members of parliament on that occasion who participated in the debate for displaying that level of maturity required in order to get that legislation passed. And when the first opportunity arose, as indicated by other members, for members to test that legislation in 2008, what happened? The government of the day, denying the approval of the, survey, the Police Service Commission, came with a candidate as the government, and then denied that candidate, a local person, the right to be commissioner of police in Trinidad and Tobago. And where is this question of legitimacy? How do you arrive at legitimacy in this plural society? It is the process that has to provide that. And, and the process that you have put forward from the time you, you, you it was signed off in the cabinet, from the time it was published, from the time it reached this, this parliament, tells you a story of attempting through stealth of denying the parliamentarians the opportunity except over an extended period. We had to find out, but not for the, as I indicated before, the vigilance of the leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, the question is, was raised by a member on the other side of the whole role and function of the director of personnel administration. And why they are shifting from that position that appeared in 2009 of the utilization of the director of personnel, director of personnel, personnel administration, the DPA. Now, 
When I listen to the contribution of that honorable member, you would think that they created another demon because they, they, they made the director of personal administration responsible for all the ills of the process for the previous appointment and demonize that person and that therefore demonize the person, the office, and so you get rid of the office in the process. So, my, my, Madam, Spe Madam Speaker, it is clear that the role and function of the DPA, it is, a, the DPA is appointed by an independent service commission. Public service commission. The, the, by the independent public service commission, thereby in, insulating the office of the DPA. It is clear the DPA cannot be a challenge to the constitutional independence of the Police Service Commission. The DPA serves in an administrative capacity. So therefore, the DPA as a public servant merely performs administrative functions on behalf of the Public Service Commission. And they tell us in their contribution that when the, the Honorable Minister of national security pulls the trigger, so to speak. I think it is the, the, the metaphor used by the honorable member for Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West, pulls the trigger that to, to start the process, to initiate the process, then the DPA will be triggered into action again. So why do you move from what existed? Is there any other trigger that you can pull? And the specious reason given by the Honorable Prime Minister and member for Diego Martin West is the story that he sat in a cabinet when a sitting Prime Minister told us to see a sitting chairman of the Police Service Commission and that sitting chairman told him that I am independent Don't talk to you. and I cannot speak with you. So what is this baggage we're toting? What is this baggage we're toting against the independence of the Services Commission? So what we are going to see then, if we were to accept that kind of, that, that, that kind of anecdotal, as evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence, is that you're going to see a trend where the, all the Services Commission and their independence will be subverted in Trinidad and Tobago under this administration. Now we're legislating for the minister to tell the service commission what to do. We're now legislating for it. So under this, under this, under this order, they, ha they have not indicated that when the minister requests the services commission to act, what happens if they don't act? Fire them. What happens if the service commission don't act? You say they maintain and retain their independence. And you say that the minister is merely making a request to initiate the process. What if they don't act? What if you expect them to act? What, is, what if they don't act? Because they can tell you, as the min, uh, uh, they, they can tell you that I am independent. I'm not talking to you. That you, you are part of the executive. I am insulated from your intervention or interference. I'm not talking to you. All right? All right? No, 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 no. I, but I just want to tell you that you, you have not answered that question. You have not. No, 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 no. You have not answered that question. Mr. Mr. Madam, Madam Speaker. Madam, Madam Speaker. So it is clear. It is clear that they have not dealt with this matter, that this, the, 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 the originator of this notice cannot justify as to why they moved in that fashion, except to say with alacrity because they have been elected so to do. And they, and they have not answered the questions that will allow this country to be comfortable with your process. And, and the firm, the firm, the appointment of this firm and the role and function of this firm 
if you set ad nauseum by members on this side, it makes the firm a, a mere post box. So the PSC. The PSC. The, P, the firm makes the Public Police Service Commission a mere post box. And that therefore it also lays the basis for the interference in that process. And the member says, oh, member, member could strip how much you want. It doesn't change the reality that the, the, for, the po Police Service Commission becomes a rubber stamp for the findings and the assessment of the firm as in accordance with your statutory notice. And the point made by the leader of the opposition that the choice of the firm utilizing the process used would be effectively done by the executive of this country. So, Madam Speaker, it is clear that we, we on this side cannot support, cannot support this legal notice. It is clear that we on this side recognizes, recognize that there are challenges facing the, the police. It is clear that the Honorable <coughs> Minister would like to improve the morale of the police service. <coughs> and I would say for the first thing then, to improve morale pay of the police, pay, pay them their back pay. Pay them their back pay. When you pay the people their back pay, you'll be surprised how quickly morale would be increased. And I want to indicate to the Honorable Minister, because you see, he has indicated that the morale of the police service is dependent upon the leadership. But the malady is deeper than that in the police service. The malady is much deeper th than that in the police service. And if one were to cursorily look at the various commissions, the various inquiries from the Derby Commission, in, appointed in 1964, the Car Committee, the Bruce Committee, <coughs> The 1990 Executive Research Forum study, sponsored by the United States Department of State, the o -O Dowd report, the Scott drug, re drug report, the Ramdani inquiry, the malady is much greater in the body of the police service than merely the tenure <clears throat> of the commissioner of police. <laughs> So, ma Madam, Madam Speaker, we, with these few words, I, I beg to, to move. Honorable Members, the question is, be it resolved that the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police Selection Process Order 2015 be annulled. All in favor say aye. 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 All against? No. No. I think the no's have it. So. Member for Shogona West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move motion number three, standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by section 132 of the Constitution that the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of Police be selected by criteria and procedure prescribed by the order of the President, subject to negative resolution in Parliament, and whereas the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police qualification and selection criteria, order 2015, which was published on December 16, 2015 by le legal notice number 2219, be it resolved that the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police qualification and selection criteria order be annulled. Madam Speaker, this is the second part of the motion dealing with the qualification and criteria. Madam Speaker, Order 219 
indicates the qualification of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police. A candidate for the, and, and, and Section 2 states, 2 1, a candidate for the Office of Commissioner of Police shall be a national of Trinidad and Tobago. We have no problem with that, Madam Speaker. A degree from a university recognized by the ministry responsible for higher education in any one of the following law, criminal justice, criminology, police service management, or any other relevant degree. And no less than 15 years experience of increasing responsibility in law enforcement. Secondly, two, a candidate for the office of Deputy Commissioner of Police shall be a national of Trinidad and Tobago and have A, the qualification stipulated in subclause 1A and B, no less than 10 years experience of increasing responsibility in law enforcement. The government must tell us why they are decreasing the requirement in the position of deputy commissioner in terms of years of experience. Why? Commissioner. Deputy commissioner. Deputy commissioner. Yeah. Deputy commissioner goes to 10 years. From 12 years. Why? <clears throat> why? No, why? Why are you doing that? You see, because you see, unless you have a clear explanation, it will give rise to that, to some sort of allegation. That, to, that no, 12 years makes to, that you are tail, seeking to tailor the requirements to sue a particular tailored cloth. No, please no, no. I want to hear the member, please. Yes. No, yes. Mr. Young, this is not Ernst Young, huh? <coughs> Talk to that. No, it is. Madam Speaker, so it is clear that we need answers to these questions. We need answers to that as to how you proceed with that. Because you see, one of the reasons why, Mr. Speaker, policing is now regarded as a highly demanding craft. And I think the member for Lavantil West spoke about that. It is a craft that requires specialized knowledge in many ways, and special skills required. And this can only be done through the necessary education and training. If you're asking for uh, 15 years at least experience for the commission of police, why is there the necessity to lower the threshold? There may be good reasons. There tell may us, be good reasons. Tell but tell us what they are. Because you see, I come back to this whole point about the legitimacy of the police commission the legitimacy of the hierarchy of the police commissioner. In this society, in this society of ours, in this small geographical space that we call Trinidad and Tobago, given our colonial inheritance, given our own colonial history, given our own history in this, this country, we have to find a way in which we can create the necessary comfort for our citizens so that they can provide the necessary support to the police service. And the process that begins that with that, that support is the process to support the transparent approach and that therefore the qualification and criteria must be something that is above board. Madam Speaker, so it is clear in, the, in these considerations that the, this, these persons will be the persons charged with the governing of the police service. They will be providing the, the, the moral boosting that is required. They will have to provide the inspirational leadership required. They will have to provide the, the technical competence that the subordinate staff will have faith in them. 
But so that therefore tell us. Tell us why you proceed in that way. Because we can deal with it conjointly. But what we need to do, Ma Madam Speaker, is to ensure that there is that level of comfort required. Otherwise, we, the, the very process will be delegitimized. With these few words and this late hour, Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Nobody to second the motion. No. No. Um, Member for Madam Speaker, I, I beg to second the motion passed by my honourable member. Um, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Moved. Raised by the honourable member for Shagonas West. And I reserve the right to speak. Honourable members, the motion being seconded, I shall now propose the question for debate. Be it resolved that the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police Qualification and Selection Criteria Order 2015 be annulled. <coughs> the Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to contribute to this motion. And I wish for the record to state at 11.36.34 on the 20th of January 2016 that it is something that ought to be encouraged that members agree upon process and that we ascribe to things which are opposite to the best interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We sit here as a parliament pursuant to section 53 of the Constitution to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Trinidad and Tobago. This is the supreme law. We're here quite properly engaged in a process by which we are proposing that an order which now stands as law pursuant to section 12 of the Statutes Act be negatived. The Honorable mover of the motion, the member for Shaguanas West, took us through the current law, which is in fact legal notice 219 of 2015. That was published on date of the order was the 14th of December 2015. <coughs> date of publication was the 16th of December 2015. There was no complaint made about this order as to its constitutionality, as to any process being breached by way of some form of complaint in relation to the statutory instruments, rules that guide us as standing orders 80 and 93 prescribe. All that we were told, and I heard just across the floor, we heard all of that already. All that we were told was please provide an explanation in sub, in sub clause 2 of section 2 of the order where the qualification for that of a deputy commissioner of police has moved away from 12 years to 10 years. And I want to remind the honorable members present there being no complaint and only an inquiry, the first thing we must ask ourselves, what could possibly have motivated the House not to have done the first motion and the second motion together? Just wickedness. Just, just wickedness. wickedness. It's true that you have the right to complain, but really, Madam Speaker, wickedness. we do know that the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago specifically prescribes that standing orders shall prevail and that the House has the ability to regulate its own affairs. We've just heard the Honorable Government past those who were last in the saddle, those who now sit in opposition, take a long song and dance about propriety and about doing things the right way. And I feel compelled on behalf of all members of this honorable house to put on the record that most respectfully, the process adopted here tonight is not in the best interests of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and specifically shows absolute wanton disregard 
for the good people that staff this parliament. Correct. Because the Hansard reporters are here, the clerks of the parliament are here, the orderlies are here, the kitchen staff is here, the police are here. And they're not only here, if the member for Separia can at least allow me to think without the Always chatter across. Always. But they are not, put and she, you know, she won't take the, the hint, you know. You should put her on. Most respectfully. Always cross talking. But, Madam Speaker, <laughs> the fact is, Grumbling. they are not only here now, Literally. all these people that I've mentioned, but they are obliged to be here tomorrow to debate two other motions of a similar nature. And they know this. So, Madam Speaker, may I ask for your protection it's from Separia? Honorable member for Separia, please. Let's see how long the obedience uh, will. Please, be. please proceed, Honourable yes, Madam Attorney General. So, Madam Speaker, I want to register a firm complaint on behalf of the good citizens that staff and make this Parliament function. I want to draw a complaint to the process adopted here tonight. Let's dive directly into this motion before us to negative the law of Trinidad and Tobago now prevailing on the ground that there's a question, why move from 12 years to 10 years for an appointment for a deputy commissioner of police? What's so sinister about 10 years, Madam Speaker? If 10 years is a problem, 10 years qualification, let's look at where 10 years is applied to this. We're speaking specifically in relation to deputy commissioner of police, we know that there is a commissioner of police. We know that the purpose of the 2006 package of laws which came forward, which included constitutional amendment, police service um, laws, etc., that Act Number no. Six, Act Number no. Seven, Act Number no. Eight of 2006, that that specifically was intended to move away from the process of seniority in the police service and to take us instead to a meritocracy where those with merit and ability are encouraged to participate in the process. The Honorable Member for Separia, back in the debate in 2006 and in several debates which flowed thereafter, even up to tonight, will be on the Hansard record as saying the move away from the veto of the Prime Minister, the move away from, since, from seniority, where that very special two-thirds vote to amend the Constitution pursuant to Section 54 of the Constitution occurred in what was described earlier today as an anomaly. That that was done specifically to encourage the younger folks in the police service to be motivated by the prospect of rising to senior rank without the debilitating hurdle of seniority being the sole guide. And therefore, it seems to be pellucidly clear, most respectfully, that the move from 12 years to 10 years is pegged so as to allow a broader participation of junior members, younger members of the police force, to allow them to vie for that valuable position of a deputy commissioner of police, encouraging succession planning, encouraging motivation, encouraging morale, and driving the police force. After all, the 2006 legislation squarely put forward for the people of Trinidad and Tobago in amending section 123A of the Constitution, a very significant power to a commissioner of police to be responsible, to have autonomy for the financial and management issues inside the police service. Giving an autonomy not seen before. If you're going to give such an awesome responsibility, is it not therefore opposite to the best interests of development, succession planning, and encouragement of morale to move the troops forward, to move the service forward, that you allow for people to come into the matrix earlier. And therefore, Madam Speaker, most respectfully, the drop of two years from 12 years down to 10 is not a significant drop, but it's a material drop to the benefit 
of those who aspire to the office of the Deputy Commissioner of Police. More particularly, let us engage in a comparative context. If pursuant to Section 105 of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, so declared the supreme law by Section 2 of the Constitution, if pursuant to Section 105, judges to be appointed must meet criteria as prescribed if it's good enough for a judge to be appointed after 10 years experience why not a deputy commissioner of police aren't they quasi judicial in some senses deputy commissioners of police don't they exercise administrative functions similar to quasi judicial functions don't they exercise as well significant criteria that call for encouragement Look at what has been prescribed in this order. A candidate for the office of commissioner of police shall be a national, etc. And then you must have a law, uh, education in law, criminal justice, criminology, police service management, any other relevant degree, no less than 15 years. And what is prescribed is exactly the same thing for a deputy commissioner of police, the same qualifications, save you move from 15 years down to 10. So that being the only question on the record by the member for Shagwanas West, there being no hint of unconstitutionality, there being no argument of breach of process or delay or untimeliness, which is anchored to section, to standing orders 80 and 93 of the standing orders by which we are governed, there being nothing other than that, it suffices then to conclude that it has been reasonably and justifiably explained. There is precedent for it, both in a management encouragement point of view, and particularly insofar as judges, which exercise significant functions, need only have 10 years experience. Madam Speaker, suffice it to say the argument has been met. In those circumstances, there is no position other than to vote against the motion which we are encouraged to adopt in this House. And therefore, I state it on behalf of all members present, most respectfully through you, that the government's position will be to oppose the motion now brought by the opposition, and in fact, to condemn them for wasting the time of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, specifically by not agreeing to to have the motions debated together. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Coover North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. To my colleagues and to everyone, and of course, most recently, the AG before me who spoke, we are, of course, very much concerned also about the staff of Parliament and everything that he mentioned. But in light of conducting the people's business, and on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I think everyone can understand that is the reason why we are here at this late hour tonight. And we will continue in the best interest of the people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the AG did not the Honorable Member for San Fernando West did not answer the question, was not of course very clear, no clarification. And of course one of the questions was, and we have many questions, why 10 years? And he went on to beat around the bush saying to make room for the younger persons to rise in the service and all of that. So why not 7 years? Why not 8 years? Why that specific number 10? Is it because, why not 15? Of course. Why not seven or eight years? You, you specified 10 years, but a proper explanation has not been given. It has not been given, and therefore the, the AG is very disingenuous in coming here and trying to give a roundabout sort of answer, saying it makes room for the younger ones to rise and promotion, and for the young persons to experience that position. So then why not uh, a year, lesser years, seven, eight years, why not? You deal with the health in this country, you're not doing a good job. All right? Madam Speaker, I beg your protection from the member for St. Joseph. Honorable members, it's late, and I think we should 
get on with the business of the people. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So that's, that's just clarification again being sought because the AG failed at giving clarification with respect to the number of years that is now uh, being put here as an amendment to the qualification and selection criteria. Um, in addition to that, Madam Speaker, we look at clauses three, where previously there was a host of requirements that were itemized, and now it's been deleted. The proposed amendment does not have these requirements being stated. Also, what these, these clauses, Madam Speaker, Clause 3, a candidate for the Office of Commissioner of Police or Deputy Commissioner of Police shall meet the following core criteria. A, leadership skills, which enable him to motivate, inspire, and engender trust and confidence in the members of the police service. B, management skills, which include the ability to, one, plan and organize operations. Two, monitor and implement such plans, and three, identify and rectify problems. C, communication skills, both written and oral, which enable him to deal effectively with the media and community groups. D, commitment to the cause of the organization. E, the requisite vision, which will enable him to guide the police service in the specific direction that will serve the best interests of the organization and the nation, and F, integrity, having the courage of his convictions and known among his peers for doing the right thing regardless of consequences to self and others. And I think these are fundamental requirements that should have stayed and not been deleted from the proposed amendment. Madam Speaker, selection criteria, and just to, to educate those opposite. A selection criteria describes the qualification, knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience a person requires in order to do a job effectively. Key expressions using a selection criteria, the type of skill or ability that is required, example, background, experience in, proven record in, knowledge of, understanding of, appreciation of, ability to, aptitude for, capacity to, and must have. And these are just some expressions that are used in a selection criteria. And it's passing strange that such an important clause from the original version is now being deleted of the proposed amendment. And I think the opposition here needs clarification for that also. And by extension, the public would need clarification why this part or this piece or these clauses are being eliminated from the proposed amendment. Madam Speaker, clause four, again. Where a candidate does not hold a qualification stipulated under clause 21A, but meets the core criteria listed in clause three and has no less than 20 years experience with increasing responsibility in law enforcement, he shall nonetheless be considered as a candidate for appointment. This in itself, Madam Speaker, is also a very important clause that is now being deleted from the proposed amendment. Again, we seek clarification as to why this is so. And I would hope that there would be someone who would speak after me to give such clarification. And I'm posing that to the government to, of course, let us know why these amendments were taken, these clauses, sorry, were taken off. And in the qualification and selection criteria of a deputy commissioner of police, that's a very, very important independent position, Madam Speaker, in this country. We have rising crime in our country. We have a Minister of National Security who fails to come to terms with the reality that we have spike, a spike in crime in this new year, and the numbers show for itself. And here we are deleting important criteria, a part of the selection criteria, out from the proposed amendment. And I think that the government owes a duty of care to this country to at least clarify and tell us why such important clauses are being deleted. Madam Speaker, in addition to that, I also want to make reference to the public and, of course, the media reporting over the past couple of days 
when, of course, the order was laid in Parliament and the public was made aware of what was going to take place. And we have independent institutions in our country, the Police Service Commission and the Chairman taking umbrage as to how this has been done and her, and her suggestions as to how it could have been done. And the major complaint was that of no consultation. And yes, we, we've uh, debated that all night. But it is an important part and aspect of governance in our country. The Honorable Prime Minister spoke about local government consultations taking place in Central and all across the country. And yet still you fail to consult or even inform the Chairman of the Public Service Commission, of course, who came to the public airing that. It is, it is very, very distasteful, Madam Speaker, to say the least. Very distasteful, and I think that such office holders should not be disrespected in this country. And I know for a fact that being a part of the former government, we practice what we preach, and there was no disrespect of any independent office holder and the office itself by the former government. And therefore, the, the Attorney General, in his capacity, you know, likes to talk about you know, dealing and serving the people and being on the ground and in tune with what is going on. And I think he himself should you know, be able to advise his colleagues within the cabinet that consulting and informing beforehand is an important part of the process. We also had, of course, the former chairman of the Police Service Commission, Professor Ramesh Diosaran, and he himself spoke about that, and he mentioned terms as, uh, to, as privatization, lending to privatization because of these proposed amendments of the selection of the uh, police commissioner and deputy police commissioner. And therefore, these are issues. We are now the qualification and selection criteria. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So my point, Madam Speaker, it is all about transparency, accountability, clarification, because really this came like a thief in the night. And as my previous colleagues have said, if it wasn't for the vigilance of the opposition leader in recognizing what was going on, we were at loss and would have been at loss. And the parliament itself has been somewhat disrespected to a certain extent in terms of the timing that it came and all of that. And these are serious pertinent questions that needs to be answered. I don't intend to be very long, Madam Speaker, and therefore those are just a few of my questions. And to also reiterate and repeat that the Honorable Attorney General failed to clarify the 10 years, why that number of 10 and his, 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 his response was in the least uh, not very clear or satisfying. And therefore, we need to know exactly what is the motive and intention behind the 10 years, and also to explain why these important clauses that was once held previously in the previous version are now being deleted from the proposed amendment, because we see it as very important clauses that would lend to the choosing and accommodating to, of course, a very efficient, intelligent, well-abled Deputy Commissioner of Police and Commissioner of Police. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member Fumiaro. Very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Just study Clarence now. Clarence, relax in. I rise to support my colleague from Shagona's West in support of the amendment of the legal notice 209, the annulment, sorry, Madam Speaker. I will do my very best not to lollygag and keep us here any longer than is necessary. The Minister of Communications indicated quite clearly that, and I am quoting him here, that we are not changing the law, but the process. I would like to put it to this House, Madam Speaker. Uh, th this, uh, one, one minute please members, with this what would have been the source of the quotation? The, the, the newspaper, sorry. Could you, if, if, one minute please, if it's a newspaper could you please inform the house okay. 
the details of the newspaper that you you're referring to. Okay, I, Madam Speaker, I will redraw it because I don't have the information. I, I recall read. I I recall reading it in the newspaper, but I don't. Sorry about that. Remember. Okay. Please, I will warn you to not follow that course, and I just want to remind members against the rule for tedious repetition, which is going to be strictly enforced at this time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the quotation, um, if, I, if I may be allowed just to think, it, it was on the postcard meeting on December 10th, 2015. Sorry. Okay. Member, I want member to put from Miaro, oh, as I would repeat, if your source is a document, yes. be it a newspaper, an article, you need to descend to some particulars sure. about it. If not, I would ask you not to pursue that course. Yes, Okay, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In doing the, I'd like to do a comparison between the 2009 no. and the, t the 2015 legislation, where several key areas of the selection criteria has been drastically changed, and in a most critical area Madam of core Speaker. competencies. Madam Speaker, I invoke tedious repetition, please. He's saying he's. Honorable Member, for me, Aru, I have already advised the House that the rule against tedious repetition is going to be strictly enforced. I have warned you, this will be the second warning. If you continue along this route, I will then invoke the order and ask you to resume your seat. Madam Speaker, <laughs> I, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to get my bearing here in terms of tedious Members, repetition. Please. In terms of tedious repetition, because I am the third speaker on this side, and I want to engage in terms of the section three of the order that has been deleted in the 2015. Honorable Member Fimiaro. The member for Kuva uh, North, who preceded you, dealt with the deletions. My recollection is she dealt with regulation, the under order, th um, regulation three, and four in great debt. And therefore, if you are dealing with them, you would certainly have to deal with them totally differently and not repeat the contribution made. And again, I warn the difficulty that one may find oneself in this debate is the procedure adopted in dealing with the two motions. And that's why I will enforce strictly the rule against relevance and the rule relating to tedious repetition. Thank you very much, Ma Thank you very much Madam Speaker. To continue, I am just concerned, Madam Speaker, that the watering down of the requirements for the Commission of Police and the Deputy Commission of Police would cause some serious concerns in terms of having the best quality individual placed in a leadership role of the police service. Madam Speaker, this parliament in 2009 set what I can only determine as champagne standards for the highest quality of individual to fill those two vacancies. <coughs> However, Madam Speaker, in 2015, in this order before us, that requirement has been watered down to what I would determine as, as MOBI standards. It has been watered down in a most very cheap fashion by removing those clauses from the 2015 um, order. What is the reason for the, re the reduction, Madam Speaker? 
Is honorable it? member. Is honorable member. <laughs> thus far, thus far, your contribution mirrors the contribution of the honorable member for Kuva. Thus far, it mirrors. While the words may be different in substance, it mirrors. And therefore, I'm going to ask you to resume your seat. <laughs> Member for Shogona Swell. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in the, in the notice, they speak of a, a national of Trinidad and Tobago. And the question is, the expression national is not defined in the constitution under which the order is made. <coughs> the Legal Profession Act defines a CARICOM national at section 4A. The Foreign Investment Act defines a national at section 2. The Immigration Act at section 2 has a similar definition of national in con connection with CARICOM's member states for the purposes of the CSME. Our constitution, Madam Speaker, defines citizens by descent and birth and citizenship with, ref re with reference to the Citizenship Act. The Immigration Act defines citizen with reference to the Constitution and the Citizenship Act. The Immigration Act also defines resident. The Value Added Tax Act, Schedule 2, Section 7B, delimits a returning national as someone who is or was a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago or has citizenship of two countries, one of which is Trinidad and Tobago, or is the spouse of such a person. In our written laws, clearly then, Madam Speaker, there are no blanket references to nationals of Trinidad and Tobago. The term is vague and ambiguous and needs to be defined. Is it meant to be a citizen? If so, by birth or descent. Is it meant to include a resident? Is it meant to include a CARICOM citizen? May we have some order, please? Continue, member for Shogona West. Ma Madam Speaker, perhaps there are a, a, a group of Cinderellas, you know, to, <laughs> is it midnight or? <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Constitution is clear. <laughs> When it mandates citizenship requirements for members of parliament and senators disqualifying dual citizenship, the gypsy and chaitan matter. Such clarity would, should have been used when drafting <coughs> the order. The simple question, is this citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, is this, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago should have been used and could have been used and was not. What was really intended here? So perhaps there is need for clarity. For, for clarity in that area, and perhaps the Honorable Attorney General may want to look at the legislation again. What about dual citizenship, Madam Speaker? What about dual citizenship? And those citizens who have declared allegiance to another country? They're barred from being MPs. Clearly, as indicated, they cannot be a commissioner of police. One solution is to use the definition of citizen in the Immigration Act, but limit it to exclude dual citizenship, as in the disqualification for members of parliament in the Constitution. Madam, Madam Speaker, our role is to assist in the legislation. As I, indicate, as I indicated, that it is not our intention to stymie this process, but as the loyal opposition, we have a duty to perform. And, the, and, therefore, and therefore, with these few words, Madam Speaker, I beg to vote.
Honorable members, the question is, be it resolved that the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police Qualification and Selection Criteria Order 2015 be annulled. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? No. no. I think the no's have it. Leader, Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House do now adjourn to Friday, January 22nd, 2016 at 1.30 a.m. 1.30 p.m. At 1.30 p.m., Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, at that time we will be doing the debate on the report of the Standing Finance Committee. Honorable Member. Chagonas West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as you indicated earlier in the proceedings, that there ought to have been a discussion in this matter. Madam Speaker, our, our position is very clear. The fourth Friday of every month, by virtue of the standing order, uh, 33-5, <coughs> shall be private members' day. Government business shall have precedence <coughs> on every day except private members' day. And it is our intention, subject to the standing orders, and in, in consideration of the standing orders, we regard it, the private members there being sacrosanct for the opposition, and that therefore it is our intention not to agree to, the, to, the, to, to, to use our Friday. Fridays, to use our private members day for government business. We are prepared to come Saturday. We are prepared to come on another day, Saturday to do government Sunday, business, Monday. or Sunday or Monday to do government business. But Friday is private members day, and it is, we regard that as sacrosanct in the context of the parliament of this country. <coughs> Madam Speaker. Leader of the opposition, um, Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in accordance with standing order 122, <coughs> one. I beg to move that the standing orders be suspended in re specific relation to in specific relation to, to standing order 335 and that the question be put on the suspension of the standing orders and furthermore the question be put on the motion proposed that this house do now adjourn to January 22nd at 1.30 p.m. when we will do the debate on the report of the Standing Finance Committee. Before, before I entertain that, there is a matter to be raised on the adjournment. Could it, Chief Whip advise on the position of that. No, no one. Ma Madam Speaker, uh, we will ask a deferral of that matter. I think that the Honorable Member for Karen East is not currently here to engage in that matter, so we'll ask a deferral. <coughs> Madam Speaker, may I indicate that we are very ready to do that matter, so I'm very sorry you're not ready. But we are very ready and prepared to do that matter. So if you have someone else who would like to move it. Madam, Spe Madam Speaker, I, I just want to, to draw your attention that There has been a motion that has been moved by the leader 
of the host to suspend. And that motion, as far as I read it, is dealt with without amendment or debate. It is done without amendment or debate. I just want clarification. I, just, I am on my legs, please, member for Shagona Swiss. Honorable member for Aruka Maloney, this motion requires either this notice or the leave of the speaker. I would entertain this as a day's notice of your motion. I do not grant leave. Madam Speaker, I rise to suspend Standing Order 122. As you are well aware, Madam Speaker, the Parliament conducts its own business. And Madam Speaker, in addition to that, despite the fact that the Standing Orders indicate that the fourth <coughs> Friday is private members day. Madam Speaker, in this instance, we have two constraints. That is the time for the, um, the, the, the Senate to debate this particular closing of the accounts. And in addition to that, Madam Speaker, on this occasion, we have, uh, we have a fifth Friday upon which the members can have their private members day. And Madam Speaker, we have not, we have not made any attempt to, to prevent private members day. And in addition to that, Madam Speaker, this was discussed previously by the, by the member for Chaguanas West and myself. So Madam Speaker, I am very alarmed at this turn of events with regard to the member for Shagornas West. And Madam Speaker, at this point, I'm asking that the question be put. Well, member, I am totally taken by surprise that a question is being put because the first question that was put, it was, was with respect to the suspension of the standing orders. And according to standing order 122, any standing order to be suspended must be done either with leave or one day notice. So even the attempt to suspend standing order 122 will need either leave or one day's notice. So that again, I reiterate my ruling and I am saying I'm prepared to treat this as one day's notice. Madam Speaker, may I ask a question? When, sorry, when, when, I, when I indicated earlier in the sitting that this was our intention, is that to be treated as notice? When I gave this indication on the 20th of January and it's now the 21st. That's a day. Was that notice? We are in another uh, day right and, now. And Leader of the House, I believe you now appreciate the position. You would have given one day's notice and therefore your matter for the application for the suspension will come up at the next hearing, the next sitting of this House. It's one day's notice on next sitting. That's for clarification. Madam Speaker, may I, may I ask what is what is what would be considered the day's notice, please? Well, it says at least one day's notice, and oh, I am you, ruling yes, that this is the sitting one sitting, and therefore you the one day's notice would qualify for the next sitting. 
No. Madam, Madam Speaker. So, sorry, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this house to now adjourn to Thursday. Yeah. Well, to the Thursday, the 21st of January 2016 at 10 a.m. I don't have to say the business. Honorable members. Honorable members. The question is that this house do now adjourn to Thursday, the 21st of January 2016 at 10 a.m. All in favor? All in favor? Madam. Honorable members, yes, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Thursday, the 21st of January, 2016, at 10 a.m. All in favor? Aye. Any against? No. I think the ayes have it. This house. Division. 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 What? Mrs. Robinson Stop, sorry, Regis. Sorry, sorry ma'am. Madam Speaker, it would appear as though the opposition is now indicating that they will do private members day on the fifth Friday. For, 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 you believe anything they tell you? Just, look, look, just, just go by the chair for me, please. Don't believe nothing they tell you. We can't. Come on, come on. 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 Come on, I suggest that this house be suspended for five minutes. Outreach. Well, yes, I think that the parliamentary outreach which we had today it was really effective and informative as it seeks to really inform students of the rules and functions of the parliament. Because oftentimes you might take the parliament and the members of the parliament for granted. And I think that through this outreach and through direct engagement and interactions by the speaker and members of QRC, we were able to directly learn about the functions of the parliament. So I think it was indeed informative. 
we NPRC um, doing that same type of abstract presentation because you would observe um, students of my generation tend to um, want to participate and get they are interested in color and abstract and I was impressed in terms of how the speaker on the parliament and the um, stewardship of the speaker was able to how to say transform a, um, a system of that of that complexity to break it down for the average citizen, the man in the streets basically, to understand the importance of Parliament in okay. the role of democracy. Okay. Parliament Outreach. Check our website for showtimes. ttparliament.org Follow the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter. Our call sign is at TT Parliament. Parliament Outreach. One thing I remembered was the way in which Parliament takes an issue and deals with the issue. You know, sometimes from an area, our community, Faisabad, we tend to, well, we have so much resources and why does a problem, why does an issue take so long to be dealt with and how the minister, how the president of the Senate handled the issues and the procedures in which they take an issue and deal with it, that was my most memorable. From this lecture today, I learned about the different parts and the arms of government and how they react to different circumstances and the decision making and who takes up the decision making due to Parliament. Parliament Outreach. Check our website for showtimes. ttparliament.org Channel 11, also broadcasting on 105.5.
Honorable Madam Speaker. This is a music. of the house thank you very much madam speaker madam speaker i as i had indicated i was moving the motion that the house be adjourned to today at 10 a.m but madam speaker i am just trying to seek your guidance before you put <coughs> sorry before you put the motion that the notice would mean that the next sitting of the house would be when notice will be considered, <coughs> the time that the notice would be considered. Notice for the suspension of the house notice for would, be, would, would come up tomorrow. Order. Yeah. Would have been satisfied by Would have been satisfied. Honorable leader of the house. Yes, ma'am. Once one day has elapsed, that will qualify as notice. And then your procedure under section one or standing order 122 can be adopted. Madam Speaker, I just want clarification, please. When you say one day has elapsed, Madam Speaker, we're into the next day now. We gave notice on the 20th, today's the 21st. No, the notice. Question you have to ask is the notice. Honorable Leader of the House, as I indicated, the notice must be at least one day. If I may, and I, I hope you don't think I'm asking too, too many questions. Madam Speaker, I'm asking if that means that we are now in a position at this, this sitting that we are proposing at 10 a.m. to deal with that motion. The suspension of the standing orders motion. Yes. I would want to say, I would want to rule leader of the house that one day will qualify as Friday. Leader of the house. Madam Speaker, <coughs> Madam Speaker, our intention therefore is to serve notice at this time, proper notice at this time, that on Friday our intention is to come to this house on Friday at 1.30 p.m. and ask in accordance with standing order 122 that the standing orders be waived, Madam Speaker. All suspended. <coughs> Sorry, all the standing orders be suspended, suspended in accordance with standing order 122, 1 and 2. And, and Madam Speaker, this notice I'm using this opportunity to also give notice that at that time we will be dealing with the variation of appropriation and the report of the Standing Finance Committee. So Madam Speaker, at this time I beg to move that this House now adjourn to Friday, 22nd January at 2016 at 1.30 p.m. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Friday, the 22nd January 2016 at 1.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? 
the eyes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Friday, 22nd January, 2016, at 1.30 p.m. This has been a presentation of the Parliament Channel and Parliament Radio 105.5 FM. You're viewing the Parliament Channel 11, also broadcasting on 105.5 FM. Just the mention of the name, the Red House, and the image of the magnificent red building located within the capital city of Port of Spain comes to mind. It covers an entire block from Hart Street to Knox Street and sits perfectly between Abercrombie and St. Vincent Streets. The Red House is the seat of this country's democracy and was once used to host parliamentary proceedings. Its history date back to the 1800s when the first building was constructed and painted red to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. As a result of its color, citizens coined the phrase the Red House to describe the building, a label that has lasted to this day. Following the water riots in 1903, which resulted in the first building being gutted by fire, the Red House was rebuilt and opened to the public in 1907. Since then, the building has hosted a variety of government functions and many historic events, particularly the official ceremony that marked this country's first day of independence on August 31, 1962. Over the years, the structure of the Red House weakened and restorative works commenced at the site. Prior to this, however, it became necessary to excavate several inspection units